Section 20 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reddesdale. Section 20 The Battle of the Ape and the Crab. If a man thinks only of his own profit and tries to benefit himself at the expense of others, he will incur the hatred of heaven. Men should lay up in their hearts the story of the battle of the ape and crab, and teach it as a profitable lesson to their children. Once upon a time there was a crab who lived in a marsh in a certain part of the country. It fell out one day that the crab, having picked up a rice-cake, an ape who had gotten a nasty hard persimmon-seed, came up and begged the crab to make an exchange with him. The crab, who was a simple-minded creature, agreed to this proposal, and they each went their way, the ape chuckling to himself at the good bargain which he had made. When the crab got home he planted the persimmon seed in his garden, and as time slipped by it sprouted, and by degrees grew to be a big tree. The crab watched the growth of his tree with great delight, but when the fruit ripened and he was going to pluck it, the ape came in and offered to gather it for him. The crab consenting, the ape climbed up into the tree and began eating all the ripe fruit for himself, while he only threw down the sour persimmons to the crab, inviting him at the same time to eat heartily. The crab, however, was not pleased at this arrangement and thought that it was his turn to play a trick upon the ape, so he called out to him to come down head foremost. The ape did as he was bid, and as he crawled down, head foremost, the ripe fruit all came tumbling out of his pockets and the crab, having picked up the persimmons, ran off and hid himself in a hole. The ape, seeing this, lay in ambush, and as soon as the crab crept out of his hiding-place gave him a sound drubbing and went home. Just at this time a friendly egg and a bee, who were the apprentices of a certain rice-mortar, happened to pass that way, and seeing the crab's piteous condition, tied up his wounds, and having escorted him home, began to lay plans to be revenged upon the cruel ape. Having agreed upon a scheme, they all went to the ape's house in his absence, and each one, having undertaken to play a certain part, they waited in secret for their enemy to come home. The ape, little dreaming of the mischief that was brewing, returned home, and having a fancy to drink a cup of tea, began lighting the fire in the hearth, when all of a sudden the egg, which was hidden in the ashes, burst with the heat and bespattered the frightened ape's face, so that he fled, howling with pain and crying, Oh, what an unlucky beast I am! Maddened with the heat of the burst egg, he tried to go to the back of the house, when the bee darted out of a cupboard and a piece of seaweed, who had joined the party, coming up at the same time. The ape was surrounded by enemies. In despair he seized the clothes-rack and fought valiantly for a while, but he was no match for so many, and was obliged to run away, with the others in hot pursuit after him. Just as he was making his escape by a back door, however, the piece of seaweed tripped him up, and the rice mortar, closing with him from behind, made an end of him. So the crab, having punished his enemy, went home in triumph, and lived ever after on terms of brotherly love with the seaweed and the mortar. Was there ever such a fine piece of fun? End of section 20。section 21 of tales of old japan。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by nadine kurt boulet。tales of old japan。by lord reddesdale。section 21 。THE ADVENTURES OF LITTLE PEACHLING Many hundred years ago there lived an honest old woodcutter and his wife. One fine morning the old man went off to the hills with his billhook to gather a faggot of sticks, while his wife went down to the river to wash the dirty clothes. When she came to the river she saw a peach floating down the stream, so she picked it up and carried it home with her, thinking to give it to her husband to eat when he should come in. The old man soon came down from the hills, and the good wife set the peach before him, when, 
just as she was inviting him to eat it, the fruit split in two, and a little puling baby was born into the world. So the old couple took the babe and brought it up as their own, and, because it had been born in a peach, they called it Momotaro. Note. Momo means a peach, and Taro is the termination of the names of eldest sons, as Hikotaro, Tokutaro, etc. In modern times, however, the termination has been applied indifferently to any male child. End of footnote. Or Little Peachling. By degrees, Little Peachling grew up to be strong and brave, and at last one day he said to his old foster parents, I am going to the ogre's island to carry off the riches that they have stored up there. Pray, then, make me some millet dumplings for my journey. So the old folks ground the millet and made the dumplings for him, and Little Peachling, after taking an affectionate leave of them, cheerfully set out on his travels. As he was journeying on, he fell in with an ape, who gibbered at him, and said, "'Kia, Kia, Kia, where are you off to, little Peachling?' "'I'm going to the ogre's island to carry off their treasure,' answered little Peachling. "'What are you carrying at your girdle?' "'I'm carrying the very best millet dumplings in all Japan.' "'If you'll give me one, I will go with you,' said the ape. So little Peachling gave one of his dumplings to the ape, who received it and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he heard a pheasant calling. Ken, Ken, Ken! Footnote. The country folk in Japan pretend that the pheasant's call is a sign of an approaching earthquake. End of footnote. Why are you off to, Master Peachling? Little Peachling answered as before, and the pheasant, having begged and obtained a millet dumpling, entered his service and followed him. A little while after this, they met a dog, who cried, Bo, ho, ho, whither away, Master Peachling? I'm going off to the ogre's island to carry off their treasure. If you will give me one of those nice millet dumplings of yours, I will go with you, said the dog. With all my heart, said little Peachling. So he went on his way with the ape, the pheasant, and the dog following after him. When they got to the ogre's island, the pheasant flew over the castle gate, and the ape clambered over the castle wall, while little Peachling, leading the dog, forced in the gate and got into the castle. Then they did battle with the ogres, and put them to flight, and took their king prisoner. So all the ogres did homage to little Peachling, and brought out the treasures which they had laid up. There were caps and coats that made their wearers invisible, jewels which govern the ebb and flow of the tide, coral, musk, emeralds, amber, and tortoise shell, besides gold and silver. All these were laid before little Peachling by the conquered ogres. So little Peachling went home laden with riches, and maintained his foster parents in peace and plenty for the remainder of their lives. End of section 21「Section 22 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Kurt Boulet. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Redesdale. Section 22. The Fox's Wedding. Once upon a time there was a young white fox whose name was Fukuyemon. When he had reached the fitting age, he shaved off his forelock. Note, see the appendix on ceremonies, end of note, and began to think of taking to himself a beautiful bride. The old fox, his father, resolved to give up his inheritance to his son. Note, see the note on the word inkiyo in the story of the prince and the badger, end of note, and retired into private life. So the young fox, in gratitude for this, labored hard and earnestly to increase his patrimony. Now it happened that in a famous old family of foxes there was a beautiful young lady fox with such lovely fur that the fame of her jewel-like charms was spread far and wide. The young white fox, who had heard of this, was bent on making her his wife, and a meeting was arranged between them. There was not a fault to be found on either side, 
so the preliminaries were settled, and the wedding presents sent from the bridegroom to the bride's house, with congratulatory speeches from the messenger, which were duly acknowledged by the person deputed to receive the gifts. The bearers, of course, received the customary fee in copper cash. When the ceremonies had been concluded, an auspicious day was chosen for the bride to go to her husband's house, and she was carried off in solemn procession during a shower of rain, the sun shining all the while. Note, a shower during sunshine, which we call the devil beating his wife, is called in Japan the fox's bride going to her husband's house. End of note. After the ceremonies of drinking wine had been gone through, the bride changed her dress, and the wedding was concluded, without let or hindrance, amid singing and dancing and merry-making. The bride and bridegroom lived lovingly together, and a litter of little foxes were born to them, to the great joy of the old grandsire, who treated the little cubs as tenderly as if they had been butterflies or flowers. "'They are the very image of their old grandfather,' said he, as proud as possible. "'As for medicine, bless them, they are so healthy that they'll never need a copper coin's worth. As soon as they were old enough, they were carried off to the temple of Inari-sama, the patron saint of foxes, and the old grandparents prayed that they might be delivered from dogs and all the other ills to which fox flesh is hair. In this way, the white fox by degrees waxed old and prosperous, and his children, year by year, became more and more numerous around him, so that, happy in his family and his business, every recurring spring brought him fresh cause for joy. End of section 22「Section 23 of Tales of Old Japan」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nadine Eckert Boulet Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reddesdale Section 23 The History of Sataka Kintoki A long time ago there was an officer of the Emperor's bodyguard called Sakata Kurando, a young man who, although he excelled in valor and in the arts of war, was of a gentle and loving disposition. This young officer was deeply enamored of a fair young lady called Yaegiri, who lived at Gojozaka at Kyoto. Now it came to pass that, having incurred the jealousy of certain other persons, Kurando fell into disgrace with the court and became a ronin, so he was no longer able to keep up any communication with his love Yaegiri. Indeed, he became so poor that it was a hard matter for him to live. So he left the place and fled, no one knew whither. As for Yaegiri, lovesick and lorn and pining for her lost darling, she escaped from the house where she lived and wandered hither and thither through the country, seeking everywhere for Kurando. Now Kurando, when he left the palace, turned tobacco merchant, and, as he was travelling about, hawking his goods, it chanced that he fell in with Yaegiri. So, having communicated to her his last wishes, he took leave of her and put an end to his life. Poor Yaegiri, having buried her lover, went to the Ashigara mountain, a distant and lonely spot, where she gave birth to a little boy, who, as soon as he was born, was of such wonderful strength that he walked about and ran playing all over the mountain. A woodcutter, who chanced to see the marvel, was greatly frightened at first, and thought the thing altogether uncanny. But after a while he got used to the child, and became quite fond of him, and called him Little Wonder, and gave his mother the name of the old woman of the mountain. One day, as Little Wanda was playing about, he saw that on the top of a high cedar tree there was a Tengu's nest. Note. Tengu, or the heavenly dog, a hobgoblin who infests desert places and is invoked to frighten naughty little children. End of note. So he began shaking the tree with all his might until at last the Tengu's nest came tumbling down. As luck would have it, the famous hero, Minamoto no Yorimitsu, with his retainers, Watanabe Isuna, Usui Sadamitsu, and several others, had come to the mountain to hunt, and seeing the feat which Little Wanda had performed, 
came to the conclusion that he could be no ordinary child. Minamoto no Yorimitsu ordered Watanabe Isuna to find out the child's name and parentage. The old woman of the mountain, on being asked about him, answered that she was the wife of Kurando, and that little Wanda was the child of their marriage. And she proceeded to relate all the adventures which had befallen her. When Yorimitsu heard her story, he said, Certainly, this child does not belie his lineage. Give the brat to me, and I will make him my retainer. The old woman of the mountain gladly consented, and gave little Wanda to Yorimitsu, but she herself remained in her mountain home. So little Wanda went off with the hero Yorimitsu, who named him Sakata Kintoki, and in after times he became famous and illustrious as a warrior, and his deeds are recited to this day. He is the favorite hero of little children who carry his portrait in their bosom and wish that they could emulate his bravery and strength. End of section 23「Section 24 of Tales of Old Japan」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Nadine Eckert Boulet Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reddesdale Section 24 The Elves and the Envious Neighbor Once upon a time there was a certain man who, being overtaken by darkness among the mountains, was driven to seek shelter in the trunk of a hollow tree. In the middle of the night a large company of elves assembled at the place, and the man, peeping out from his hiding place, was frightened out of his wits. After a while, however, the elves began to feast and drink wine, and to amuse themselves by singing and dancing, until at last the man, caught by the infection of the fun, forgot all about his fright, and crept out of his hollow tree to join in the revels. When the day was about to dawn, the elves said to the man, you are a very jolly companion, and must come out and have a dance with us again. You must make us a promise and keep it. So the elves, thinking to bind the man over to return, took a large wen that grew on his forehead and kept it in pawn. Upon this they all left the place and went home. The man walked off to his own house in high glee at having passed a jovial night and got rid of his wen into the bargain. So he told the story to all his friends, who congratulated him warmly on being cured of his wen. But there was a neighbor of his, who was also troubled with a wen of long standing, and, when he heard of his friend's luck, he was smitten with envy, and went off to hunt for the hollow tree, in which, when he had found it, he passed the night. Towards midnight the elves came, as he had expected, and began feasting and drinking, with songs and dances as before. As soon as he saw this, he came out of his hollow tree, and began dancing and singing as his neighbor had done. The elves, mistaking him for their former boon companion, were delighted to see him, and said, You are a good fellow to recollect your promise, and will give you back your pledge. So one of the elves, pulling the pawned wen out of his pocket, stuck it on to the man's forehead, on the top of the other wen which he already had. So the envious neighbor went home weeping, with two wens instead of one. This is a good lesson to people who cannot see the good luck of others without coveting it for themselves. End of section 24 Section 25 of Tales of Old Japan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale Section 25 The Ghost of Sakura Part 1 The Ghost of Sakura The misfortunes and death of the farmer Sogoro, which, although the preternatural appearances by which they are said to have been followed may raise a smile, are matters of historic notoriety with which every Japanese is familiar furnish a forcible illustration of the relations which exist between the tenant and the lord of the soil, and of the boundless power for good or for evil exercised by the latter. 
It is rather remarkable that in the country where the peasant, placed as he is next to the soldier, and before the artisan and merchant, in the four classes into which the people are divided, enjoys no small consideration, and where agriculture is protected by law from the inroads of wild vegetation, even to the lopping of overshadowing branches and the cutting down of hedgerow timber, the lord of the manor should be left practically without control in his dealings with his people. The land tax, or rather the yearly rent paid by the tenant, is usually assessed at 40% of the produce, but there is no principle clearly defining it, and frequently the landowner and the cultivator divide the proceeds of the harvest in equal shapes. Rice land is divided into three classes, and according to these classes, it is computed that one tan, 1,800 square feet, of the best land should yield to the owner a revenue of five bags of rice per annum. Each of these bags holds four to. A to is rather less than half an imperial bushel, and is worth at present, 1868, three rios, or about 16 shillings. The land of the middle class should yield a revenue of three or four bags. The rent is paid either in rice or in money, according to the actual price of the grain, which varies considerably. It is due in the 11th month of the year, when the crops have all been gathered and their market value fixed. The rent of land-bearing crops other than rice, such as cotton, beans, roots, and so forth, is payable in money during the twelfth month. The choice of the nature of the crops to be grown appears to be left to the tenant. The Japanese landlord, when pressed by poverty, does not confine himself to the raising of his legitimate rents. He can always enforce from his needy tenantry the advancement of a year's rent, or the loan of so much money as may be required to meet his immediate necessities. Should the lord be just, the penant is repaid by installments, with interest, extending over ten or twenty years. But it too often happens that unjust and merciless landlords do not repay such loans, but, on the contrary, press for further advances. Then it is that the farmers, dressed in their grass raincoats and carrying sickles and bamboo poles in their hands, assemble before the gate of their lord's palace at the capital, and represent their grievances, imploring the intercession of their retainers, and even of the womankind who may chance to go forth. Sometimes they pay for their temerity by their lives, but at any rate, they have the satisfaction of bringing shame upon their persecutor in the eyes of his neighbors and of the populace. The official reports of recent travels in the interior of Japan have fully provided the hard lot with which the peasantry had to put up during the government of the tycoons, and especially under the Hatamotos, the created nobility of the dynasty. In one province, where the village mayors appear to have seconded the extortions of their lord, they have had to flee before an exasperated population, who, taking advantage of the revolution, laid waste and pillaged their houses, loudly praying for a new and just assessment of the land, while throughout the country, the farmers have hailed with acclamations the resumption of the sovereign power by the Mikado, and the abolition of the petty nobility who exalted themselves upon the misery of their dependents. Warming themselves in the sunshine of the court at Yedo, the Hatamotos waxed fat and held high revel, and little cared they who groaned or who starved. Money must be found, and it was found. It is necessary here to add a word respecting the position of the village mayors, who play so important a part in the tale. The peasants of Japan are ruled by three classes of officials, the Nanushi, or mayor, the Kumigashira, or chiefs of companies, and the Hiyakushodai, or farmers' representatives. The village, which is governed by the Nanushi, or mayor, is divided into companies, which, consisting of five families each, are directed by a kumigashira. These companies, again, are subdivided into groups of five men each, who choose one of their number to represent them in case of their having any petition to present, or any affairs to settle with their superiors. This functionary is the Hiyakushodai. The mayor... The chief of the company and the representative keep registers of the families and people under their control, and are responsible for their good and orderly behavior. They pay taxes like the other farmers, but receive a salary, the amount of which depends upon the size and wealth of the village. Five percent of the yearly land tax forms the salary of the mayor, and the other officials each receive five percent of the tax paid by the little bodies over which they respectively rule. The average amount of land for one family to cultivate is about one cho, 
or 9,000 square yards. But there are farmers who have inherited as much as five or even six cho from their ancestors. There is also a class of farmers called, from their poverty, water-drinking farmers, who have no land of their own, but hire that of those who have more than they can keep in their own hands. The rent so paid varies, but the good rice land will bring in as high a rent as from pound eighteen shillings to pound six shillings per tan, 1,800 square feet. Farm laborers are paid from six or seven rios a year to as much as 30 rios, the rio being worth about five shillings, four pennies. Besides this, they are clothed and fed, not daintily indeed, but amply. The rice which they cultivate is to them an almost unknown luxury. Millet is their staple food, and on high days and holidays, they receive messes of barley or buckwheat. Where the mulberry tree is grown and the silkworm is educated, there the laborer receives the highest wage. The rice crop on good land should yield twelve and a half fold, and on ordinary land from six to seven fold only. Ordinary arable land is only half as valuable as rice land, which cannot be purchased for less than 40 rios per tan of 1,800 square feet. Common hill or woodland is cheaper again than arable land, but orchards and groves of the Paulonia are worth from 50 to 60 rios per tan. With regard to the punishment of crucifixion, by which Sogoro was put to death, it is inflicted for the following offenses. Parricide, including the murder or striking of parents, uncles, aunts, elder brothers, masters, or teachers, coining counterfeit money, and passing the barriers of the tycoon's territory without a permit. The criminal is attached to an upright post with two crossbars, to which his arms and feet are fastened by ropes. He is then transfixed with spears by men belonging to the Eta or pariah class. I once passed the execution ground near Yedo, when a body was attached to the cross. The dead man had murdered his employer, and having been condemned to death by crucifixion, had died in prison before the sentence could be carried out. He was accordingly packed in a squatting position, in a huge red earthenware jar, which having been tightly filled up with salt, was hermetically sealed. On the anniversary of the commission of the crime, the jar was carried down to the execution ground and broken, and the body was taken out and tied to the cross, the joints of the knees and arms having been cut to allow of the extension of the stiffened and shrunken limbs. It was then transfixed with spears and allowed to remain exposed for three days. An open grave, the upturned soil of which seemed almost entirely composed of dead men's remains, waited to receive the dishonored corpse, over which three or four etas, squalid and degraded beings, were mounting guard, smoking their pipes by a scanty charcoal fire and bandying obscene jests. It was a hideous and ghastly warning, had any cared to read the lesson. But the passers-by on the high road took little or no notice of the sight, and a group of chubby and happy children were playing not ten yards from the dead body, as if no strange or uncanny thing were near them. How true is the principle laid down by Confucius, that the benevolence of princes is reflected in their country, while their wickedness causes sedition and confusion. In the province of Shimosa, and the district of Soma, Hotakaga no Kami was lord of the castle of Sakura, and chief of a family which had for generations produced famous warriors. When Kaga no Kami, who had served the Goroju, the cabinet of the shogun, died at the castle of Sakura, his eldest son Kotsuke no Suke Masanobu, inherited his estates and honors, and was appointed to a seat in the Gorojiu. But he was a different man from the lords had preceded him. He treated the farmers and peasants unjustly, imposing additional and grievous taxes, so that the tenants on his estates were driven to the last extremity of poverty. And although year after year and month after month they prayed for mercy, and remonstrated against this injustice, no heed was paid to them and the people throughout the village were reduced to the utmost distress. Accordingly, the chief of the 136 villages, producing a total revenue of 40,000 kokus of rice, assembled together in council and determined unanimously to present a petition to the government, sealed with their seals, stating that their repeated remonstrances had been taken no notice of by their local authorities. Then they assembled in numbers before the house of one of the councillors of their lord, named Ikeura Kazuye, in order to show the petition to him first, but even then no notice was taken of them. So they returned home and resolved, after consulting together, 
to proceed to their lord's yashiki or palace at Yedo on the seventh day of the tenth month. It was determined with one accord that 143 village chiefs should go to Yedo, and the chief of the village of Iwahashi, one Sagoro, a man 48 years of age, distinguished for his ability and judgment, ruling a district which produced a thousand kokus, stepped forward and said, This is by no means an easy matter, my masters. It certainly is of great importance that we should forward our complaint to our lord's palace at Yedo. But what are your plans? Have you any fixed intentions? It is indeed a most important matter, rejoined the others. But they had nothing further to say. Then Sogoro went on to say, We have appealed to the public office of our province, but without avail. We have petitioned the prince's councillors, also in vain. I know that all that remains for us is to lay our case before our lord's palace at Yedo, and if we go there, it is equally certain that we shall not be listened to. On the contrary, we shall be cast into prison. If we are not attended to here in our own province, how much less will the officials at Yedo care for us? We might hand our petition into the litter of one of the Goroju in the public streets. But even in that case, as our lord is a member of the Goroju, none of his peers would care to examine into the rights and wrongs of our complaint, for fear of offending him and the man who presented the petition in so desperate a manner would lose his life on a bootless errand. If you have made up your minds to this, and are determined at all hazards to start, then go to Yedo by all means, and bid a long farewell to parents, children, wives, and relations. This is my opinion. The others all agreeing with what Sogoro said, they determined that, come what might, they would go to Yedo, and they settled to assemble at the village of Funabashi on the thirteenth day of the eleventh month. On the appointed day, all the village officers met at the place agreed upon, Sogoro, the chief of the village of Iwahashi, alone being missing. And as on the following day, Sogoro had not yet arrived, they deputed one of their number, named Rokurobe, to inquire the reason. Rokurobe arrived at Sogoro's house towards four in the afternoon and found him warming himself quietly over his charcoal brazier, as if nothing were the matter. The messenger, seeing this, said rather testily, the chiefs of the villages are all assembled at Punabashi according to covenant, and as you, Master Sogoro, have not arrived, I have come to inquire whether it is sickness or some other cause that prevents you. Indeed, replied Sogoro, I am sorry that you should have had so much trouble. My intention was to have set out yesterday, but I was taken with the colic, with which I am often troubled, and as you may see, I am taking care of myself, so for a day or two I shall not be able to start. Pray be so good as to let the others know this. Rokurobe, seeing that there was no help for it, went back to the village of Punabashi and communicated to the others what had occurred. They were all indignant at what they looked upon as the cowardly defection of a man who had spoken so fairly, but resolved that the conduct of one man should not influence the rest, and talked themselves into the belief that the affair which they had in hand would be easily put through. So they agreed with one accord to start and present the petition, and having arrived at Yedo, put up in the street called Bakurocho. But although they tried to forward their complaint to the various officers of their lord, no one would listen to them. The doors were all shut in their faces, and they had to go back to their inn, crestfallen and without success. On the following day, being the 18th of the month, they all met together in a tea house in an avenue, in front of a shrine of Kwanon Sama, and having held a consultation, they determined that, as they could hit upon no good expedient, they would again send for Sogoro to see whether he could devise no plan. Accordingly, on the 19th, Rokurobe and Wanjiu Yemon started for the village of Iwahashi at noon and arrived the same evening. Now the village chief Sogoro, who had made up his mind that the presentation of this memorial was not a matter to be lightly treated, summoned his wife and children and his relations and said to them, I am about to undertake a journey to Yedo for the following reasons. Our present lord of the soil has increased the land tax, in rice and the other imposts, more than tenfold, so that pen and paper would fail to convey an idea of the poverty to which the people are reduced, and the peasants are undergoing tortures of hell upon earth. Seeing this, the chiefs of the various villages have presented petitions, but with what result is doubtful. My earnest desire, therefore, is to devise some means of escape from this cruel persecution. If my ambitious scheme does not succeed, then shall I return home no more, and even should I gain my end, 
it is hard to say how I may be treated by those in power. Let us drink a cup of wine together, for it may be that you shall see my face no more. I give my life to allay the misery of the people of this estate. If I die, mourn not over my fate, weep not for me. Having spoken thus, he addressed his wife and his four children, instructing them carefully as to what he desired to be done after his death, and minutely stating every wish of his heart. Then having drunk a parting cup with them, he cheerfully took leave of all present, and went to a tea house in the neighboring village of Punabashi, where the two messengers, Rokurobe and Jiuyemon, were anxiously awaiting his arrival, in order that they might recount to him all that had taken place at Yedo. In short, said they, it appears to us that we have failed completely, and we have come to meet you in order to hear what you propose. If you have any plan to suggest, we would fain be made acquainted with it. We have tried the officers of the district, replied Sogoro, and we have tried my lord's palace at Yedo. However often we might assemble before my lord's gate, no heed would be given to us. There is nothing left for us but to appeal to the shogun. So they sat talking over their plans until the night was far advanced and then they went to rest. The winter night was long, but when the cawing of the crows was about to announce the morning, the three friends started on their journey for the tea house at Asakusa, at which, upon their arrival, they found the other village elders already assembled. Welcome, Master Sogoro, said they. How is it that you have come so late? We have petitioned all the officers to no purpose, and we have broken our bones in vain. We are at our wit's end, and can think of no other scheme. If there is any plan which seems so good to you, we pray you to act upon it. Sirs, replied Sogoro, speaking very quietly, although we have met with no better success here than in our own place, there is no use in grieving. In a day or two, the Goroji will be going to the castle. You must wait for this opportunity, and following one of the litters, thrust in our memorial. This is my opinion. What think you of it, my masters? One and all, the assembled elders were agreed as to the excellence of this advice, and having decided to act upon it, they returned to their inn. Then Sogoro held a secret consultation with Jiuyemon, Hanzo, Rokurobe, Chinzo, and Kinshiro, five of the elders, and with their assistance, drew up the memorial. And having heard that on the 26th of the month, when the Gorojiu should go to the castle, Kuze Yamato no Kami would proceed to a palace under the western enclosure of the castle, they kept watch in a place hard by. As soon as they saw the litter of the Goroji approach, they drew near to it, and having humbly stated their grievances, handed in the petition. And as it was accepted, the six elders were greatly elated, and doubted not that their heart's desire would be attained. So they went off to a tea house at Ryogoku, and Jiuyemon said, We may congratulate ourselves on our success. We have handed in our petition to the Goroji, and now we may set our minds at rest. Before many days have passed, we shall hear good news from the rulers. To Master Sogoro is due great praise for his exertions. Sogoro, stepping forward, answered, Although we have presented our memorial to the Gorojiu, the matter will not be so quickly decided. It is therefore useless that so many of us should remain here. Let eleven men stay with me, and let the rest return home to their several villages. If we who remain are accused of conspiracy and beheaded, let the others agree to reclaim and bury our corpses. As for the expenses which we shall incur until our suit is concluded, let that be according to our original covenant. For the sake of the 136 villages, we will lay down our lives, if needs must, and submit to the disgrace of having our heads exposed as those of common malefactors. Then they had a parting feast together, and after a sad leave-taking, the main body of the elders went home to their own country, while the others, wending their way to their quarters, waited patiently to be summoned to the Supreme Court. On the second day of the twelfth month, Sogoro, having received a summons from the residence of the Goroji Kuze Yamato no Kami, proceeded to obey it and was ushered to the porch of the house, where two counselors, named Aiji Magidayu and Yamaji Yori, met him and said, Some days since you have had the audacity to thrust a memorial into the litter of our lord Yamato no Kami. By an extraordinary exercise of clemency, he is willing to pardon this heinous offense. But should you ever again endeavor to force your petitions upon him, you will be held guilty of riotous conduct. And with this, they gave back the memorial. I humbly admit the justice of his lordship's censure. But, oh, my lords, this is no hasty or ill-considered action. Year after year, affliction upon affliction has been heaped upon us, 
until at last the people are without even the necessaries of life. And we, seeing no end to the evil, have humbly presented this petition. I pray your lordships of your great mercy to consider our case, and deign to receive our memorial. Vouchsafe to take some measures that the people may live, and our gratitude for your great kindness will know no bounds. Your request is a just one, replied the two counsellors after hearing what he said, but your memorial cannot be received, so you must even take it back. With this, they gave back the document and wrote down the names of Sogoro and six of the elders who had accompanied him. There was no help for it. They must take back their petition and return to their inn. The seven men, dispirited and sorrowful, sat with folded arms considering what was best to be done, what plan should be devised, until at last, when they were at their wit's end, Sogoro said in a whisper, So our petition, which we gave in after so much pains, has been returned after all. With what face can we return to our villages after such a disgrace? I, for one, do not propose to waste my labor for nothing. Accordingly, I shall bide my time until some day, when the shogun shall go forth from the castle, and, lying in wait by the roadside, I shall make known our grievances to him, who is lord over our lord. This is our last chance. The others all applauded the speech, and having with one accord hardened their hearts, waited for their opportunity. End of section 25section 26 of tales of old japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org tales of old japan by lord reedsdale section 26 the ghost of sakura part 2 now it so happened that on the 20th day of the 12th month the then shogun prince iemitsu was pleased to worship at the tombs of his ancestors at Uyeno, and Sogoro and the other elders, hearing this, looked upon it as a special favor from the gods, and felt certain that this time they would not fail. So they drew up a fresh memorial, and at the appointed time, Sogoro hid himself under the Samaya Bridge, in front of the Black Gate at Uyeno. When Prince Iemitsu passed in his litter, Sogoro clambered up from under the bridge, to the great surprise of the shogun's attendants, who called out, Push the fellow on one side! But profiting by the confusion, Sogoro, raising his voice and crying, I wish to humbly present a petition to his highness in person, thrust forward his memorial, which he had tied on to the end of a bamboo stick six feet long, and tried to put it into the litter. And although there were cries to arrest him and he was buffeted by the escort, he crawled up to the side of the litter and the shogun accepted the document. But Sogoro was arrested by the escort and thrown into prison. As for the memorial, His Highness ordered that it should be handed in to the Goroji Hota Kotsuke no Suke, the lord of the petitioners. When Hota Kotsuke no Suke had returned home and read the memorial, he summoned his counselor, Kojima Shikibu, and said, The officials of my estate are mere bunglers. When the peasants assembled and presented the petition, they refuse to receive it, and have thus brought this trouble upon me. Their folly has been beyond belief. However, it cannot be helped. We must remit all the new taxes, and you must inquire how much was paid to the former lord of the castle. As for the Sogoro, he is not the only one who is at the bottom of the conspiracy. However, as his heinous offense of his in going out to lie in wait for the shogun's procession is unpardonable, we must manage to get him given up to us by the government, and, as an example for the rest of my people, he shall be crucified, he and his wife and his children, and after his death, all that he possesses shall be confiscated. The other six men shall be banished, and that will suffice. My lord, replied Shikibu, prostrating himself, your lordship's intentions are just. Sogoro, indeed, deserves any punishment for his outrageous crime but I humbly venture to submit that his wife and children cannot be said to be guilty in the same degree. I implore your lordship mercifully to be pleased to absolve them from so severe a punishment. Where the sin of the father is great, the wife and children cannot be spared, replied Kotsuke no Suke, and his counselor, seeing that his heart was hardened, was forced to obey his orders without further remonstrance. So Kotsuke no Suke, 
having obtained that Sogoro should be given up to him by the government, caused him to be brought to his estate of Sakura as a criminal, in a litter covered with nets, and confined him in prison. When his case had been inquired into, a decree was issued by the Lord Kotsuke no Suke that he should be punished for a heinous crime, and on the ninth day of the second month of the second year of the period styled Shoho, A.D. 1644, he was condemned to be crucified. Accordingly, Sogoro, his wife and children, and the elders of the 136 villages were brought before the courthouse of Sakura, in which were assembled 45 chief officers. The elders were then told that, yielding to their petition, their lord was graciously pleased to order that the oppressive taxes should be remitted, and that the dues levied should not exceed those of the olden time. As for Sogoro and his wife, the following sentence was passed upon them. For as you have set yourself up as the head of the villagers, whereas secondly you have dared to make light of the government by petitioning his highness the shogun directly, thereby offering an insult to your lord, and whereas thirdly you have presented a memorial to the goroju, and whereas fourthly you were privy to a conspiracy, for these four heinous crimes you are sentenced to death by crucifixion. Your wife is sentenced to die in like manner, and your children will be decapitated. This sentence is passed upon the following persons. Sogoro, chief of the village of Iwahashi, aged 48. His wife, Man, aged 38. His son, Genosuke, aged 13. His son, Sohei, aged 10. His son, Kihachi, aged 7. The eldest daughter of Sogoro, named Hatsu, 19 years of age, was married to a man named Jiemon, in the village of Hakamura in Shitachi, beyond the river, in the territory of Matsudaira Matsunokami, the prince of Sendai. His second daughter, whose name was Saki, 16 years of age, was married to Wonto Jiro, chief of a village on the property of my lord Naito Geki. No punishment was decreed against these two women. The six elders who had accompanied Sogoro were told that although by good rights they had merited death, yet by the special clemency of their lord their lives would be spared, but that they were condemned to banishment. Their wives and children would not be attained, and their property would be spared. The six men were banished to Oshima, in the province of Izu. Sogoro heard his sentence with pure courage. The six men were banished, but three of them lived to be pardoned on the occasion of the death of the shogun, Prince Genyuin, and return to their country. According to the above decision, the taxes were remitted, and men and women, young and old, rejoiced over the advantage that had been gained for them by Sogoro and by the six elders, and there was not one that did not mourn for their fate. When the officers of the several villages left the courthouse, one Zembe, chief of the village of Sakato, told the others that he had some important subjects to speak to them upon and begged them to meet him in the temple called Fukushoin. Every man having consented, and the hundred and thirty-six men having assembled at the temple, Zembe addressed them as follows. The success of our petition, in obtaining the reduction of taxes to the same amount as was levied by our former lord, is owing to Master Sogoro, who has thus thrown away his life for us. He and his wife and children are now to suffer as criminals for the sake of the one hundred and thirty-six villages, that such a thing should take place before our very eyes seems to me not to be born. What say you, my masters? Ay, ay, what you say is just from top to bottom, replied the others. Then Hansa Yemon, the elder of the village of Katsuta, stepped forward and said, As Master Zembe has just said, Sugoro is condemned to die for a matter in which all the village elders are concerned to a man. We cannot look on unconcerned. Full well I know that it is useless our pleading for Sugoro but we may at least petition that the lives of his wife and children may be spared. The assembled elders, having all applauded the speech, they determined to draw up a memorial, and they resolved, should their petition not be accepted by the local authorities, to present it at their lord's palace in Yedo, and, should that fail, to appeal to the government. Accordingly, before noon on the following day, they all affixed their seals to the memorial, which four of them, including Zembe and Hanza Yemon, composed as follows. With deep fear we humbly venture to present the following petition, 
which the elders of the 136 villages of this estate have sealed with their seals. In consequence of the humble petition which we lately offered up, the taxes have graciously been reduced to the rates levied by the former lord of the estate, and new laws have been vouchsafed to us. With reverence and joy, the peasants, great and small, have gratefully acknowledged these favors. With regard to Sogoro, to the elder of the village of Iwahashi, who ventured to petition his highness the shogun in person, thus being guilty of a heinous crime, he has been sentenced to death in the castle town. With fear and trembling we recognize the justice of his sentence. But in the matter of his wife and children, she is but a woman, and they are so young and innocent that they cannot distinguish the east from the west. We pray that in your great clemency you will remit their sin, and give them up to the representatives of the 136 villages, for which we shall be ever grateful. We, the elders of the village, know not to what extent we may be transgressing in presenting this memorial. We were all guilty of affixing our seals to the former petition, but Sogoro, who was chief of a large district, producing a thousand kokus of revenue and was therefore a man of experience, acted for the others, and we grieve that he alone should suffer for all. Yet in his case we reverently admit that there can be no reprieve. For his wife and children, however, we humbly implore your gracious mercy and consideration. Signed by the elders of the villages of the estate, the second year of Shoho, and the second month. Having drawn up this memorial, the hundred and thirty-six elders, with Zembe at their head, proceeded to the courthouse to present the petition, and found the various officers seated in solemn conclave. Then the clerk took the petition, and having opened it, read it aloud, and the counsellor, Ikeyura Kazuya, said, the petition which you have addressed to us is worthy of all praise, but you must know that this is a matter which is no longer within our control. The affair has been reported to the government, and although the priests of my lord's ancestral temple have interceded for Sogoro, my lord is so angry that he will not listen even to them, saying that had he not been one of the Goroju, he would have been in danger of being ruined by this man. His high station alone saved him. My lord spoke so severely that the priests themselves dare not recur to the subject. You see, therefore, that it will be no use your attempting to take any steps in the matter, for most certainly your petition will not be received. You had better then think no more about it. And with these words, he gave back the memorial. Zembe and the elders, seeing to their infinite sorrow that their mission was fruitless, left the courthouse, and most sorrowfully took counsel together, grinding their teeth in their disappointment when they thought over what the counsellor had said as to the futility of their attempt. Out of grief for this, Zembe, with Hanzayemon and Heijiuro, on the eleventh day of the second month, the day on which Sogoro and his wife and children suffered, left Ewaradai, the place of execution, and went to the temple Zenkoji, in the province of Shinshu, and from thence they ascended Mount Koya in Kishu, and on the first day of the eighth month, shaved their heads and became priests. Zembei changed his name to Kakushin, and Hanzayemon changed his to Zensho. As for Heijiro, he fell sick at the end of the seventh month, and on the eleventh day of the eighth month died, being forty-seven years old that year. These three men, who had loved Sogoro as the fishes love water, were true to him to the last. Heijiro was buried on Mount Koya. Kakushin wandered through the country as a priest, praying for the entry of Sogoro and his children into the perfection of paradise, and after visiting all the shrines and temples, came back at last to his own province of Shimosa, and took up his abode at the temple Ryukakuji, in the village of Kano, and in the district of Imban, praying and making offerings on behalf of the souls of Sogoro, his wife, and children. Hanza Yemon, now known as the priest Zensho, remained at Shinagawa, a suburb of Yedo, and by the charity of the good people, collected enough money to erect six bronze Buddhas, which remain standing to this day. He fell sick and died at the age of seventy, on the tenth day of the second month of the thirteenth year of the period styled Kambun. Zembei, who, as a priest, had changed his name to Kakushin, died at the age of seventy-six, on the seventeenth day of the tenth month of the second year of the period styled Empo. Thus did those men, for the sake of Sogoro and his family, give themselves up to works of devotion, and the other villagers also brought food to soothe the spirits of the dead, 
and prayed for their entry into paradise, and as litanies were repeated without intermission, there can be no doubt that Sogoro attained salvation. In paradise, where the blessings of God are distributed without favor, the soul learns its faults by the measure of the rewards given. The lusts of the flesh are abandoned, and the soul, purified, attains to the glory of Buddha. On the eleventh day of the second month of the second year of Shoho, Sogoro having been convicted of a heinous crime, a scaffold was erected at Ewaradai, and the counselor who resided at Yedo and the counselor who resided on the estate, with the other officers, proceeded to the place in all solemnity. Then the priests of Tokoji, in the village of Sakenaga, followed by coffin bearers, took their places in front of the counselors and said, We humbly beg leave to present a petition. What have your reverences to say? We are men who have forsaken the world and entered the priesthood, answered the monks respectfully, and we would fain, if it be possible, receive the bodies of those who are to die, that we may bury them decently. It will be a great joy to us if our humble petition be graciously heard and granted. Your request shall be granted. But as the crime of Sogoro was great, his body must be exposed for three days and three nights, after which the corpse shall be given to you. At the hour of the snake, 10 a.m., the hour appointed for the execution, the people from the neighboring villages in the castle town, old and young, men and women, flocked to see the sight. Numbers there were, too, who came to bid a last farewell to Sogoro, his wife and children, and to put up a prayer for them. When the hour had arrived, the condemned were dragged forth bound and made to sit upon coarse mats. Sogoro and his wife closed their eyes, for the sight was more than they could bear, and the spectators, with heaving breasts and streaming eyes, cried, Cruel! and pitiless! and taking sweet meats and cakes from the bosoms of their dresses, threw them to the children. At noon precisely, Sogoro and his wife were bound to the crosses, which were then set upright and fixed in the ground. When this had been done, their eldest son, Genosuke, was led forward to the scaffold in front of the two parents. Then Sogoro cried out, Oh, cruel, cruel! What crime has this poor child committed that he is treated thus? As for me, it matters not what becomes of me. And the tears trickled down his face. The spectators prayed aloud and shut their eyes, and the executioner himself, standing behind the boy, and saying that it was a pitiless thing that the child should suffer for the father's fault, prayed silently. Then Genosuke, who had remained with his eyes closed, said to his parents, O oh, my father and mother, I am going before you to paradise, that happy country, to wait for you. My little brothers and I will be on the banks of the river Sanzu, and stretch out our hands and help you across. Farewell, all you have come to see us die and now please cut off my head at once. With this he stretched out his neck, murmuring a last prayer, and not only Sogoro and his wife, but even the executioner and the spectators could not repress their tears, but the headsman, unnerved as he was and touched to the very heart, was forced on account of his office to cut off the child's head, and a piteous wail arose from the parents and the spectators. Then the younger child Sohei said to the headsman, Sir, I have a sore in my right shoulder, Please, cut my head off from the left shoulder, lest you hurt me. Alas, I know not how to die, nor what I should do. When the headsman and the officers present heard the child's artless speech, they wept again for very pity. But there was no help for it, and the head fell off more swiftly than water is drunk up by sand. Then little Kihachi, the third son, who on account of his tender years should have been spared, was butchered as he was in his simplicity eating the sweet meats which had been thrown to him by the spectators. When the execution of the children was over, the priests of Tokoji took their corpses, and having placed them in their coffins, carried them away, amidst the lamentations of the bystanders, and buried them with great solemnity. Then Shigayemon, one of the servants of the Danzayemon, the chief of the Etas, who had been engaged for the purpose, was just about to thrust his spear, when Oman, Sogoro's wife, raising her voice, said, Remember, my husband, that from the first you had made up your mind to this fate. What though our bodies be disgracefully exposed on these crosses? We have the promises of the gods before us, therefore mourn not. Let us fix our minds upon death, 
we are drawing near to paradise and shall soon be with the saints be calm my husband let us cheerfully lay down our single lives for the good of many man lives but for one generation his name for many a good name is more to be prized than life so she spoke and sagora on the cross laughing gaily answered well said wife what though we are punished for the many our petition was successful and there is nothing left to wish for now i am happy for i have attained my heart's desire the changes and chances of life are manifold but if i had five hundred lives and could five hundred times assume this shape of mine, I would die five hundred times to avenge this iniquity. For myself I care not, but that my wife and children should be punished also is too much. Pitiless and cruel, let my lord fence himself in with iron walls, yet shall my spirit burst through them and crush his bones as a return for this deed. And as he spoke, his eyes became vermilion red, and flashed like the sun or the moon, and he looked like the demon Razetsu come shouted he make haste and pierce me with a spear your wishes shall be obeyed said the eta shigayemon and thrust in a spear at his right side until it came out at his left shoulder and the blood streamed out like a fountain then he pierced the wife from the left side and she opening her eyes said in a dying voice farewell all you who are present may harm keep far from you farewell farewell and as her voice waxed faint the second spear was thrust in from her right side, and she breathed out her spirit. Sogoro, the color of his face not even changing, showed no sign of fear, but opening his eyes wide said, Listen, my masters, all you who have come to see this sight, recollect that I shall pay my thanks to my lord Kotsuke no Suke for this day's work. You shall see it for yourselves, so that it shall be talked of for generations to come. As a sign when I am dead, my head shall turn and face towards the castle. When you see this, doubt not that my words shall come true. When he had spoken thus, the officer directing the execution gave a sign to the Eta, Shigayemon, and ordered him to finish the execution, so that Sogoro should speak no more. So Shigayemon pierced him twelve or thirteen times until he died, and when he was dead, his head turned and faced the castle. When the two counselors beheld this miracle, they came down from their raised platform and knelt down before Sogoro's dead body and said, Although you are but a peasant on this estate, you conceived a noble plan to succor the other farmers in their distress. You bruised your bones and crushed your heart for their sakes. Still, in that you appealed to the shogun in person, you committed a grievous crime and made light of your superiors, and for this it was impossible not to punish you. Still, we admit that to include your wife and children in your crime and kill them before your eyes was a cruel deed. What is done is done, and regret is of no avail. However, honors shall be paid to your spirit. You shall be canonized as a saint daimyo, and you shall be placed among the tutelar deities of my lord's family. With these words, the two counselors made repeated reverences before the corpse, and in this they showed their faithfulness to their lord. But he, when the matter was reported to him, only laughed scornfully at the idea that the hatred of a peasant could affect his feudal lord, and said that a vassal who had dared to hatch a plot, which had it not been for his high office, would have been sufficient to ruin him, had only met with his deserts. As for causing him to be canonized, let him be as he was. Seeing their lord's anger, his counsellors could only obey. But it was not long before he had cause to know that, though Sogoro was dead, his vengeance was yet alive. The relations of Sagora and the elders of the villages, having been summoned to the courthouse, the following document was issued. Although the property of Sogoro, the elder of the village of Iwahashi, is confiscated, his household furniture shall be made over to his two married daughters, and the village officials will look to it that these few poor things be not stolen by lawless and unprincipled men. His rice fields and cornfields, his mountain land and forest land, will be sold by auction. His house and grounds will be given over to the elder of the village. The price fetched by his property will be paid over to the lord of the estate. The above decree will be published in full to the peasants of the village, and it is strictly forbidden to find fault with its decision. The twelfth day of the second month of the second year of the period show. The peasants having heard this degree with all humility left the courthouse. Then the following punishments were awarded to the officers of the castle who by rejecting the petition of the peasants in the first instance 
had brought trouble upon their lord. Dismissed from their office, the resident councillors at Yedo and at the castle town, banished from the province, four district governors and three bailiffs and nineteen petty officers. Dismissed from the office, three metsukes or censors and seven magistrates. Condemned to Harakiri, one district governor and one Yedo bailiff. The severity of this sentence is owing to the injustice of the officials in raising new and unprecedented taxes and bringing affliction upon the people and in refusing to receive the petitions of the peasants without consulting their lord, thus driving them to appeal to the shogun in person. In their avarice they look not to the future, but laid too heavy a burden on the peasants, so that they made an appeal to a higher power, endangering the honor of their lord's house. For this bad government, the various officials are to be punished as above. In this wise was justice carried out at the palace at Yedo and at the courthouse at home. But in the history of the world, from the dark ages down to the present time, there are few instances of one man laying down his life for the many, as Sogoro did. Noble and peasant praise him alike. End of section 26「Section 27 of Tales of Old Japan」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « Tales of Old Japan » by Lord Reedsdale Section 27 – The Ghost of Sakura – Part 3 As month after month passed away, towards the fourth year of the period Shoho, the wife of my lord Kotsuke no Suke, being with child, was seized with violent pains, and retainers were sent to all the different temples and shrines to pray by proxy, but all to no purpose. She continued to suffer as before. Towards the end of the seventh month of the year, there appeared every night a preternatural light above the lady's chamber. This was accompanied by hideous sounds as of many people laughing fiendishly, and sometimes by piteous wailings as though myriads of persons were lamenting. The profound distress caused by this added to her sufferings. So her own privy counsellor, an old man, took his place in the adjoining chamber and kept watch. All of a sudden, he heard a noise as if a number of people were walking on the boards of the roof of my lady's room. Then there was a sound of men and women weeping. And when, thunderstruck, the counsellor was wondering what it could all be, there came a wild burst of laughter, and all was silent. Early the following morning, the old women who had charge of my lady's household presented themselves before my lord Kotsuke no Suke and said, Since the middle of last month, the waiting women have been complaining to us of the ghostly noises by which my lady is nightly disturbed, and they say that they cannot continue to serve her. We have tried to soothe them by saying that the devils should be exorcised at once, and that there was nothing to be afraid of. Still we feel that their fears are not without reason, and that they really cannot do their work, so we beg that your lordship will take the matter into your consideration. This is a passing strange story of yours. However, I will go myself tonight to my lady's apartments and keep watch. You can come with me. Accordingly, that night, my lord Kotsuke no Suke sat up in person. At the hour of the rat, midnight, a fearful noise of voices was heard, and Sogoro and his wife, bound to the fatal crosses, suddenly appeared, and the ghosts, seizing the lady by the hand, said, We have come to meet you. The pains you are suffering are terrible, but they are nothing in comparison with those of the hell to which we are about to lead you. At these words, Kotsuke no Suke, seizing his sword, tried to sweep the ghosts away with a terrific cut, but a loud peal of laughter was heard, and the visions faded away. Kotsuke no Suke, terrified, sent his retainers to the temples and shrines to pray that the demons might be cast out, but the noises were heard nightly as before. When the eleventh month of the year came around, the apparitions of human forms in my lady's apartments became more and more frequent and terrible, all the spirits railing at her and howling out that they had come to fetch her. The women would all scream and faint, and then the ghosts would disappear amid yells of laughter. Night after night this happened, and even in the daytime, the visions would manifest themselves, and my lady's sickness grew worse daily, until in the last month of the year she died.
of grief and terror. Then the ghost of Sogoro and his wife crucified would appear day and night in the chamber of Kotsuke no Suke, floating round the room, and glaring at him with red and flaming eyes. The hair of the attendants would stand on end with terror, and if they tried to cut at the spirits, their limbs would be cramped, and their feet and hands would not obey their bidding. Kotsuke no Suke would draw the sword that lay by his bedside, but as often as he did so, the ghosts faded away, only to appear again in a more hideous shape than before, until at last, having exhausted his strength and spirits, even he became terror-stricken. The whole household was thrown into confusion, and day after day, mystic rites and incantations were performed by the priests over braziers of charcoal, while prayers were recited without ceasing. But the visions only became more frequent, and there was no sign of their ceasing. After the fifth year of Shoho, the style of the years was changed to Keian, and during the first year of Keian, the spirits continued to haunt the palace, and now they appeared in the chamber of Kotsuke no Suke's eldest son, surrounding themselves with even more terrors than before. And when Kotsuke no Suke was about to go to the shogun's castle, they were seen howling out their cries of vengeance in the porch of the house. At last, the relations of the family and the members of the household took counsel together and told Kotsuke no Suke that without doubt no ordinary means would suffice to lay the ghosts. A shrine must be erected to Sagoro, and divine honors paid to him, after which the apparitions would assuredly cease. Kotsuke no Suke having carefully considered the matter and given his consent, Sogoro was canonized under the name of Sogo Daimyo, and a shrine was erected in his honor. After divine honors had been paid to him, the awful visions were no more seen, and the ghost of Sogoro was laid forever. In the second year of the period Keian, on the eleventh day of the tenth month, on the occasion of the festival of first lighting the fire on the hearth, the various daimyos and hatamotos of distinction went to the castle of the shogun at Yedo to offer their congratulations on this occasion. During the ceremonies, my lord Hota Kotsuke no Suke and Sakai Iwami no Kami, lord of the castle of Matsumoto in the province of Shinshu, had a quarrel, the origin of which was not made public, and Sakai Iwami no Kami, although he came of a brave and noble family, received so severe a wound that he died on the following day at the age of 43. And in consequence of this, his family was ruined and disgraced. My lord Kotsuke no Suke, by great good fortune, contrived to escape from the castle and took refuge in his own house, whence, mounting a famous horse called Hira Abumi, he fled to his castle of Sakura in Shimosa, accomplishing the distance, which is about sixty miles in six hours. When he arrived in front of the castle, he called out in a loud voice to the guard within to open the gate, answering in reply to their challenge that he was Kotsuke no Suke, the lord of the castle. The guard, not believing their ears, sent word to the counselor in charge of the castle, who rushed out to see if the person demanding admittance were really their lord. When he saw Kotsuke no Suke, he caused the gates to be opened, and thinking it more than strange, said, Is this indeed you, my lord? What strange chance brings your lordship hither thus late at night, on horseback and alone, without a single follower? With these words he ushered in Kotsuke no Suke, who in reply to the anxious inquiries of his people as to the cause of a sudden appearance said, You may well be astonished. I had a quarrel today in the castle at Yedo with Sakai Iwami no Kami, the lord of the castle of Matsumoto, and I cut him down. I shall soon be pursued, so we must strengthen the fortress and prepare for an attack. The household, hearing this, were greatly alarmed, and the whole castle was thrown into confusion. In the meanwhile, the people of Kotsuke no Suke's palace at Yedo, not knowing whether their lord had fled, were in the greatest anxiety, until a messenger came from Sakura, and reported his arrival there. When the quarrel inside the castle of Yedo and Kotsuke no Suke's flight had been taken cognizance of, he was attained of treason, and soldiers were sent to seize him, dead or alive. Mizuno Setsu no Kami and Goto Yamato no Kami were charged with the execution of the order and sallied forth on the thirteenth day of the tenth month to carry it out. When they arrived at the town of Sasai, they sent a herald with the following message. Whereas Kotsuke no Suke killed Sakai Iwami no Kami inside the castle of Yedo and has fled to his own castle without leave, he is attained of treason, and we, 
being connected with him by ties of blood and of friendship, have been charged to seize him. The herald delivered this message to the counselor of Kotsuke no Suke, who, pleading as an excuse that his lord was mad, begged the two nobles to intercede for him. Goto Yamato no Kami, upon this, called the counselor to him, and spoke privately to him, after which the latter took his leave and returned to the castle of Sakura. In the meanwhile, after consultation at Yedo, it was decided that, as Goto Yamato no Kami and Mizu no Setsu no Kami were related to Kotsuke no Suke and might meet with difficulties for that very reason, two other nobles, Ogasawara Iki no Kami and Nagaihida no Kami, should be sent to assist them, with orders that should any trouble arise, they should send a report immediately to Yedo. In consequence of this order, the two nobles with 5,000 men were about to march for Sakura on the 15th of the month, when a messenger arrived from that place bearing the following dispatch for the Goroju from the two nobles who had preceded them. In obedience to the orders of His Highness the Shogun, we proceeded on the 13th day of this month to the castle of Sakura and conducted a thorough investigation of the affair. It is true that Kotsuke no Suke has been guilty of treason, but he is out of his mind. His retainers have called in physicians, and he is undergoing treatment by which his senses are being gradually restored and his mind is being awakened from its sleep. At the time when he slew Sakai Iwami no Kami, he was not accountable for his actions, and will be sincerely penitent when he is aware of his crime. We have taken him prisoner, and have the honor to await your instructions. In the meanwhile, we beg by these present to let you know what we have done. Sign. Goto Yamato no Kami, Mizu no Setsu no Kami, to the Goroju, second year of Keian, second month, fourteenth day. This dispatch reached Yedo on the 16th of the month and was read by the Goroju after they had left the castle. And in consequence of the report of Kotsuke no Suke's madness, the second expedition was put a stop to, and the following instructions were sent to Goto Yamato no Kami and Mizu no Setsu no Kami. With reference to the affair of Hota Kotsuke no Suke, lord of the castle of Sakura in Shimosa, whose quarrel with Sakai Iwami no Kami within the castle of Yedo ended in bloodshed, for this he and his crime in disregard of the sanctity of the castle. It is ordered that Kotsuke no Suke be brought as a prisoner to Yedo, in a litter covered with nets, that his case may be judged. Second year of Keian, second month. Signed by the Goroju, Inaba Mino no Kami, Inoye Kawachi no Kami, Kato Echiyu no Kami. Upon the receipt of this dispatch, Hota Kotsuke no Suke was immediately placed in a litter covered with a net of green silk, and conveyed to Yedo, strictly guarded by the retainers of the two nobles, and having arrived at the capital, was handed over to the charge of Akimoto Tajima no Kami. All his retainers were quietly dispersed, and his empty castle was ordered to be thrown open and given in charge to Mizuno Iki no Kami. At last, Kotsuke no Suke began to feel that the death of his wife and his own present misfortunes were a just retribution for the death of Sogoro and his wife and children and he was as one awakened from a dream. Then night and morning, in his repentance, he offered up prayers to the sainted spirit of the dead farmer, and acknowledged and bewailed his crime, vowing that if his family were spared from ruin and re-established, intercession should be made at the court of the Mikado, at Kyoto, on behalf of the spirit of Sogoro, so that being worshipped with even greater honors than before, his name should be handed down to all generations. In consequence of this, it happened that the spirit of Sogoro, having relaxed in its vindictiveness, and having ceased to persecute the house of Hota, in the first month of the fourth year of Keian, Kotsuke no Suke received the summons from the shogun, and having been forgiven, was made lord of the castle of Matsuyama in the province of Dewa, with a revenue of 20,000 kokus. In the same year, on the twentieth day of the fourth month, the shogun, Prince Iemitsu, was pleased to depart this life at the age of 48, and whether by the forgiving spirit of the prince, or by the divine interposition of the sainted Sogoro, Kotsuke no Suke was promoted to the castle of Utsunomiya, in the province of Shimotsuke, with a revenue of 80,000 kokus, and his name was changed to Hotahida no Kami. He also received again his original castle of Sakura, with a revenue of 20,000 kokus, so that there can be no doubt that the saint was befriending him. In return for these favors, the shrine of Sogoro was made as beautiful as a gem. 
it is needless to say how many of the peasants of the estate flocked to the shrine. Any good luck that might befall the people was ascribed to it, and night and day the devout worshipped at it. Here follows a copy of the petition which Sogoro presented to the shogun. We, the elders of the hundred and thirty-six villages of the district of Chiba, in the province of Shimosa, and of the district of Buji, in the province of Kadzusa, most reverently offer up this our humble petition. When our former lord Doi Shosho was transferred to another castle in the ninth year of the period Kanye, Hotakaga no Kami became lord of the castle of Sakura, and in the seventeenth year of the same period, my lord Kotsuke no Suke succeeded him. Since that time, the taxes laid upon us have been raised in the proportion of one to and two sho to each koku. Item. At the present time, taxes are raised on 19 of our articles of produce, whereas our former lord only required that we should furnish him with pulse and sesame, for which he paid in rice. Item. Not only are we not paid now for our produce, but if it is not given in to the day, we are driven and goaded by the officials. And if there be any further delay, we are manacled and severely reprimanded, so that if our own crops fail, we have to buy produce from other districts and are pushed to the utmost extremity of affliction. Item. We have over and over again prayed to be relieved from these burdens, but our petitions are not received. The people are reduced to poverty, so that it is hard for them to live under such grievous taxation. Often they have tried to sell the land which they till, but none can be found to buy so they have sometimes given over their land to the village authorities and fled with their wives to other provinces, and 730 men or more have been reduced to begging, 185 houses have fallen into ruins, land producing 7,000 kokus has been given up and remains untilled, and 11 temples have fallen into decay in consequence of the ruin of those upon whom they depended. Besides this, the poverty-stricken farmers and women having been obliged to take refuge in other provinces and having no abiding place, have been driven to evil courses and bring men to speak ill of their lord. And the village officials, being unable to keep order, are blamed and reproved. No attention has been paid to our repeated representations upon this point, so we were driven to petition the Goroji Kuze Yamato no Kami as he was on his way to the castle, but our petition was returned to us. And now, as a last resource, we tremblingly ventured to approach His Highness the Shogun in person. The first year of the period Shoho, twelfth month, twentieth day. The seals of the elders of the 136 villages. The Shogun at the time was Prince Iemitsu, the grandson of Ieyasu. He received the name Daiyu in after his death. The Goroji at the time were Hota Kotsuke no Suke, Sakai Iwami no Kami, Inaba Mino no Kami, Kato Echio no Kami, Inoye Kawachi no Kami. The Wakadoshiyori, or Second Council, were Tori Wakasa no Kami, Tsuchiya Dewa no Kami, and Itakura Naize no Sho. The belief in ghosts appears to be as universal as that in the immortality of the soul upon which it depends. Both in China and Japan, the departing spirit is invested with the power of revisiting the earth and in a visible form, tormenting its enemies and haunting those places where the perishable part of it mourned and suffered. Haunted houses are slow to find tenants, for ghosts almost always come with revengeful intent. Indeed, the owners of such houses will almost pay men to live in them. Such is the dread which they inspire, and the anxiety to blot out the stigma. On a cold winter's night at Yedo, as I was sitting with a few Japanese friends, huddled round the imperfect heat of a brazier of charcoal, the conversation turned upon the story of Sogoro and upon ghostly apparitions in general. Many a weird tale was told that evening, and I noted down the three or four which follow, for the truth of which the narrators vouched with the utmost confidence. About ten years ago, there lived a fishmonger named Zenroku in the Mikawa Street at Kanda in Yedo. He was a poor man living with his wife and one little boy. His wife fell sick and died so he engaged an old woman to look after his boy while he himself went out to sell his fish. It happened one day that he and the other hucksters of his guild were gambling, and this coming to the ears of the authorities, they were all thrown into prison. Although their offense was in itself a light one, still they were kept for some time in durance, 
while the matter was being investigated, and Zenroku, owing to the damp and foul air of the prison, fell sick with fever. His little child, in the meantime, had been handed over by the authorities to the charge of the petty officers of the ward to which his father belonged, and was being well cared for, for Zenroku was known to be an honest fellow, and his fate excited much compassion. One night Zenroku, pale and emaciated, entered the house in which his boy was living, and all the people joyfully congratulated him on his escape from jail. Why, we heard that you were sick in prison. This is indeed a joyful return. Then Zenroku thanked those who had taken care of the child, saying that he had returned secretly by the favor of his jailers that night, but that on the following day his offense would be remitted, and he should be able to take possession of his house again publicly, for that night he must return to the prison. With this he begged those present to continue their good offices to his babe, and with a sad and reluctant expression of countenance, he left the house. On the following day, the officers of that ward were sent for by the prison authorities. They thought that they were summoned, that Zenroku might be handed back to them a free man, as he himself had said to them. But to their surprise, they were told that he had died the night before in prison, and were ordered to carry away his dead body for burial. Then they knew that they had seen Zenroku's ghost, and that when he said that he should be returned to them on the morrow, he had alluded to his corpse. So they buried him decently and brought up a son who is alive to this day. The next story was told by a professor in the college at Yedo, and although it is not of so modern a date as the last, he stated it to be well authenticated, and one of general notoriety. About two hundred years ago, there was a chief of the police named Aoyama Shuzen, who lived in the street called Bancho at Yedo. His duty was to detect thieves and incendiaries. He was a cruel and violent man, without heart or compassion, and thought nothing of killing or torturing a man to gratify spite or revenge. This man Shuzen had in his house a servant maid called Okiku, the chrysanthemum, who had lived in the family since her childhood and was well acquainted with her master's temper. One day, Okiku accidentally broke one of a set of ten porcelain plates upon which he set a high value. She knew that she would suffer for her carelessness but she thought that if she concealed the matter, her punishment would be still more severe, so she went at once to her master's wife, and in fear and trembling confessed what she had done. When Shuzen came home and heard that one of his favorite plates was broken, he flew into a violent rage and took the girl to a cupboard, where he left her bound with cords, and every day cut off one of her fingers. Okiku, tightly bound and in agony, could not move, but at last she contrived to bite or cut the ropes asunder and escaping into the garden, threw herself into a well, and was drowned. From that time forth, every night a voice was heard coming from the well, counting one, two, three, and so on up to nine, the number of plates that remained unbroken, and then when the tenth plate should have been counted, would come a burst of lamentation. The servants of the house, terrified at this, all left their master's service, until Shuza, not having a single retainer left, was unable to perform his public duties, and when the officers of the government heard of this, he was dismissed from his office. At this time there was a famous priest, called Mikadzuki Shonin, of the temple Denzuin, who having been told of the affair, came one night to the house, and when the ghost began to count the plates, reproved the spirit, and by his prayers and admonitions, caused it to cease from troubling the living. The laying of the disturbed spirits appears to form one of the regular functions of the Buddhist priests. At least we find them playing a conspicuous part in almost every ghost story. About thirty years ago, there stood a house at Mitsume, in the Honjo of Yedo, which was said to be nightly visited by ghosts, so that no man dared to live in it, and it remained untenanted on that account. However, a man called Miura Takeshi, a native of the province of Oshiu, who came to Yedo to set up in business as a fencing master, but was too poor to hire a house. Hearing that there was a haunted house for which no tenant could be found, and that the owner would let any man live in it rent-free, said that he feared neither man nor devil, and obtained leave to occupy the house. So he hired a fencing room, in which he gave his lessons by day, and after midnight returned to the haunted house. One night his wife, 
who took charge of the house in his absence, was frightened by a fearful noise proceeding from a pond in the garden, and thinking that this certainly must be the ghost that she had heard so much about, she covered her head with the bedclothes and remained breathless with terror. When her husband came home, she told him what had happened, and on the following night he returned earlier than usual and waited for the ghostly noise. At the same time as before, a little after midnight, the same sound was heard, as though a gun had been fired inside the pond. Opening the shutters, he looked out, and saw something like a black cloud floating on the water, and in the cloud was the form of a bald man. Thinking that there must be some cause for this, he instituted careful inquiries, and learned that the former tenant some ten years previously had borrowed money from a blind shampooer, and being unable to pay the debt had murdered his creditor, who began to press him for his money, and had thrown his head into the pond. The fencing master accordingly collected his pupils and emptied the pond, and found a skull at the bottom of it. So he called in a priest and buried the skull in a temple, causing prayers to be offered up for the repose of the murdered man's soul. Thus the ghost was laid and appeared no more. The belief in curses hanging over families for generations is as common as that in ghosts and supernatural apparitions. There is a strange story of this nature in the house of Asai, belonging to the Hatamoto class. The ancestor of the present representative six generations ago had a certain concubine who was in love with a man who frequented the house and wished in her heart to marry him. But being a virtuous woman, she never thought of doing any evil deed. But the wife of my lord Asai was jealous of the girl and persuaded her husband that her rival in his affections had gone astray. When he heard this, he was very angry and beat her with a candlestick so that he put out her left eye. The girl, who had indignantly protested her innocence, finding herself so cruelly handled, pronounced a curse against the house, upon which her master, seizing the candlestick again, dashed out her brains and killed her. Shortly afterwards, my lord Asai lost his left eye and fell sick and died, and from the time forth to this day, it is said that the representatives of the house have all lost their left eyes at the age of forty, and shortly afterwards they have fallen sick and died at the same age as the cruel lord who killed his concubine. End of section 27this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Section 28. The Ghost of Sakura, Part 4. Note. Of the many fair scenes of Yedo, none is better worth visiting than the Temple of Zojoji one of the two great burial places of the shoguns. Indeed, if you wish to see the most beautiful spots of any oriental city, ask for the cemeteries. The homes of the dead are ever the loveliest places. Standing in a park of glorious firs and pines beautifully kept, which contains quite a little town of neat, clean-looking houses, together with thirty-four temples for the use of the priests and attendants of the shrines, the main temple, with its huge red pillars supporting a heavy Chinese roof of grey tiles, is approached through a colossal open hall, which leads into a stone courtyard. At one end of this courtyard is a broad flight of steps, the three or four lower ones of stone, and the upper ones of red wood. At these, the visitor is warned by a notice to take off his boots, a request which Englishmen, with characteristic disregard of the feelings of others, usually neglect to comply with. The main hall of the temple is of large proportions, and the high altar is decorated with fine bronze candelabra, incense burners, and other ornaments, and on two days of the year a very curious collection of pictures representing the five hundred gods, whose images are known to all persons who have visited Canton, is hung along the walls. The big bell outside the main hall is rather remarkable on account of the great beauty of the deep bass waves of sound which it rolls through the city than on account of its size which is as nothing when compared with that of the big bells of Moscow and Peking. Still, it is not to be despised even in this respect, for it is ten feet high and five feet eight inches in diameter, while its metal is a foot thick. It was hung up in the year 1673. 
but the chief objects of interest in these beautiful grounds are the chapels attached to the tombs of the shoguns. It is said that as Prince Ieyasu was riding into Yedo to take possession of his new castle, the abbot of Zojoji, an ancient temple which then stood at Hibiya, near the castle, went forth and waited before the gate to do homage to the prince. Ieyasu, seeing that the abbot was no ordinary man, stopped and asked his name, and entered the temple to rest himself. The smooth-spoken monk soon found such favor with Ieyasu that he chose Sujoji to be his family temple, and seeing that its grounds were narrow and inconveniently near the castle, he caused it to be removed to its present site. In the year 1610, the temple was raised, by the intercession of Ieyasu, to the dignity of the imperial temples, which, until the last revolution, were presided over by princes of the blood, and to the abbot was granted the right, on going to the castle, of seeing in his litter as far as the entrance hall, instead of dismounting at the usual place and proceeding on foot through several gates and courtyards. Nor were the privileges of the temple confined to barren honors, for it was endowed with lands of the value of five thousand kokus of rice yearly. When Ieyasu died, the shrine called Antoku In was erected in his honor to the south of the main temple. Here, on the seventeenth day of the fourth month, the anniversary of his death, ceremonies are held in honor of his spirit, deified as Gongen Sama, and the place is thrown open to all who may wish to come and pray. But Ieyasu is not buried here. His remains lie in a gorgeous shrine among the mountains some eighty miles of Yedo, at Niko, a place so beautiful that the Japanese have a rhyming proverb which says that he who has not seen Niko should never pronounce the word Keko, charming, delicious, grand, beautiful. Hidetada, the son and successor of Ieyasu, together with Ienobu, Ietsugu, Ieshige, Ieyoshi, and Iemochi, the sixth, seventh, ninth, twelfth, and fourteenth shoguns of the Tokugawa dynasty, are buried in three shrines attached to the temple. The remainder, with the exception of Iemitsu, the third shogun, who lies with his grandfather at Niko, are buried at Uyeno. The shrines are of exceeding beauty, lying on one side of a splendid avenue of scotch firs, which border a broad, well-kept gravel walk. Passing through a small gateway of rare design, we come into a large stone courtyard, lined with a long array of colossal stone lanterns, the gift of the vassals of the departed prince. A second gateway, supported by gilt pillars carved all round with figures of dragons, leads into another court, in which a bell tower, a great cistern cut out of a single block of stone like a sarcophagus, and a smaller number of lanterns of bronze, these are given by the Gosan Ke, the three princely families in which a succession to the office of shogun was vested. Inside this is a third court, partly covered like a cloister, the approach to which is a doorway of even greater beauty and richness than the last. The ceiling is gilt and painted with arabesques and with heavenly angels playing on musical instruments, and the panels of the walls are sculptured in high relief with admirable representations of birds and flowers, life-size, lifelike, all being colored to imitate nature. Inside this enclosure stands a shrine, before the closed door of which a priest on one side, and a retainer of the house of Tokugawa on the other, sit mounting guard, mute and immovable, as though they themselves were part of the carved ornaments. Passing on one side of the shrine, we come to another court, plainer than the last, and at the back of the little temple inside it is a flight of stone steps, at the top of which, protected by a bronze door, stands a simple monumental urn of bronze on a stone pedestal. Under this is the grave itself, and it has always struck me that there is no small amount of poetical feeling in this simple ending to so much magnificence. The sermon may have been preached by design, or it may have been by accident, but the lesson is there. There is little difference between the three shrines, all of which are decorated in the same manner. It is very difficult to do justice to their beauty in words. Riding many thousand miles away from them, I have the memory before me of a place green in winter, pleasant and cool in the hottest summer, of peaceful cloisters, of the fragrance of incense, of the subdued chant of richly robed priests, and the music of bells, of exquisite designs, harmonious coloring, rich gilding. The hum of the vast city outside is unheard here. Ieyasu himself, in the mountains of Niko, has no quieter resting place than his descendants in the heart of the city over which they ruled. Besides the graves of the shoguns, 
Zojoji contains other lesser shrines, in which are buried the wives of the second, sixth, and eleventh shoguns, and the father of Ienobu, the sixth shogun, who succeeded to the office by adoption. There is also a holy place called the Satsuma Temple, which is special interest. In it is a tablet of honor of Tadayoshi, the fifth son of Ieyasu, whose title was Matsuda Ira Satsuma no Kami, and who died young. At his death, five of his retainers, with one Ogasasawara Kemotsu at their head, disemboweled themselves, that they might follow their young master into the next world. They were buried in this place, and I believe that this is the last instance on record of the ancient Japanese costume of Junshi, that is to say, dying with a master. There are during the year several great festivals which are specially celebrated at Zojoji. The chief of these are the Kaisanki, or Founder's Day, which is on the 18th day of the 7th month, the 25th day of the 1st month, the anniversary of the death of the monk Honen, the founder of the Jodo sect of Buddhism, that to which the temple belongs, the anniversary of the death of Buddha, on the 15th of the 2nd month, the birthday of Buddha on the 8th day of the 4th month, and from the 6th to the 15th of the 10th month. At Uyeno is the second of the burial grounds of the shoguns, the temple Toyezan, which stood in the grounds of Uyeno, was built by Iemitsu, the third of the shoguns of the house of Tokugawa. In the year 1625, in honor of Yakushi Niyorai, the Buddhist Esculapius, it faces the Kimon, or Devil's Gate, of the castle, and was erected upon the model of the temple of Hiyeizan, one of the most famous of the holy places of Kyoto. Having founded the temple, the next care of Iemitsu was to pray that Morizumi, the second son of the retired emperor, should come and reside there, and from that time until 1868, the temple was always presided over by a Miya, or a member of the Mikado's family, who was specially charged with the care of the tomb of Ieyasu at Miko, and whose position was that of an ecclesiastical chief or primate over the east of Japan. The temples in Yedo are not to be compared in point of beauty with those in and about Peking. What is marble there is wood here. Still, they are very handsome and in the days of its magnificence the temple of Uyeno was one of the finest. Alas, the main temple, the hall in honor of the sect to which it belongs, the hall of services, the bell tower, the entrance hall, and the residence of the Prince of the Blood were all burnt down in the Battle of Uyeno in the summer of 1868, when the shogun's men made their last stand in Yedo against the troops of the Mikado. The fate of the day was decided by two field pieces, which the latter contrived to mount on the roof of a neighboring tea house, and the shogun's men, driven out of the place, carried off the Mia in the vain hope of raising his standard in the north as that of a rival Mikado. A few of the lesser temples and tombs, and the beautiful park like grounds, are but the remnants of the former glory of Ieno. Among these is a temple in the form of a roofless stage, in honor of the thousand handed Kwanon. In the Middle Ages, during the civil wars between the houses of Gen and Hei, one Morihisa, a captain of the house of Hei, after the destruction of his clan, went and prayed for a thousand days at the temple of the thousand-handed Kwanon at Kiyomidzu in Kyoto. His retreat having been discovered, he was seized and brought bound to Kamakura, the chief town of the house of Gen. Here, he was condemned to die at a place called Yui, by the seashore. But every time that the executioner lifted his sword to strike, the blade was broken by the god Kwanon and at the same time the wife of Yorimoto, the chief of the house of Gen, was warned in a dream to spare Morihisa's life. So Morihisa was reprieved and rose to power in the state, and all this was by the miraculous intervention of the god Kwanon, who takes such good care of his faithful votaries. To him, this temple is dedicated. A colossal bronze Buddha, 22 feet high, set up some 200 years ago, and a stone lantern, 20 feet high, and twelve feet round at the top, are greatly admired by the Japanese. There are only three such lanterns in the empire, the other two being at Nanzenji, a temple in Kyoto, and Atsura, a shrine in the province of Owari. All three were erected by the piety of one man, Sakuma Daizen Nosuke, in the year A.D. 1631. Iemitsu, the founder of the temple, was buried with his grandfather Ieyasu at Miko. But both of these princes are honored with shrines here. The shoguns who are interred at Uyeno are Ietsuna, Tsunayoshi, Yoshimune, Ieharu, 
Ienori, and Iesada. The fourth, fifth, eighth, tenth, eleventh, and thirteenth princes of the line. Besides them are buried five wives of the shoguns and the father of the eleventh shogun. End of section 28. Section 29 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer W. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reddesdale. Section number 29. How Tajima Shume was tormented by a devil of his own creation. Once upon a time a certain ronin, Tajima Shume by name, an able and well-read man, being on his travels to see the world, went up to Kyoto by the Tokaido. One day, in the neighborhood of Nagoya, in the province of Owari, he fell in with a wandering priest with whom he entered into conversation. Finding that they were bound for the same place, they agreed to travel together, beguiling their weary way by pleasant talk on divers matters, and so, by degrees, they became more intimate. They began to speak without restraint about their private affairs. And the priest, trusting thoroughly in the honor of his companion, told him the object of his journey. For some time past, said he, I have nourished a wish that has engrossed all of my thoughts, for I am bent on setting up a molten image in honor of Buddha. With this object I have wandered through various provinces, collecting alms and, who knows by what weary toil, we have succeeded in amassing two hundred ounces of silver, Enough, I trust, to erect a handsome bronze figure. What says the proverb? He who bears a jewel in his bosom bears poison. Hardly had the ronin heard these words of the priest than an evil heart arose within him, and he thought to himself, Man's life from the womb to the grave is made up of good and of ill luck. Here am I, nearly forty years old, a wanderer, without a calling or even hope of advancement in the world. To be sure, it seems a shame. Yet if I could steal the money this priest is boasting about, I could live at ease for the rest of my days. And so he began casting about how best he might compass his purpose. But the priest, far from guessing the drift of his comrades' thoughts, journeyed cheerfully on till they reached the town of Kuana. Here there is an arm of the sea, which is crossed in ferry boats that start as soon as some twenty or thirty passengers are gathered together, and in one of these boats the two travelers embarked. About halfway across, the priest was taken with a sudden necessity to go to the side of the boat, and the ronin, following him, tripped him up whilst no one was looking and flung him into the sea. When the boatmen and passengers heard the splash and saw the priest struggling in the water, they were afraid and made every effort to save him. But the wind was fair, and the boat running swiftly under the bellying sails, so they were soon a few hundred yards off from the drowning man, who sank before the boat could be turned to rescue him. When he saw this, the ronin feigned the utmost grief and dismay, and said to his fellow passengers, This priest whom we have just lost was my cousin. He was going to Kyoto to visit the shrine of his patron, and as I happened to have business there as well, we settled to travel together. Now, alas, by this misfortune, my cousin is dead, and I am left alone. He spoke so feelingly and wept so freely that the passengers believed his story and pitied and tried to comfort him. Then the ronin said to the boatman, We ought by rights to report this matter to the authorities, but as I am pressed for time and the business might bring trouble on yourselves as well, perhaps we had better hush it up for the present. And I will at once go on to Kyoto and tell my cousin's patron, besides writing home about it. What think you, gentlemen, added he, turning to the other travelers. They, of course, were only too glad to avoid any hindrance to their onward journey, and all with one voice agreed to what the ronin had proposed, and so the matter was settled. When, at length, they reached the shore, they left the boat, and every man went his way. But the ronin, overjoyed in his heart, took the wandering priest's luggage, and, putting it with his own, pursued his journey to Kyoto. On reaching the capital, the ronin changed his name from Shume to Tokubei, and, giving up his position as a samurai, turned merchant and traded with the dead man's money. Fortune favoring his speculations, he began to amass great wealth and lived at his ease, denying himself nothing, and in the course of time he married a wife who bore him a child. 
Thus the days and months wore on, till one fine summer's night, some three years after the priest's death, Tokubei stepped out onto the veranda of his house to enjoy the cool air and the beauty of the moonlight. Feeling dull and lonely, he began musing over all kinds of things, when on a sudden the deed of murder and theft done so long ago vividly recurred to his memory, and he thought to himself, here am I, grown rich, and that on the money I wantonly stole. Since then, all has gone well with me, yet had I not been poor, I had never turned assassin nor thief. Woe betide me, what a pity it was. And he was revolving the matter in his mind, a feeling of remorse came over him, in spite of all he could do. While his conscience thus smote him, he suddenly, to his utter amazement, beheld the faint outline of a man standing near a fir tree in the garden. On looking more attentively, he perceived that the man's whole body was thin and worn and the eyes sunken and dim, and in the poor ghost that was before him, he recognized the very priest whom he had thrown into the sea at Kuana. Chilled with horror, he looked again and saw that the priest was smiling in scorn. He would have fled into the house, but the ghost stretched forth its withered arm, and clutching the back of his neck, scowled at him with a vindictive glare and a hideous ghastliness of mien, so unspeakably awful that any ordinary man would have swooned with fear. But Tokubei, tradesman though he was, had once been a soldier, and was not easily matched for daring. So he shook off the ghost, and, leaping into the room for his dirk, laid about him boldly enough. But strike as he would, the spirit fading into the air eluded his blows and suddenly reappeared only to vanish again. And from that time forth, Tokube knew no rest and was haunted night and day. At length, undone by such ceaseless vexation, Tokube fell ill and kept muttering, Oh, misery, misery, the wandering priest is coming to torture me. Hearing his moans and the disturbance he made, the people in the house fancied he was mad and called a physician who prescribed for him, but neither pill nor potion could cure Tokubei, whose strange frenzy soon became the talk of the whole neighborhood. Now it chanced that the story reached the ears of a certain wandering priest who lodged in the next street. When he heard the particulars, this priest gravely shook his head as though he knew all about it and sent a friend to Tokubei's house to say that a wandering priest dwelling hard by had heard of his illness and, were it at never so grievous, would undertake to heal it by means of his prayers. And Tokubei's wife, driven half wild by her husband's sickness, lost not a moment in sending for the priest and taking him to the sick man's room. But no sooner did Tokubei see the priest than he yelled out, Help, help, here's the wandering priest come to torment me again. Forgive, forgive. And hiding his head under the coverlet, he lay quivering all over. Then the priest turned all present out of the room and put his mouth to a frightened man's ear and whispered, Three years ago, at the Kuana Ferry, you flung me into the water, and well you remember it. But Tokubei was speechless. He could only quake with fear. Happily, continued the priest, I had learned to swim and to dive as a boy, so I reached the shore and, after wandering through many provinces, succeeded in setting up a bronze figure to Buddha, thus fulfilling the wish of my heart. On my journey homewards, I took a lodging in the next street and there heard of your marvelous ailment. Thinking I could divine its cause, I came to see you, and am glad to find I was not mistaken. You have done a hateful deed. But am I not a priest? And have I not forsaken the things of this world? And would it not ill become me to bear malice? Repent, therefore, and abandon your evil ways. To see you do so, I should esteem the height of happiness. Be of good cheer now, and look me in the face, and you will see that I am really a living man, and no vengeful goblin come to torment you. Seeing he had no ghost to deal with, and overwhelmed by the priest's kindness, Tokubei burst into tears and answered, Indeed, indeed, I don't know what to say. In a fit of madness I was tempted to kill and rob you. Fortune befriended me ever after, but the richer I grew, the more keenly I felt how wicked I had been, and the more I foresaw that my victim's vengeance would some day overtake me. Haunted by this thought, I lost my nerve till one night I beheld your spirit, and from that time forth fell ill. 
but how you managed to escape and are still alive is more than I can understand. A guilty man, said the priest with a smile, shudders at the rustling of the wind or the chattering of a stork's beak. A murderer's conscience preys upon his mind till he sees what is not. Poverty drives a man to crimes he repents of in his wealth. How true is the doctrine of Moshi, and that the heart of man, pure by nature, is corrupted by circumstances. Thus he held forth, and Tokubei, who had long since repented of his crime, implored forgiveness, and gave him a large sum of money, saying, Half of this is the amount I stole from you three years since, the other half I entreat you to accept as interest or as a gift. The priest at first refused the money, but Tokubei insisted on his accepting it, and did all he could to detain him, but in vain, for the priest went his way and bestowed the money on the poor and needy. As for Tokubei himself, he soon shook off his disorder, and thenceforward lived at peace with all men, revered both at home and abroad, and ever intent on good and charitable deeds. End of section 29「Section 30 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Bishop. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Section 30. Concerning Certain Superstitions. Cats, foxes and badgers are regarded with superstitious awe by the Japanese, who attribute to them the power of assuming the human shape in order to bewitch mankind. Like the fairies of our western tales, however, they work for good as well as evil ends. To do them a good turn is to secure powerful allies, but woe betide him who injures them. He and his will assuredly suffer for it. Cats and foxes seem to have been looked upon as uncanny beasts all the world over but it is new to me that badgers should have a place in fairyland. The island of Shikoku, the southernmost of the great Japanese islands, appears to be the part of the country in which the badger is regarded with the greatest veneration. Among the many tricks which he plays upon the human race is one of which I have a clever representation carved in ivory. Lying in wait in lonely places after dusk, the badger watches for benighted wayfarers. Should one appear, the beast, drawing a long breath, distends his belly and drums delicately upon it with his clenched fist, producing such entrancing tones that the traveller cannot resist turning aside to follow the sound, which, will o' the wisp like, recedes as he advances, until it lures him on to his destruction. Love is, however, the most powerful engine which the cat, the fox, and the badger alike put forth for the ruin of man. No German poet ever imagined a more captivating water-nymph than the fair virgins by whom the knight of Japanese romance is assailed. The true hero recognizes and slays the beast. The weaker mortal yields and perishes. The Japanese storybooks abound with tales about the pranks of these creatures, which, like ghosts, even play a part in the histories of ancient and noble families. I have collected a few of these, and now beg a hearing for a distinguished and two-tailed connection of Puss in Boots and the Chat Blanche. End of section 30. Recording by Peter Bishop. Section 31 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephanie Lee Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale Section 31 The Vampire Cat of Nabashima There is a tradition in the Nabashima family that many years ago the Prince of Heitzen was bewitched and cursed by a cat that had been kept by one of his retainers. This prince had in his house a lady of rare beauty, called Otoyo, Amongst all his ladies she was a favorite, and there was none who could rival her charms and accomplishments. One day the prince went out into the garden with Otoyo, and remained enjoying the fragrance of the flowers until sunset, when they returned to the palace, never noticing that they were being followed by a large cat. Having parted with her lord, Otoyo retired to her own room and went to bed. At midnight she awoke with a start, and became aware of a huge cat that crouched watching her and when she cried out the beast sprang on her, and, fixing its cruel teeth in her delicate throat, throttled her to death. 
what a piteous end for so fair a dame the darling of her prince's heart to die suddenly bitten to death by a cat then the cat having scratched out a grave under the veranda buried the corpse of otoyo and assuming her form began to bewitch the prince but my lord the prince knew nothing of all this and little thought that the beautiful creature who caressed and followed him was an impish and foul beast that had slain his mistress and assumed her shape in order to drain out his life's blood day by day as time went on the prince's strength dwindled away the colour of his face was changed and became pale and livid and he was as a man suffering from a deadly sickness seeing this his counsellors and his wife became greatly alarmed so they summoned the physicians who prescribed various remedies for him but the more medicine he took the more serious did his illness appear and no treatment was of any avail but most of all did he suffer in the night-time when his sleep would be troubled and disturbed by hideous dreams in consequence of this his counsellors nightly appointed a hundred of his retainers to sit up and watch over him but strange to say towards ten o'clock on the very first night that the watch was set the guard were seized with a sudden and unaccountable drowsiness which they could not resist until one by one every man had fallen asleep then the false otoyo came in and harassed the prince until morning the following night the same thing occurred and the prince was subjected to the imp's tyranny while his guards slept helplessly around him night after night this was repeated until at last three of the prince's counsellors determined themselves to sit up on guard and see whether they could overcome this mysterious drowsiness but they fared no better than the others and by ten o'clock were fast asleep the next day the three counsellors held a solemn conclave and their chief one isahaya butzen said this is a marvellous thing that a guard of a hundred men should thus be overcome by sleep of a surety the spell that is upon my lord and upon his guard must be the work of witchcraft now as all our efforts are of no avail let us seek out ruiten the chief priest of the temple called miyo in and beseech him to put up prayers for the recovery of my lord and the other counsellors approving what isahaya butzen had said they went to the priest ruiten and engaged him to recite litanies that the prince might be restored to health so it came to pass that ruiten the chief priest of miyo in offered up prayers nightly for the prince one night at the ninth hour midnight when he had finished his religious exercises and was preparing to lie down to sleep he fancied that he heard a noise outside in the garden as if someone were washing himself at the well deeming this passing strange he looked down from the window and there in the moonlight he saw a handsome young soldier some twenty-four years of age washing himself who when he had finished cleaning himself and had put on his clothes stood before the figure of buddha and prayed fervently for the recovery of my lord the prince ruiten looked on with admiration and the young man when he had made an end of his prayer was going away but the priest stopped him calling out to him sir i pray you to tarry a little i have something to say to you at your reverence's service what may you please to want pray be so good as to step up here and have a little talk by your reverence's leave and with this he went upstairs then ruiten said sir i cannot conceal my admiration that you being so young a man should have so loyal a spirit i am ruiten the chief priest of this temple who am engaged in praying for the recovery of my lord pray what is your name my name sir is ito soda and i am serving in the infantry of nabashima since my lord has been sick my one desire has been to assist in nursing him but being only a simple soldier i am not of sufficient rank to come into his presence so i have no resource but to pray to the gods of the country and to buddha that my lord may regain his health when ruiten heard this he shed tears in admiration of the fidelity of ito soda and said your purpose is indeed a good one but what a strange sickness this is that my lord is afflicted with every night he suffers from horrible dreams and the retainers who sit up with him are all seized with a mysterious sleep so that no one can keep awake it is very wonderful yes replied soda after a moment's reflection this certainly must be witchcraft if i could but obtain leave to sit up one night with the prince i would fain see whether i could not resist this drowsiness and detect the goblin at last the priest said i am in relations of friendship with isahaya butzen the chief counsellor of the prince I will speak to him of you and of your loyalty, and will intercede with him that you may attain your wish. Indeed, sir, I am most thankful. I am not prompted by any vain thought of self-advancement, should I succeed. All I wish for is the recovery of my lord. I commend myself to your kind favor. Well, then, tomorrow night I will take you with me to the counselor's house. 
Thank you, sir, and farewell. And so they parted. On the following evening, Ito Soda returned to the temple Mio In, and having found Rui Ten, accompanied him to the house of Isahaya Butsen. Then the priest, leaving Soda outside, went in to converse with the counsellor and inquire after the prince's health. And pray, sir, how is my lord? Is he in any better condition since I have been offering up prayers for him? Indeed, no. His illness is very severe. We are certain that he must be the victim of some foul sorcery. But as there are no means of keeping a guard awake after ten o'clock, we cannot catch a sight of the goblin, so we are in the greatest trouble. I feel deeply for you. It must be most distressing. However, I have something to tell you. I think that I have found a man who will detect the goblin, and I have brought him with me. Indeed, who is the man? Well, he is one of my lord's foot soldiers, named Ito Soda, a faithful fellow, and I trust that you will grant his request to be permitted to sit up with my lord. Certainly. It is wonderful to find so much loyalty and zeal in a common soldier, replied Isahaya Butsen, after a moment's reflection. Still, it is impossible to allow a man of such low rank to perform the office of watching over my lord. It is true that he is but a common soldier, urged the priest, but why not raise his rank in consideration of his fidelity, and then let him mount guard? It would be time enough to promote him after my lord's recovery. But come, let me see this Ito Soda, that I may know what manner of man he is. If he pleases me, I will consult with the other counsellors, and perhaps we may grant his request. I will bring him in forthwith, replied Ruten, who thereupon went out to fetch the young man. When he returned, the priest presented Ito Soda to the counsellor, who looked at him attentively, and, being pleased with his comely and gentle appearance, said, So I hear that you are anxious to be permitted to mount guard in my lord's room at night. Well, I must consult with the other counsellors, and we will see what can be done for you. When the young soldier heard this he was greatly elated, and took his leave, after warmly thanking Buiten, who had helped him to gain his object. The next day the counsellors held a meeting, and sent for Ito Soda and told him that he might keep watch with the other retainers that very night. So he went his way in high spirits, and at nightfall he made all his preparations, took his place among the hundred gentlemen who were on duty in the prince's bedroom. Now the prince slept in the centre of the room, and the hundred guards around him sat keeping themselves awake with entertaining conversation and pleasant conceits. But as ten o'clock approached, they began to doze off as they sat, and in spite of all their endeavours to keep one another awake, by degrees they all fell asleep. Ito Soda all this while felt an irresistible desire to sleep creeping over him, and though he tried by all sorts of ways to rouse himself, he saw that there was no help for it, but by resorting to an extreme measure, for which he had already made his preparations. Drawing out a piece of oil paper which he had brought with him, and spreading it over the mats, he sat down upon it. Then he took the small knife which he carried in the sheath of his dirk, and stuck it into his own thigh. For a while the pain of the wound kept him awake, but as the slumber by which he was assailed was the work of sorcery, little by little he became drowsy again. Then he twisted the knife round and round in his thigh, so that the pain became very violent. He was proof against the feeling of sleepiness, and kept a faithful watch. Now the oil paper which he had spread under his legs was in order to prevent the blood, which might spurt from his wound, from defiling the mats. So Ito Soda remained awake but the rest of the guard slept, and as he watched, suddenly the sliding doors of the prince's room were drawn open, and he saw a figure coming in stealthily, and, as it drew nearer, the form was that of a marvellously beautiful woman, some twenty-three years of age. Cautiously she looked around her, and when she saw that all the guard were asleep, she smiled an ominous smile, and was going up to the prince's bedside when she perceived that in one corner of the room there was a man yet awake, this seemed to startle her, but she went up to Soda and said, I am not used to seeing you here. Who are you? My name is Ito Soda, and this is the first night that I have been on guard. A troublesome office, truly. Why, here are all the rest of the guard asleep. How is it that you alone are awake? You are a trusty watchman. There is nothing to boast about. I must sleep myself, fast and sound. What is that wound on your knee? It is all red with blood. Oh, I felt very sleepy, so I stuck my knife into my thigh, and the pain of it has kept me awake. What wondrous loyalty, said the lady. Is it not the duty of a retainer to lay down his life for his master? Is such a scratch as this worth thinking about? Then the lady went up to the sleeping prince and said, How fares it with my lord tonight? 
but the prince worn out with sickness made no reply but soda was watching her eagerly and guessed that it was otoyo and made up his mind that if she attempted to harass the prince he would kill her on the spot the goblin however which in the form of otoyo had been tormenting the prince every night and had come again that night for no other purpose was defeated by the watchfulness of ito soda for whenever she drew near to the sick man thinking to put her spells upon him she would turn and look behind her and there she saw ito soda glaring at her so she had no help for it but to go away again and leave the prince undisturbed at last the day broke and the other officers when they awoke and opened their eyes saw that ito soda had kept awake by stabbing himself in the thigh and they were greatly ashamed and went home crestfallen that morning ito soda went to the house of isahaya butsen and told him all that had occurred the previous night the counsellors were all loud in their praises of ito soda's behaviour and ordered him to keep watch again that night at the same hour the false otoyo came and looked all round the room and all the guard were asleep excepting ito soda who was wide awake and so being again frustrated she returned to her own apartments now as since soda had been on guard the prince had passed quiet nights his sickness began to get better and there was great joy in the palace and soda was promoted and rewarded with an estate in the meanwhile otoyo seeing that her nightly visits bore no fruits kept away and from that time forth the night guard were no longer subject to fits of drowsiness this coincidence struck soda as very strange so he went to isahaya butsen and told them that of a certainty this otoyo was no other than a goblin isahaya butsen reflected for a while and said well then how shall we kill the foul thing i will go to the creature's room as if nothing were the matter and try to kill her but in case she should try to escape i will beg you to order eight men to stop outside and lie and wait for her having agreed upon this plan soda went at nightfall to otoyo's apartment pretending to have been sent with a message from the prince when she saw him arrive she said what message have you brought me from my lord oh nothing in particular be so kind as to look at this letter and as he spoke he drew near to her and suddenly drawing his dirk cut at her but the goblin springing back seized a halberd and glaring fiercely at soda said how dare you behave like this to one of your lord's ladies i will have you dismissed and she tried to strike soda with the halberd but soda fought desperately with his dirk and the goblin seeing that she was no match for him threw away the halberd and from a beautiful woman became suddenly transformed into a cat which springing up the sides of the room jumped on to the roof isahaya butsen and his eight men who were watching outside shot at the cat but missed it and the beast made good its escape so the cat fled to the mountains and did much mischief among the surrounding people until at last the prince of heitsen ordered a great hunt and the beast was killed but the prince recovered from his sickness and ito soda was richly rewarded end of section thirty one Section 32 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Bishop. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Section 32 The Story of the Faithful Cat. About sixty years ago, in the summer time, a man went to pay a visit to a certain house at Osaka and, in the course of conversation, said, I have eaten some very extraordinary cakes today, and on being asked what he meant, he told the following story. I received the cakes from the relatives of a family who were celebrating the hundredth anniversary of the death of a cat that had belonged to their ancestors. When I asked the history of the affair, I was told that, in former days, a young girl of the family when she was about sixteen years old, used always to be followed around by a tomcat who was reared in the house, so much so that the two were never separated for an instant. When her father perceived this, he was very angry, thinking that the tomcat, forgetting the kindness with which he had been treated for years in the house, had fallen in love with his daughter and intended to cast a spell upon her. So he determined that he must kill the beast. As he was planning this in secret, the cat overheard him, and that night went to his pillow, and, assuming a human voice, said to him, You suspect me of being in love with your daughter, and although you might well be justified in so thinking, your suspicions are groundless. The fact is this, there is a very large old rat who has been living for many years in your granary. 
Now it is this old rat who is in love with my young mistress, and this is why I dare not leave her side for a moment, for fear the old rat should carry her off. Therefore I pray you to dispel your suspicions. But as I, by myself, am no match for the rat, there is a famous cat named Bucci at the house of Mr. So-and-so at Ajikawa. If you will borrow that cat, we will soon make an end of the old rat. When the father awoke from his dream, he thought it so wonderful that he told the whole household of it, and the following day he got up very early and went off to Ajikawa to inquire for the house which the cat had indicated, and had no difficulty in finding it. So he called upon the master of the house and told him what his own cat had said and how he wished to borrow the cat Bucci for a little while. That's a very easy matter to settle, said the other. Pray take him with you at once, and accordingly the father went home with the cat Bucci in charge. That night he put the two cats into the granary, and after a little while a frightful clatter was heard, and then all was still again. So the people in the house opened the door and crowded out to see what had happened, and there they beheld the two cats and the rat all locked together and panting for breath, so they cut the throat of the rat, which was as big as either of the cats. Then they attended to the two cats, but although they gave them ginseng and other restoratives, they both got weaker and weaker until at last they died. So the rat was thrown into the river, but the two cats were buried with all honours in a neighbouring temple. End of section 32. Recording by Peter Bishop. Section 33 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Section 33. How a man was bewitched and had his head shaved by the foxes. In the village of Iwala, in the province of Shinshiyu, there dwelt a family which had acquired considerable wealth in the wine trade. On some auspicious occasion it happened that a number of guests were gathered together at their house, feasting on wine and fish, and as the wine cup went round, the conversation turned upon foxes. Among the guests was a certain carpenter, Tokutaru by name, a man about thirty years of age, of a stubborn and obstinate turn, who said, "'Well, sirs, you have been talking for some time of men being bewitched by foxes. Surely you must be under their influence yourselves to say such things. How on earth can foxes have such power over men? At any rate, men must be great fools to be so deluded. Let's have no more of this nonsense.' Upon this a man who was sitting by him answered, "'Tokutaro little knows what goes on in the world.' or he would not speak so. How many myriads of men are there who have been bewitched by foxes? Why, there have been at least twenty or thirty men tricked by the brutes on the Maki Moor alone. It's hard to disprove facts that have happened before our eyes. You're no better than a pack of born idiots, said Tokutaro. I will engage to go out to the Maki Moor this very night and prove it. There is not a fox in all Japan that can make a fool of Tokutaro. Thus he spoke in his pride. But the others were all angry with him for boasting, and said, If you return without anything having happened, we will pay for five measures of wine, and a thousand copper cash worth of fish. And if you are bewitched, you shall do as much for us. Tokutaro took the bet, and at nightfall set forth for the Maki Moor by himself. As he neared the moor, he saw before him a small bamboo grove, into which a fox ran, and it instantly occurred to him that the foxes of the moor would try to bewitch him. As he was yet looking, he suddenly saw the daughter of the headman of the village of Upa Rikane, who was married to the headman of the village of Maki. "'Pray, where are you going to, Master Tokutaro?' said she. "'I am going to the village hard by.' "'Then as you will have to pass my native place, if you will allow me, I will accompany you so far.' Tokutaro thought this very odd and made up his mind that it was a fox trying to make a fool of him. He accordingly determined to turn the tables on the fox, and answered, "'It is a long time since I have had the pleasure of seeing you, and it seems that your house is on my road. I shall be glad to escort you so far.' With this he walked behind her, thinking he should certainly see the end of a fox's tail peeping out. But look as he might, there was nothing to be seen. At last they came to the village of Upper Horakane, 
and when they reached the cottage of the girl's father, the family all came out, surprised to see her. "'Oh, dear, oh, dear, here is our daughter come. I hope there is nothing the matter.' And so they went on for some time, asking a string of questions. In the meanwhile, Tokutaro went round to the kitchen door at the back of the house, and beckoning out the master of the house, said, "'The girl who has come with me is not really your daughter. As I was going to the Maki Moor, when I arrived at the bamboo grove, a fox jumped up in front of me, and when it had dashed into the grove, it immediately took the shape of your daughter, and offered to accompany me to the village. So I pretended to be taken in by the brute, and came with it so far.' On hearing this, the master of the house put his head on one side, and mused a while. Then, calling his wife, he repeated the story to her in a whisper. But she flew into a great rage with Tokutaro, and said, "'This is a pretty way of insulting people's daughters. The girl is our daughter, and there's no mistake about it. How dare you invent such lies?' "'Well,' said Tokutaro, "'you are quite right to say so, but still there is no doubt that this is a case of witchcraft.' Seeing how obstinately he held to his opinion, the old folks were sorely perplexed, and said, "'What do you think of doing?' "'Pray leave the matter to me. I'll soon strip the false skin off, and show the beast to you in its true colors. Do, you two go into the store-closet, and wait there.' With this he went into the kitchen, and seizing the girl by the back of the neck, forced her down by the hearth. "'Oh, Master Tukutaro, what means this brutal violence? Mother, father, help!' So the girl cried and screamed, but Tokutaro only laughed and said, "'So you thought to bewitch me, did you? From the moment you jumped into the wood, I was on the lookout for you to play me some trick. I'll soon make you show me what you really are.' And as he said this, he twisted her two hands behind her back, and trod upon her, and tortured her. But she only wept and cried, "'Oh, it hurts, it hurts!' "'If this is not enough to make you show your true form, I'll roast you to death.' and he piled firewood on the hearth, and tucking up her dress, scorched her severely. Oh, oh, this is more than I can bear. And with this she expired. The two old people then came running in from the rear of the house, and pushing aside Tokutaro, folded their daughter in their arms, and put their hands to her mouth to feel whether she still breathed. But life was extinct, and not the sign of a fox's tail was to be seen about her. Then they seized Tokutaro by the collar and cried, "'On pretense that our true daughter was a fox, you have roasted her to death. Murderer! Here, you there, bring ropes and cords, and secure this Tokutaro.' So the servants obeyed, and several of them seized Tokutaro, and bound him to a pillar, where the master of the house, turning to Tokutaro, said, "'You have murdered our daughter before our very eyes. I shall report the matter to the lord of the manor, and you will assuredly pay for this with your head.' Be prepared for the worst. And as he said this, glaring fiercely at Tokutaro, they carried the corpse of his daughter into the store-closet, as they were sending to make the matter known in the village of Maki, and taking other measures. Who should come up but the priest of the temple called Enlakuji, in the village of Awala, with an acolyte and a servant who called out in a loud voice from the front door, is all well with the honourable master of this house. I have been to say prayers to-day in a neighbouring village, and on my way back I could not pass the door without at least inquiring after your welfare. If you are at home, I would fain pay my respects to you. As he spoke thus in a loud voice, he was heard from the back of the house, and the master got up and went out, and after the usual compliments on meeting had been exchanged, said, I thought to have the honour of inviting you to step inside this evening. But really we are all in the greatest trouble, and I must beg you to excuse my impoliteness. Indeed, pray what be the matter? replied the priest, and when the master of the house had told the whole story, from beginning to end, he was thunderstruck, and said, Truly this must be a terrible distress to you. Then the priest looked on one side, and saw Tokutaro bound, and exclaimed, Is not that Tokutaro that I see there? Oh, your reverence, replied Tokutaro piteously, it was this, that, and the other, and I took it into my head that the young lady was a fox, and so I killed her. But I pray your reverence to intercede for me, and save my life. And as he spoke, the tears started from his eyes. To be sure, said the priest, you may well be well yourself. However, if I save your life, will you consent to become my disciple, and enter the priesthood? Oh, 
only save my life, and I'll become your disciple with all my heart. When the priest heard this, he called out the parents, and said to them, It would seem that though I am but a foolish old priest, my coming here to-day has been unusually well-timed. I have a request to make of you. Your putting Tokutaro to death won't bring your daughter to life again. I have heard his story, and there certainly was no malice prepense on his part to kill your daughter. What he did, he did thinking to do a service to your family, and it would surely be better to hush the matter up. He wishes, moreover, to give himself over to me, and to become my disciple. It is as you say, replied the father and mother, speaking together. Revenge will not recall our daughter. Please dispel our grief by shaving his head and making a priest of him on the spot. I'll shave him at once before your eyes, answered the priest, who immediately caused the cords which bound Tokutaro to be untied, and putting on his priest's scarf, made him join his hands together in a posture of prayer. Then the reverend man stood up behind him, razor in hand, and intoning a hymn, gave two or three strokes of the razor, which he then handed to his acolyte, who made a clean shave of Tokutaro's hair. When the latter had finished his obeisance to the priest, and the ceremony was over, there was a loud burst of laughter. And at the same moment the day broke, and Tokutaro found himself alone in the middle of a large moor. At first, in his surprise, he thought that it was all a dream, and was much annoyed at having been tricked by the foxes. He then passed his hand over his head, and found that he was shaved quite bald. There was nothing for it but to get up, wrap a handkerchief round his head, and go back to the place where his friends were assembled. "'Hello, Tokutaro, so you've come back. Well, how about the foxes?' "'Really, gentlemen,' replied he, bowing, "'I am quite ashamed to appear before you.' Then he told them the whole story, and when he had finished, pulled off the kerchief and showed his bald pate. "'What a capital joke!' shouted his listeners, and amid roars of laughter, claimed the bet of fish and wine. It was duly paid, but Tokutaro never allowed his hair to grow again, and renounced the world, and became a priest under the name of Sainen. There are a great many stories told of men being shaved by the foxes, but this story came under the personal observation of Mr. Shominsai, a teacher of the city of Yedo, during a holiday trip which he took to the country where the event occurred, and I, the author of Kanzanyawa, the book from which the story is taken, have recorded it in the very self-same words in which he told it to me. End of section 33section 34 of tales of old japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by caroline driggs tales of old japan by lord reedsdale section 34 the grateful foxes one fine spring day two friends went out to a moor to gather fern attended by a boy with a bottle of wine and a box of provisions. As they were straying about, they saw at the foot of a hill a fox that had brought out its cub to play, and whilst they looked on, struck by the strangeness of the sight, three children came up from a neighbouring village with baskets in their hands, on the same errand as themselves. As soon as the children saw the foxes, they picked up a bamboo stick and took the creatures stealthily in the rear, and when the old foxes took to flight, they surrounded them and beat them with the stick, so that they ran away as fast as their legs could carry them. But two of the boys held down the cub, and seizing it by the scruff of the neck, went off in high glee. The two friends were looking on all the while, and one of them, raising his voice, shouted out, "'Hello, you boys! What are you doing with that fox?' The eldest of the boys replied, "'We're going to take him home and sell him to a young man in our village.' He'll buy him, and then he'll boil him in a pot and eat him. Well, replied the other, after considering the matter attentively, I suppose it's all the same to you whom you sell him to. You'd better let me have him. Oh, but the young man from our village promised us a good round sum if we could find a fox, and got us to come out to the hills and catch one, and so we can't sell him to you at any price. Well, I suppose it cannot be helped then. 
but how much would the young man give you for the cub oh he'll give us three hundred cash at least then i'll give you half a boo and so you'll gain five hundred cash by the transaction oh we'll sell him for that sir how shall we hand him over to you just tie him up here said the other and so he made fast the cub round the neck with the string of the napkin in which the luncheon box was wrapped and gave half a boo to the three boys who ran away delighted the man's friend upon this said to him well you certainly have got queer tastes what on earth are you going to keep the fox for how very unkind of you to speak of my tastes like that if we had not interfered just now the fox's cub would have lost its life if we had not seen the affair there would have been no help for it how could i stand by and see a life taken it was but a little spent only half a boo to save the cub but had it cost a fortune i should not have grudged it i thought you were intimate enough with me to know my heart but to-day you have accused me of being eccentric and i see how mistaken i have been in you however our friendship shall cease from this day forth and when he had said this with a great deal of firmness the other retiring backwards and bowing with his hands on his knees replied indeed indeed i am filled with admiration at the goodness of your heart when i hear you speak thus i feel more than ever how great is the love i bear you i thought that you might wish to use the cub as a sort of decoy to lead the old ones to you that you might pray them to bring prosperity and virtue to your house when i called you eccentric just now i was but trying your heart because i had some suspicions of you and now i am truly ashamed of myself and as he spoke still bowing the other replied really was that indeed your thought then i pray you to forgive me for my violent language when the two friends had thus become reconciled they examined the cub and saw that it had a slight wound in its foot and could not walk and while they were thinking what they should do they spied out the herb called dr nakase which was just sprouting so they rolled up a little of it in their fingers and applied it to the part then they pulled out some boiled rice from their luncheon box and offered it to the cub but it showed no sign of wanting to eat so they stroked it gently on the back and petted it and as the pain of the wound seemed to have subsided they were admiring the properties of the herb when opposite to them they saw the old foxes sitting watching them by the side of some stacks of rice straw look there the old foxes have come back out of fear for their cub's safety come we will set it free and with these words they untied the string round the cub's neck and turned its head towards the spot where the old foxes sat and as the wounded foot was no longer painful with one bound it dashed to its parents side and licked them all over for joy while they seemed to bow their thanks looking towards the two friends so with peace in their hearts the latter went off to another place and choosing a pretty spot produced the wine bottle and ate their noonday meal and after a pleasant day they returned to their homes and became firmer friends than ever now the man who had rescued the fox's cub was a tradesman in good circumstances he had three or four agents and two maid-servants besides men-servants and altogether he lived in a liberal manner he was married and this union had brought him one son who had reached his tenth year but had been attacked by a strange disease which defied all the physician's skill and drugs at last a famous physician prescribed the liver taken from a live fox which as he said would certainly effect a cure if that were not forthcoming the most expensive medicine in the world would not restore the boy to health when the parents heard this they were at their wits end however they told the state of the case to a man who lived on the mountains even though our child should die for it they said we will not ourselves deprive other creatures of their lives but you who live among the hills are sure to hear when your neighbours go out fox hunting we don't care what price we might have to pay for a fox's liver pray buy one for us at any expense so they pressed him to exert himself on their behalf and he having promised faithfully to execute the commission went his way in the night of the following day there came a messenger who announced himself as coming from the person who had undertaken to procure the fox's liver so the master of the house went out to see him i have come from mr so-and-so last night the fox's liver that you required fell into his hands so he sent me to bring it to you with these words the messenger produced a small jar adding 
In a few days he will let you know the price. When he had delivered his message, the master of the house was greatly pleased and said, Indeed, I am deeply grateful for this kindness which will save my son's life. Then the good wife came out and received the jar with every mark of politeness. We must make a present to the messenger. Indeed, sir, I've already been paid for my trouble. Well, at any rate, you must stop the night here. Thank you, sir. I have a relation in the next village whom I have not seen for a long while, and I will pass the night with him. And so he took his leave and went away. The parents lost no time in sending to let the physician know that they had procured the fox's liver. The next day the doctor came and compounded a medicine for the patient, which at once produced a good effect, and there was no little joy in the household. As luck would have it, three days after this, the man whom they had commissioned to buy the fox's liver came to the house. So the good wife hurried out to meet him and welcome him. How quickly you fulfilled our wishes, and how kind of you to send at once. The doctor prepared the medicine, and now our boy can get up and walk about the room, and it's all owing to your goodness. Wait a bit, cried the guest, who did not know what to make of the joy of the two parents. The commission with which you entrusted me about the fox's liver turned out to be a matter of impossibility. So I came today to make my excuses, and now I really can't understand what you are so grateful to me for. We are thanking you, sir, replied the master of the house, bowing with his hands on the ground, for the fox's liver which we asked you to procure for us. I am really perfectly unaware of having sent you a fox's liver. There must be some mistake here. Pray inquire carefully into the matter. Well, this is very strange. Four nights ago, a man of some five or six and thirty years of age came with a verbal message from you to the effect that you had sent him with a fox's liver, which you had just procured, and said that he would come and tell us the price another day. When we asked him to spend the night here, he answered that he would lodge with a relation in the next village and went away. The visitor was more and more lost in amazement, and leaning his head on one side in deep thought, confessed that he could make nothing of it. As for the husband and wife, they felt quite out of countenance at having thanked a man so warmly for favours of which he denied all knowledge and so the visitor took his leave and went home. That night there appeared at the pillow of the master of the house a woman of about one or two and thirty years of age, who said, I am the fox that lives at such and such a mountain. Last spring, when I was taking out my cub to play, it was carried off by some boys and only saved by your goodness. The desire to requite this kindness pierced me to the quick. At last, when calamity attacked your house, I thought that I might be of use to you. Your son's illness could not be cured without a liver taken from a live fox. So to repay your kindness, I killed my cub and took out its liver. Then its sire, disguising himself as a messenger, brought it to your house. And as she spoke, the fox shed tears, and the master of the house, wishing to thank her, moved in bed, upon which his wife awoke and asked him what was the matter. But he too, to her great astonishment, was biting the pillow and weeping bitterly. Why are you weeping thus? asked she. At last he sat up in bed and said, Last spring, when I was out on a pleasure excursion, I was the means of saving the life of a fox's cub, as I told you at the time. The other day I told Mr. So-and-so that, although my son were to die before my eyes, I would not be the means of killing a fox on purpose but asked him, in case he heard of any hunter killing a fox, to buy it for me. How the foxes came to hear of this, I don't know. But the foxes to whom I had shown kindness killed their own cub and took out the liver. And the old dog fox, disguising himself as a messenger from the person to whom we had confided the commission, came here with it. His mate has just been at my pillow side and told me all about it. Hence it was that, in spite of myself, I was moved to tears. End of section 34。Section 35 of Tales of Old Japan。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephanie Lee. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Redisdale. Section 35. The Badger's Money.
It is a common saying among men that to forget favors received is a part of a bird or a beast. An ungrateful man will be ill spoken of by all the world, and yet even birds and beasts will show gratitude, so that a man who does not requite a favor is worse even than dumb brutes. Is not this a disgrace? Once upon a time, in a hut at a place called Namikata in Hitachi, there lived an old priest famous neither for learning nor wisdom, but bent only on passing his days in prayer and meditation. He had not even a child to wait upon him, but prepared his food with his own hands. Night and morning he recited the prayer Namu Amida Butsu, intent upon that alone. Although the fame of his virtue did not reach far, yet his neighbors respected and revered him, and often brought him food and raiment, and when his roof or his walls fell out of repair, they would mend them for him, so for the things of this world he took no thought. One very cold night, when he little thought any one was outside, he heard a voice calling, Your reverence! Your reverence! So he rose and went out to see who it was, and there he beheld an old badger standing. Any ordinary man would have been greatly alarmed at the apparition, but the priest, being such as he has been described above, showed no sign of fear, but asked the creature its business. Upon this the badger respectfully bent its knees and said, Hitherto, sir, my lair has been in the mountains, and of snow or frost I have taken no heed. But now I am growing old, and this severe cold is more than I can bear. I pray you to let me enter, and warm myself at the fire of your cottage, that I may live through this bitter night. When the priest heard what a helpless state the beast was reduced to, he was filled with pity, and said, That's a very slight matter. Make haste, and come in and warm in yourself. The badger, delighted with so good a reception, went into the hut, and squatting down by the fire began to warm itself, and the priest, with renewed fervor, recited his prayers and struck his bell before the image of Buddha, looking straight before him. After two hours the badger took its leave, with profuse expressions of thanks, and went out, and from that time forth it came every night to the hut. As the badger would collect and bring with it dry branches and dead leaves from the hills for firewood, the priest at last became very friendly with it, and got used to its company so that if ever, as the night wore on, the badger did not arrive, he used to miss it, and wonder why it did not come. When the winter was over, and the springtime came at the end of the second month, the badger gave up its visits, and was no more seen. But, on the return of the winter, the beast resumed its old habit of coming to the hut. When this practice had gone on for ten years, one day the badger said to the priest, Through your reverence's kindness for all these years, I have been able to pass the winter nights in comfort. Your favors are such that during all my life, and even after my death, I must remember them. What can I do to requite them? If there is anything that you wish for, pray tell me. The priest, smiling at this speech, answered, Being such as I am, I have no desire and no wishes. Glad as I am to hear your kind intentions, there is nothing that I can ask you to do for me. You need feel no anxiety on my account. As long as I live, when the winter comes, you shall be welcome here. The badger, on hearing this, could not conceal its admiration of the depth of the old man's benevolence, but having so much to be grateful for, it felt hurt at not being able to requite it. As this subject was often renewed between them, the priest at last, touched by the goodness of the badger's heart, said, Since I have shaven my head, renounced the world, and forsaken the pleasures of this life, I have no desire to gratify, yet I own I should like to possess three rios of gold. Food and raiment I receive by the favor of the villagers, so I take no heed for those things. Were I to die to-morrow, and attain my wish of being born again into the next world, the same kind folk have promised to meet and bury my body. Thus, although I have no other reason to wish for money, still if I had three rios I would offer them up at some holy shrine, that masses and prayers might be said for me, whereby I might enter into salvation. Yet I would not get this money by violent or unlawful means, I only think of what might be if I had it. So you see, since you have expressed such kind feelings towards me, I have told you what is on my mind. When the priest had done speaking, the badger leaned its head on one side with a puzzled and anxious look, so much so that the old man was sorry he had expressed a wish which seemed to give the beast trouble, and tried to retract what he had said. Posthumous honors, after all, are the wish of ordinary men. I, who am a priest, ought not to entertain such thoughts or to want money, so pray pay no attention to what I have said. And the badger, feigning assent to what the priest had impressed upon him, 
returned to the hills as usual. From that time forth the badger came no more to the hut. The priest thought this very strange, but imagined either that the badger stayed away because it did not like to come without the money, or that it had been killed in an attempt to steal it, and he blamed himself for having added to his sins for no purpose, repenting when it was too late. Persuaded, however, that the badger must have been killed, he passed his time in putting up prayers upon prayers for it. After three years had gone by, one night the old man heard a voice near his door calling out, Your reverence! Your reverence! As the voice was like that of the badger, he jumped up as soon as he heard it, and ran out to open the door, and there, sure enough, was the badger. The priest, in great delight, cried out, And so you are safe and sound after all. Why have you been so long without coming here? I have been expecting you anxiously this long while. So the badger came into the hut and said, If the money which you required had been for unlawful purposes, I could easily have procured as much as ever you might have wanted. But when I heard that it was to be offered to a temple for masses for your soul, I thought that, if I were to steal the hidden treasure of some other man, you could not apply to a sacred purpose money which had been obtained at the expense of his sorrow. So I went to the island of Sado, and gathering the sand and earth which had been cast away as worthless by the miners, fused it afresh in the fire, and at this work I spent months and days. As the badger finished speaking, the priest looked at the money which it had produced, and sure enough he saw it was bright and new and clean. So he took the money and received it respectfully, raising it to his head. And so you have had all this toil and labor on account of a foolish speech of mine? I have obtained my heart's desire, and am truly thankful. As he was thanking the badger with great politeness and ceremony, the beast said, In doing this I have but fulfilled my own wish. Still I hope that you will tell this thing to no man. Indeed, replied the priest, I cannot choose but tell the story, for if I keep this money in my poor hut, it will be stolen by thieves. I must either give it to someone to keep for me, or else at once offer it up at the temple, and when I do this, when people see a poor old priest with a sum of money quite unsuited to his station, they will think it very suspicious, and I shall have to tell the tale as it occurred. But as I shall say that the badger that gave me the money has ceased coming to my hut, you need not fear being waylaid but can come as of old and shelter yourself from the cold. To this the badger nodded assent, and as long as the old priest lived, it came and spent the winter nights with him. From this story it is plain that even beasts have a sense of gratitude. In this quality dogs excel all other beasts. Is not the story of the dog of Totoribe Yorutsu written in the annals of Japan? I have heard that many anecdotes of this nature have been collected and printed in a book, which I have not yet seen. But as the facts which I have recorded relate to a badger, they appear to me to be passing strange. End of section 35。section 36 of Tales of Old Japan。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reddesdale. Section 36 The Prince and the Badger. In days of yore, there lived a forefather of the Prince of Tosa who went by the name of Yamanuchi Kazutoyo. At the age of fourteen, this prince was amazingly fond of fishing and would often go down to the river for sport. And it came to pass one day that he had gone thither with but one retainer and had made a great haul, that a violent shower suddenly came on. Now the prince had no raincoat with him, and was in so sorry a plight that he took shelter under a willow tree, and waited for the weather to clear, but the storm showed no signs of abating, and there was no help for it, so he turned to the retainer and said, This rain is not likely to stop for some time, so we had better hurry home. As they trudged homeward, night fell, and it grew very dark and their road lay over a long bank, by the side of which they found a girl, about sixteen years old, weeping bitterly. Struck with wonder, they looked steadfastly at her, and perceived that she was exceedingly comely. While Kazutoyo stood doubting what so strange a sight could portend, his retainer, smitten with the girl's charms, stepped up to her and said, "'Little sister, tell us whose daughter you are, and how it comes that you are out by yourself at night in such a storm of rain.' Surely it is passing strange. 
Sir, replied she, looking up through her tears, I am the daughter of a poor man in the castle town. My mother died when I was seven years old, and my father has now wedded a shrew, who loathes and ill-uses me, and in the midst of my grief he has gone far away on his business, so I was left alone with my stepmother. And this very night she spited and beat me till I could bear it no longer, and was on my way to my aunt's, who dwells in yonder village, when the shower came on. But as I lay waiting for the rain to stop, I was seized with a spasm, to which I am subject, and was in great pain, when I had the good luck to fall in with your worships. As she spoke, the retainer fell deeply in love with her matchless beauty, whilst his lord Kazutoyo, who from the outset had not uttered a word, but stood brooding over the matter, straightway drew his sword and cut off her head. But the retainer stood aghast and cried out, "'Oh, my young lord, what wicked deed is this that you've done? The murder of a man's daughter will bring trouble upon us, for you may rely on the business not ending here.' "'You don't know what you're talking about,' answered Kazutoyo. "'Only don't tell anyone about it, that is all I ask.' And so they went home in silence. As Kazutoyo was very tired, he went to bed, and slept undisturbed by any sense of guilt, for he was brave and fearless. But the retainer grew very uneasy, and went to his young lord's parents, and said, "'I had the honour of attending my young lord out fishing to-day, and we were driven home by the rain. And as we came back by the bank, we descried a little girl with a spasm in her stomach.' and her my young lord straightway slew, and although he has bidden me tell it to no one, I cannot conceal it from my lord and my lady. Kazutoyo's parents were sore amazed, bewailing their son's wickedness, and went at once to his room and woke him. His father shed tears and said, Oh, dastardly cutthroat that you are! How dare you kill another man's daughter without provocation! Such unspeakable villainy is unworthy a samurai's son! know that the duty of every samurai is to keep watch over the country and to protect the people and such is his daily task for sword and dirk are given to men that they may slay rebels and faithfully serve their prince and not that they may go about committing sin and killing the daughters of innocent men whoever is fool enough not to understand this will repeat his misdeed and will assuredly bring shame on his kindred grieved as i am that i should take away the life which i gave you i cannot suffer you to bring dishonour on our house so prepare to meet your fate with these words he drew his sword but kazutoyo without a sign of fear said to his father your anger sir is most just but remember that i have studied the classics and understand the laws of right and wrong and be sure i would never kill another man without good cause the girl whom i slew was certainly no human being but some foul goblin Feeling certain of this, I cut her down. Tomorrow I beg you will send your retainers to look for the corpse, and if it really be that of a human being, I shall give you no further trouble, but shall disembowel myself. Upon this the father sheathed his sword and awaited daybreak. When the morning came, the old prince, in sad distress, bade his retainers lead him to the bank, and there he saw a huge badger with his head cut off, lying dead by the roadside, and the prince was lost in wonder at his son's shrewdness. But the retainer did not know what to make of it, and still had his doubts. The prince, however, returned home, and sending for his son, said to him, "'It's very strange that the creature which appeared to your retainer to be a girl should have seemed to you to be a badger.' "'My lord's wonder is just,' replied Kazutoyo, smiling. "'She appeared as a girl to me as well, but here was a young girl at night, far from any inhabited place. Stranger still was her wondrous beauty.' and strangest of all, that though it was pouring with rain, there was not a sign of wet on her clothes, and when my retainer asked how long she had been there, she said she had been on the bank in pain for some time, so I had no further doubt but that she was a goblin, and I killed her. But what made you think she must be a goblin because her clothes were dry? The beast evidently thought that if she could bewitch us with her beauty, she might get at the fish my retainer was carrying, but she forgot that as it was raining it would not do for her clothes not to be wet so I detected and killed her. When the old prince heard his son speak thus, he was filled with admiration for the youth's sagacity. So, conceiving that Kazutoyo had given reliable proof of wisdom and prudence, he resolved to abdicate, and Kazutoyo was proclaimed Prince of Tosa in his stead. End of section 36「Section 37 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Section 37. Japanese Sermons. Sermons preached here on 8th, 18th, and 28th days of every month. Such was the purport of a placard, which used to tempt me daily as I passed the temple Cho Oji. Having ascertained that neither the preacher nor his congregation would have any objection to my hearing one of these sermons, I made arrangements to attend the service, accompanied by two friends, my artist and a scribe to take notes. We were shown into an apartment adjoining a small chapel, a room opening on to a tastily arranged garden, wealthy in stone lanterns and dwarfed trees. In the portion of the room reserved for the priest stood a high table, covered with a cloth of white and scarlet silk, richly embroidered with flowers and arabesques. Upon this stood a bell, a tray containing the rolls of the sacred books, and a small incense burner of ancient Chinese porcelain. Before the table was a hanging drum, and behind it was one of those high, back-breaking armchairs which adorn every Buddhist temple. In one corner of the space destined for the accommodation of the faithful was a low writing desk, at which sat, or rather squatted, a lay clerk, armed with a huge pair of horn spectacles, through which he glared, goblin-like, at the people, as they came to have their names and the amount of their offerings to the temple registered. These latter must have been small things, for the congregation seemed poor enough. It was principally composed of old women, nuns with bald shiny pates and grotesque faces, a few petty tradesmen, and half a dozen chubby children, perfect little models of decorum and devoutness. One lady there was, indeed, who seemed a little better to do in the world than the rest. She was nicely dressed, and attended by a female servant. She came in with a certain little consequential rustle, and displayed some coquetry, and a very pretty bare foot as she took her place, and, pulling out a dandy little pipe and tobacco pouch, began to smoke. Fireboxes and spittoons, I should mention, were freely handed about, so that half an hour which passed before the sermon began was agreeably spent. In the meanwhile, mass was being celebrated in the main hall of the temple, and the monotonous nasal drone of the plain chant was faintly heard in the distance. So soon as this was over, the lay clerk sat himself down by the hanging drum, and, to its accompaniment, began intoning the prayer, Namu Mio Ho Rengo Kyo, the congregation fervently joining in unison with him. These words, repeated over and over again, are the distinctive prayer of the Buddhist sect of Nichiren, to which the temple Cho Oji is dedicated. They are approximations to Sanskrit sounds, and have no meaning in Japanese, nor do the worshippers in using them know their precise value. Soon the preacher, gorgeous in red and white robes, made his appearance, following an acolyte, who carried the sacred book called Hoke, upon which the sect of Nichiren is founded, on a tray covered with scarlet and gold brocade. Having bowed to the sacred picture which hung over the tokonoma, that portion of the Japanese room which is raised a few inches above the rest of the floor, and which is regarded as the place of honor, his reverence took his seat at the table, and adjusted his robes, then, tying up the muscles of his face into a knot, expressive of utter abstraction, he struck the bell upon the table thrice, burnt a little incense, and read a passage from the sacred book, which he reverently lifted to his head. The congregation joined in chorus, devout but unintelligent, for the word, written in ancient Chinese, is as obscure to the ordinary Japanese worshipper as are the Latin liturgies to a high-capped Norman peasant woman. While his flock wrapped up copper cash in paper and threw them before the table as offerings, the priest next recited a passage alone, and the lay clerk irreverently entered into a loud dispute with one of the congregation, touching some payment or other. The preliminary ceremonies ended, a small, shaven-pated boy brought in a cup of tea, thrice afterwards to be replenished, for his reverence his refreshment, and he, having untied his face, gave a broad grin, cleared his throat, swallowed his tea, and beamed down upon us, as jolly, rosy a priest as ever donned stole or scarf. His discourse, which was delivered in the most familiar and easy manner, was an extempore dissertation on certain passages from the sacred books. Whenever he paused or made a point, the congregation broke in with the cry of Namio, a corruption of the first three words of the prayer cited above, to which they always contrived to give an expression or intonation in harmony with the preacher's meaning. It is a matter of profound satisfaction to me, began his reverence Nichiren, 
smiling blandly at his audience, to see so many gentlemen and ladies gathered together here this day, in the fidelity of their hearts, to do honor to the feast of Kishimojin. Footnote. Kishimojin, a female deity of the Buddhists. End of footnote. Namio, Namio, self-depreciatory from the congregation. I feel certain that your piety cannot fail to find favor with Kishimojin. Kishimojin ever mourns over the tortures of mankind who are dwelling in a house of fire, and she ever earnestly strives to find some means of delivering them. Namio, Namio, grateful and reverential. Notwithstanding this, it is useless your worshipping Kishimojin and professing to believe in her unless you have truth in your hearts, for she will not receive your offerings. Man, from his very birth, is a creature of requirements. He is forever seeking and praying. Both you who listen, and I who preach, have all of us our wants and wishes. If there be any person here who flatters himself that he has no wishes and no wants, let him reflect. Does not everyone wish and pray that heaven and earth may stand forever, that his country and family may prosper, that there may be plenty in the land, and that the people may be healthy and happy? The wishes of men, however, are various and many, and these wishes, numberless as they are, are all known to the gods from the beginning. It is no use praying unless you have truth in your heart. For instance, the prayer, Namu, is a prayer committing your bodies to the care of the gods. If, when you utter it, your hearts are true and single, of a surety, your request will be granted. Now this is not a mere statement made by Nichiren, the holy founder of this sect. It is the sacred teaching of Buddha himself, and may not be doubted. Namio, Namio, with profound conviction. The heart of man is, by nature, upright and true. But there are seven passions. Footnote. The seven passions are joy, anger, sadness, fear, love, hatred, and desire. End footnote. By which it is corrupted. Buddha is alarmed when he sees the fires by which the world is being consumed. These fires are the five lusts of this sinful world, and the five lusts are the desire for fair sights, sweet sounds, fragrant smells, dainty meats, and rich trappings. Man is no sooner endowed with a body than he is possessed by these lusts, which become his very heart, and, it being a law that every man follows the dictates of his heart, in this way the body, the lusts of the flesh, the heart, and the dictates of the heart, blaze up in the consuming fire. Alas, for this miserable world, said the divine Buddha. Namio, Namio, mournful and with much head shaking. There is not so foul thing under heaven as the human body. The body exudes grease, the eyes distill gums, the nose is full of mucus, the mouth of slobbering spittle, nor are these the most impure secretions of the body. What a mistake it is to look upon this impure body as clean and perfect. Unless we listen to the teachings of Buddha, how shall we be washed and purified? Namio, Namio, from an impure and very miserable sinner, under ten years of age. The lot of man is uncertain, and forever running out of the beaten track. Why go to look at the flowers and take delight in their beauty? When you return home, you will see the vanity of your pleasure. Why purchase fleeting joys of loose women? How long do you retain the delicious taste of the dainties you feast upon? Forever wishing to do this, wishing to see that, wishing to eat rare dishes, wishing to wear fine clothes, you pass a lifetime in fanning the flames which consume you. What terrible matter for thought is this? In the poems of the priest Saigio, it is written, Verily I have been familiar with the flowers, yet are they withered and scattered, and we are parted. How sad! the beauty of the convolvulus, how bright it is, and yet in one short morning it closes its petals and fades. In the book, called Rinjo Bosatsu, footnote, one of the Buddhist classics, end footnote, we are told how a certain king once went to take his pleasure in his garden and gladden his eyes with the beauty of his flowers. After a while he fell asleep, and as he slumbered, the women of his train began pulling the flowers to pieces, when the king awoke, of all the glory of his flowers there remained but a few torn and faded petals. Seeing this, the king said, The flowers pass away and die, so it is with mankind. We are born, we grow old, we sicken and die. We are as fleeting as the lightning's flash, as evanescent as the morning dew. 
I know not whether any of you here present ever fix your thoughts upon death. Yet it is a rare thing for a man to live for a hundred years. How piteous a thing it is that in this short and transient life men should consume themselves in a fire of lust. And if we think to escape from this fire, how shall we succeed save only by the teaching of the divine Buddha? Namio, Namio, meekly and entreatingly. Since Buddha himself escaped from the burning flames of the lusts of the flesh, his only thought has been for the salvation of mankind. Once upon a time, there was a certain heretic, called Rokutsu Ponji, a reader of auguries, cunning in astrology and in the healing art. It happened one day that this heretic, being in company with Buddha, entered a forest, which was full of dead men's skulls. Buddha, taking up one of the skulls and tapping it thus, here the preacher tapped the reading desk with his fan, said, What manner of man was this bone when alive? And now that he is dead, in what part of the world has he been born again? The heretic, auguring from the sound which the skull, when struck, gave forth, began to tell its past history and to prophesy the future. Then Buddha, tapping another skull, again asked the same question. The heretic answered, Verily, as to this skull, whether it belonged to a man or a woman, whence its owner came, or whether he has gone, I know not. What think you of it? Ask me not, answered Buddha. But the heretic pressed him, and entreated him to answer. Then Buddha said, Verily, this is the skull of one of my disciples, who forsook the lusts of the flesh. Then the heretic wondered, and said, Of a truth, this is a thing the like of which no man has yet seen. Here am I, who know the manner of the life and of the death, even of the ants that creep. Verily, I thought that no thing could escape my ken. Yet here lies one of your disciples, than whom there lives no nobler thing, and I am at fault. From this day forth I will enter your sect, praying only that I may receive your teaching. Thus did this learned heretic become a disciple of Buddha. If such an one as he was converted... How much the more should after ages of ordinary men feel that it is through Buddha alone that they can hope to overcome the sinful lusts of the flesh? These lusts are the desires which agitate our hearts. If we are free from these desires, our hearts will be bright and pure, and there is nothing save the teaching of Buddha which can ensure us this freedom. Following the commands of Buddha, and delivered by him from our desires, we may pass our lives in peace and happiness. Namio, Namio with triumphant exultation. In the sacred books we read of conversion from a state of sin to a state of salvation. Now this salvation is not a million miles removed from us, nor need we die and be born again into another world in order to reach it. He who lays aside his carnal lusts and affections at once and of a certainty becomes equal to Buddha. When we recite the prayer Namu Myo Ho Rengo Kyo, we are praying to enter this state of peace and happiness. By what instruction, other than that of Nichiren, the holy founder of this sect, can we expect to attain this end? If we do attain it, there will be no difference between our state and that of Buddha and of Nichiren. With this view, we have learnt from the pious founder of our sect that we must continually and thankfully repeat the prayer, Namu Myo Ho Ren Go Kyo, turning our hearts away from lies and embracing the truth. Such were the heads of the sermon, as they were taken down by my scribe. At its conclusion, the priest, looking about him, smiling, as if the solemn truths he had been inculcating were nothing but a very good joke, was greeted by long and loud cries of Namio, Namio, by all the congregation. Then the lay clerk sat himself down again by the hanging drum, and the service ended as it had begun, by prayer and chorus, during which the priest retired the sacred book being carried out before him by his acolyte. Although occasionally, as in the above instance, sermons are delivered as part of a service on special days of the month, they are more frequently preached in courses, the delivery occupying about a fortnight, during which two sermons are given each day. Frequently, the preachers are itinerant priests, who go about the towns and villages lecturing in the main hall of some temple or in the guest room of the resident priest. There are many books of sermons published in Japan, all of which have some merit and much quaintness. None that I have seen are, however, to my taste, to be compared to the Kyu o Dōwa, of which the following three sermons compose the first volume. They are written by a priest belonging to the Shingaku sect, 
a sect professing to combine all that is excellent in the Buddhist, Confucian, and Shinto teaching. It maintains the original goodness of the human heart, and teaches that we have only to follow the dictates of the conscience implanted in us at our birth, in order to steer in the right path. The texts are taken from the Chinese classical books, in the same way as our preachers take theirs from the Bible. Jokes, stories which are sometimes untranslatable into our more fastidious tongue, and pointed applications to members of the congregation, and live in the discourses. It being a principle with a Japanese preacher that it is not necessary to bore his audience into virtue. End of section 37. Section 38 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Section 38. Sermon 1. The Sermons of Kiyo O. Volume 1. Moshi. Footnote. Moshi the Japanese pronunciation of the name of the Chinese philosopher Menzi, whom Europeans call Mencius, end of footnote, says, Benevolence is the heart of man, righteousness is the path of man. How lamentable a thing is it to leave the path and go astray, to cast away the heart and not know where to seek for it. The text is taken from the first chapter of Koshi, the commentator, on Moshi. Now this quality, which we call benevolence, has been the subject of commentaries by many teachers, but as these commentaries have been difficult of comprehension, they are too hard to enter the ears of women and children. It is of this benevolence that, using examples and illustrations, I propose to treat. A long time ago, there lived at Kyoto a great physician called Imaoji. I forget his other name. He was a very famous man. Once upon a time, a man from a place called Kuramaguchi advertised for sale a medicine which he had compounded against the cholera, and got Imaoji to write a puff for him. Imaoji, instead of calling the medicine in the puff a specific against the cholera, misspelt the word cholera so as to make it simpler. When the man who had employed him went and taxed him with this, and asked him why he had done so, he answered with a smile, as Kuramaguchi is an approach to the capital from the country, the passers-by are but poor peasants and woodmen from the hills. If I had written cholera at length, they would have been puzzled by it, so I wrote it in a simple way that should pass current with everyone. Truth itself loses its value if people don't understand it. What does it signify how I spelt the word cholera so long as the efficacy of the medicine is unimpaired? Now was not that delightful? In the same way, the doctrines of the sages are mere gibberish to women and children who cannot understand them. Now, my sermons are not written for the learned. I address myself to farmers and tradesmen, who, hard-pressed by their daily business, have no time for study, with the wish to make known to them the teachings of the sages, and, carrying out the ideas of my teacher, I will make my meaning pretty plain, by bringing forward examples and quaint stories. Thus, by blending together the doctrines of the Shinto, Buddhist, and other schools, we shall arrive at something near the true principle of things. Now, positively, you must not laugh if I introduce a light story now and then. Levity is not my object. I only want to put things in a plain and easy manner. Well, then, the quality which we call benevolence is, in fact, a perfection, and it is this perfection which Moshi spoke of as the heart of man. With this perfect heart, Men, by serving their parents, attain to filial piety. By serving their masters, they attain to fidelity. And if they treat their wives, their brethren, and their friends in the same spirit, then the principles of the five relations of life will harmonize without difficulty. As for putting perfection into practice, parents have the special duties of parents. Children have the special duties of children. Husbands have the special duties of husbands. Wives have the special duties of wives. It is when all these special duties are performed without a fault that true benevolence is reached, and that, again, is the true heart of man. For example, take this fan. Anyone who sees it knows it to be a fan, and, knowing it to be a fan, no one would think of using it to blow his nose in. The special use of a fan is for visits of ceremony, or else it is opened in order to raise a cooling breeze. It serves no other purpose. In the same way, this reading desk will not do as a substitute for a shelf. 
again it will not do instead of a pillow so you see that a reading desk also has its special functions for which you must use it so if you look at your parents in the light of your parents and treat them with filial piety that is the special duty of children that is true benevolence that is the heart of man now although you may think that when i speak in this way i am speaking of others and not of yourselves believe me that the heart of every one of you is by nature pure benevolence i am just taking down your hearts as a shopman does goods from his shelves and pointing out the good and bad qualities of each but if you will not lay what i say to your own accounts but persist in thinking that it is all anybody's business but yours all my labor will be lost listen you who answer your parents rudely and cause them to weep you who bring grief and trouble on your masters you who cause your husbands to fly into passions you who cause your wives to mourn you who hate your younger brothers and treat your elder brothers with contempt you who sow sorrow broadcast over the world what are you doing but blowing your noses in fans and using reading desks as pillows i don't mean to say that there are any such persons here still there are plenty of them to be found say in the back streets in india for instance be so good as to mind what i have said consider carefully if a man is born with a naturally bad disposition what a dreadful thing that is happily you and i were born with perfect hearts which we would not change for a thousand no not for ten thousand pieces of gold is not this something to be thankful for this perfect heart is called in my discourses the original heart of man it is true that benevolence is also called the original heart of man still there is a slight difference between the two however as the inquiry into this difference would be tedious it is sufficient for you to look upon this original heart of man as a perfect thing and you will fall into no error it is true that i have not the honor of the personal acquaintance of every one of you who are present still i know that your hearts are perfect the proof of this that if you say that which you not ought to say or do that which you not ought to do your hearts within you are in some mysterious way immediately conscious of wrong when the man that has a perfect heart does that which is imperfect it is because his heart has become warped and turned to evil this law holds good for all mankind what says the old song when the roaring waterfall is shivered by the night storm the moonlight is reflected in each scattered drop. Footnote. The moon looks on many brooks. The brooks see but one moon. T. Moore. End of footnote. Although there is but one moon, she suffices to illuminate each little scattered drop. Wonderful are the laws of heaven. So the principle of benevolence, which is but one, illumines all the particles that make up mankind well then the perfection of the human heart can be calculated to a nicety so if we follow the impulses of our perfect heart in whatever we undertake we shall perform our special duties and filial piety and fidelity will come to us spontaneously you see the doctrines of the school of philosophy are quickly learnt if you once thoroughly understand this there will be no difference between your conduct and that of a man who has studied a hundred years therefore i pray you to follow the impulses of your natural heart place it before you as a teacher, and study its precepts. Your heart is a convenient teacher to employ, too, for there is no question of paying fees, and no need to go out in the heat of summer or the cold of winter to pay visits of ceremony to your master to inquire after his health. What admirable teaching this is, by means of which you can learn filial piety and fidelity so easily. Still, suspicions are apt to arise in men's minds about things that are seen to be acquired too cheaply, but here you can buy a good thing cheap, and spare yourselves the vexation of having paid an extravagant price for it. I repeat, follow the impulses of your hearts with all your might. In the Qin Yo, the second of the books of Confucius, it is certified beyond a doubt that the impulses of nature are the true path to follow. Therefore, you may set to work in this direction with your minds at ease. Righteousness, then, is the true path, and righteousness is the avoidance of all that is imperfect. If a man avoids that which is imperfect, there is no need to point out how dearly he will be beloved by all his fellows. Hence it is that the ancients have defined righteousness as that which ought to be, that which is fitting. If a man be a retainer, it is good that he should perform his service to his lord with all his might. If a woman be married, it is good that she should treat her parents-in-law with filial piety, and her husband with reverence. For the rest, whatever is good, that is righteousness and the true path of man." The duty of man has been compared by the wise men of old to a high road. 
If you want to go to Yedo or to Nagasaki, if you want to go out to the front of the house or to the back of the house, if you wish to go into the next room or into some closet or other, there is a right road to each of these places. If you do not follow the right road, scrambling over the roofs of houses and through ditches, crossing mountains and desert places, you will be utterly lost and bewildered. In the same way, if a man does that which is not good, he is going astray from the high road. Filial piety in children, virtue in wives, truth among friends. But why enumerate all these things, which are patent? All these are the right road, and good. But to grieve parents, to anger husbands, to hate and to breed hatred in others, these are all bad things, these are all the wrong road. To follow these is to plunge into rivers, to run on to thorns, to jump into ditches, and brings thousands upon ten thousands of disasters. It is true that, if we do not pay great attention, we shall not be able to follow the right road. Fortunately, we have heard by tradition the words of the learned Nakazawa Doni. I will tell you about that, all in good time. It happened that, once, the learned Nakazawa went to preach at Ikeda, in the province of Seshiu, and lodged with the rich family of the lower class. The master of the house, who was particularly fond of sermons, entertained the preacher hospitably, and summoned his daughter, a girl some fourteen or fifteen years old, to wait upon him at dinner. This young lady was not only extremely pretty, but also had charming manners, so she arranged bouquets of flowers, and made tea, and played upon the harp, and laid herself out to please the learned man by singing songs. The preacher thanked her parents for all this, and said, Really, it must be a very difficult thing to educate a young lady up to such a pitch as this. The parents, carried away by their feelings, replied, Yes, when she is married, she will hardly bring shame upon her husband's family. Besides what she did just now, she can weave garlands of flowers round torches, and we had her taught to paint a little. And as they began to show a little conceit, the preacher said, I am sure this is something quite out of the common run. Of course, she knows how to rub the shoulders and loins, and has learnt the art of shampooing. The master of the house bristled up at this, and answered, I may be very poor, but I've not fallen so low as to let my daughter learn shampooing. The learned man, smiling, replied, I think you are making a mistake when you put yourself in a rage. No matter whether her family be rich or poor, when a woman is performing her duties in her husband's house, she must look upon her husband's parents as her own. If her honored father-in-law or mother-in-law fall ill, her being able to plate flowers and paint pictures and make tea will be of no use in the sick room. To shampoo her parents-in-law and nurse them affectionately, without employing either shampooer or servant-maid, is the right path of a daughter-in-law. Do you mean to say that your daughter has not yet learned shampooing, an art which is essential to her following the right path of a wife? That is what I meant to ask just now. So useful a study is very important. At this, the master of the house was ashamed, and blushing made many apologies, as I have heard. Certainly the harp and guitar are very good things in their way, but to attend to nursing their parents is the right road of children. Lay this story to heart, and consider attentively where the right road lies. People who live near haunts of pleasure become at last so fond of pleasure that they teach their daughters nothing but how to play on the harp and guitar, and train them up in the manners and ways of singing girls, but teach them next to nothing of their duties as daughters, and then very often they escape from their parents' watchfulness and elope. Nor is this the fault of the girls themselves, but the fault of the education which they have received from their parents. I do not mean to say that the harp and guitar, and songs and dramas, are useless things. If you consider them attentively, all our songs incite to virtue and condemn vice. In the song called The Four Sleeves, for instance, there is the passage... If people knew beforehand all the misery that it brings, there would be less going out with young ladies to look at the flowers at night. Please give your attention to this piece of poetry. This is the meaning of it. When a young man and a young lady set up a flirtation without the consent of their parents, they think that it will all be very delightful and find themselves very much deceived. If they knew what a sad and cruel world this is, they would not act as they do. The quotation is from a song of remorse. This sort of thing but too often happens in the world. When a man marries a wife, he thinks how happy he will be, and how pleasant it will be keeping house on his own account. But before the bottom of the family kettle has been scorched black, he will be like a man learning to swim in a field, with his ideas all turned topsy-turvy, and contrary to all his expectations. Look at that woman there, 
Haunted by her cares, she takes no heed of her hair, nor of her personal appearance. With her head all untidy, her apron tied round her as a girdle, with a baby twisted into the bosom of her dress, she carries some wretched bean sauce which she has been out to buy. What sort of creature is this? This all comes of not listening to the warnings of parents, and of not waiting for the proper time, but rushing suddenly into housekeeping. And who is to blame in the matter? Passion, which does not pause to reflect. A child of five or six years will never think of learning to play the guitar for its own pleasure. What a ten million times miserable thing it is when parents, making their little girls hug a great guitar, listen with pleasure to the poor little things playing on instruments big enough for them to climb upon, and squeaking out songs in their shrill treble voices. Now I must beg you to listen to me carefully. If you get confused and don't keep a sharp lookout, your children, brought up upon harp and guitar playing, will be abandoning their parents and running away secretly. Depend upon it. From all that is licentious and meretricious, something monstrous will come forth. The poet who wrote The Four Sleeves regarded it as the right path of instruction to convey a warning against vice. But the theater and drama and fashionable songs, if the moral that they convey is missed, are a very great mistake. Although you may think it very right and proper that a young lady should practice nothing but the harp and guitar until her marriage, I tell you that it is not so, for if she misses the moral of her songs and music, there is the danger of her falling in love with some man and eloping. While on this subject, I have an amusing story to tell you. Once upon a time, a frog, who lived at Kyoto, had long been desirous of going to see Osaka. One spring, having made up his mind, he started off to see Osaka and all its famous places. By a series of hops on all fours, he reached a temple opposite Nichi no Oka, and thence, by the western road, he arrived at Yamazaki, and began to ascend the mountain called Tenozan. Now it happened that a frog from Osaka had determined to visit Kyoto, and had also ascended Tenozan, and on the summit the two frogs met, made acquaintance, and told one another their intentions. So they began to complain about all the trouble they had gone through, and had only arrived halfway after all. If they went on to Osaka and Kyoto, their legs and loins would certainly not hold out. Here was the famous mountain of Tenozan, from the top of which the whole of Kyoto and Osaka could be seen. If they stood on tiptoe and stretched their backs and looked at the view, they would save themselves from stiff legs. Having come to this conclusion, they both stood up on tiptoe and looked about them. When the Kyoto frog said, Really, looking at the famous places of Osaka, which I have heard so much about, they don't seem to me to differ a bit from Kyoto. Instead of giving myself any further trouble to go on, I shall just return home. The Osaka frog, blinking with his eyes, said with a contemptuous smile, Well, I have heard a great deal of talk about this Kyoto being as beautiful as the flowers, but it is just Osaka over again. We had better go home. And so the two frogs, politely bowing to one another, hopped off home with an important swagger. Now, although this is a very funny little story, you will not understand the drift of it at once. The frogs thought that they were looking in front of them, but as, when they stood up, their eyes were in the back of their heads, each was looking at his native place, all the while that he believed himself to be looking at the place he wished to go to. The frogs stared to any amount, it is true, but then they did not take care that the object looked at was the right object, and so it was that they fell into error. Please listen attentively. A certain poet says, Wonderful are the frogs, though they go on all fours in an attitude of humility, their eyes are always turned ambitiously upwards. A delightful poem. Men, although they say with their mouths, Yes, yes, your wishes shall be obeyed. Certainly, certainly, you are perfectly right. Are like frogs, with their eyes turned upwards. Vain fools, meddlers ready to undertake any job, however much above their powers. This is what is called in the text, Casting away your heart, and not knowing where to seek for it. Although these men profess to undertake any earthly thing, when it comes to the point, leave them to themselves, and they are unequal to the task. And if you tell them this, they answer, By the labor of our own bodies we earn our money, and the food of our mouths is of our own getting. We are under obligation to no man. If we did not depend upon ourselves, how could we live in the world? There are plenty of people who use these words, myself and my own, thoughtlessly and at random. How false is this belief that they profess? If there were no system of government by superiors, but an anarchy, 
these people who vaunt themselves in their own powers would not stand for a day. In the old days, at the time of the war at Ichi no Tani, Minamoto no Yoshitsune, footnote, the younger brother of Minamoto no Yoritomo, who first established the government of the shoguns. The battle of Ichi no Tani took place in the year A.D. 1184. End of footnote. Left Mikusa in the province of Tamba and attacked Setsu. Overtaken by the night among the mountains, he knew not what road to follow, so he sent for his retainer, Benkei, of the temple called Musashi, and told him to light the big torches which they had agreed upon. Benkei received his orders and transmitted them to the troops, who immediately dispersed through all the valleys and set fire to the houses of the inhabitants, so that one and all blazed up, and thanks to the light of this fire, they reached Ichinotani, as the story goes. If you think attentively, you will see the illusion. Those who boast about my warehouse, my house, my farm, my daughter, my wife, hawking about this my of theirs like peddlers, let there once come trouble and war in the world, and for all their vaingloriousness they will be as helpless as turtles. Let them be thankful that peace is established throughout the world. The humane government reaches to every frontier. The officials of every department keep watch night and day. When a man sleeps under his roof at night, how can he say that it is thanks to himself that he stretches his limbs in slumber? You go your rounds to see whether the shutters are closed and the front door fast, and having taken every precaution, you lay yourself down to rest in peace. And what a precaution after all! A board, four-tenths of an inch thick, planed down front and rear until it is only two-tenths of an inch thick. A fine precaution, in very truth, a precaution which may be blown down with a breath. Do you suppose such a thing as that would frighten a thief from breaking in? This is the state of the case. Here are men who, by the benevolence and virtue of their rulers, live in a delightful world, and yet, forgetting the mysterious providence that watches over them, keep on singing their own praises. Selfish egotists. My property amounts to five thousand ounces of silver. I may sleep with my eyes turned up and eat and take my pleasure, if I live for five hundred or for seven hundred years. I have five warehouses and twenty-five houses. I hold other people's bills for fifteen hundred ounces of silver. So he dances a fling. Footnote. Literally, a dance of the province of Tosa. End of footnote. And has no fear lest poverty should come upon him for fifty or a hundred years. Minds like frogs with eyes in the middle of their backs. Foolhardy thoughts. A trusty castle of defense indeed. How little can it be depended upon? And when such men are sleeping quietly, how can they tell that they may not be turned into those big torches we were talking about just now, or that a great earthquake will not be upheaved? These are the chances of this fitful world. With regard to the danger of too great reliance, I have a little tale to tell you. Be so good as to wake up from your drowsiness and listen attentively. There is a certain powerful shellfish, called the Sazaye, with a very strong operculum. Now this creature, if it hears that there is any danger astir, shuts up its shell from within, with a loud noise, and thinks itself perfectly safe. One day a Thai and another fish, lost in envy at this, said, What a strong castle this is of yours, Mr. Sazaye. When you shut up your lid from within, nobody can so much as point a finger at you. A capital figure you make, sir. When he heard this, the Sazaye, stroking his beard, replied, Well, gentlemen, although you are so good as to say so, it's nothing to boast of in the way of safety. Yet I must admit that, when I shut myself up thus, I do not feel much anxiety. And as he was speaking thus, with the pride that apes humility, there came the noise of a great splash, and the shellfish, shutting up his lid as quickly as possible, kept quite still, and thought to himself what in the world the noise could be. Could it be a net? Could it be a fish hook? What a bore it was, always having to keep such a sharp lookout. Were the tie and the other fish caught, he wondered, and he felt quite anxious about them. However, at any rate, he was safe. And so the time passed, and when he thought all was safe, he stealthily opened his shell, and slipped out his head and looked all round him. And there seemed to be something wrong, something with which he was not familiar. As he looked a little more carefully, lo and behold, there he was in a fishmonger's shop, and with the card marked 16 cash on his back. Isn't that a funny story? And so, at one fell swoop, all your boasted wealth of houses and warehouses and cleverness and talent and rank and power are taken away. Poor shellfish! 
I think there are some people not unlike them to be found in China and India. How little self is to be depended upon. There is a moral poem which says, It is easier to ascend to the cloudy heaven without a ladder than to depend entirely on oneself. This is what is meant by the text, If a man casts his heart from him, he knows not where to seek for it. Think twice upon everything that you do. To take no care for the examination of that which relates to yourself, but to look only at that which concerns others, is to cast your heart from you. Casting your heart from you does not mean that your heart actually leaves you. What is meant is that you do not examine your own conscience. Nor must you think that what I have said upon this point of self-confidences applies only to wealth and riches. To rely on your talents, to rely on the services you have rendered, to rely on your cleverness, to rely on your judgment, to rely on your strength, to rely on your rank, and to think yourself secure in the possession of these, is to place yourself in the same category with the shellfish in the story. In all things, examine your own consciences. The examination of your own hearts is above all things essential. The preacher leaves his place. End of section 38、section 39 of Tales of Old Japan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Section 39. Sermon 2. The Sermons of Kyu O. Volume 1. If a man loses a fowl or a dog, he knows how to reclaim it. If he loses his soul, he knows not. How to reclaim it. The true path of learning has no other function than to teach us how to reclaim lost souls. This parable has been declared to us by Moshi. If a dog, or a chicken, or a pet cat does not come home at the proper time, its master makes a great fuss about hunting for it, and wonders can it have been killed by a dog or by a snake, or can some man have stolen it? And ransacking the three houses opposite, and his two next door neighbors' houses, As if he were seeking for a lost child, cries, Pray, sir, has my tortoise shell cat been with you? Has my pet chicken been here? That is the way in which men run about under such circumstances. It's a matter of the utmost importance. And yet, to lose a dog or a tame chicken is no such terrible loss after all. But the soul, which is called the lord of the body, is the master of our whole selves. If men part with this soul for the sake of other things, Then they become deaf to the admonitions of their parents, and the instructions of their superiors are to them as the winds of heaven. Teaching is to them like pouring water over a frog's face. They blink their eyes, and that is all. They say, Yes, yes, with their mouths, but their hearts are gone. And seeing, they are blind. Hearing, they are deaf. Born whole and sound, by their own doing they enter the fraternity of cripples. Such are all those who lose their souls. Nor do they think of inquiring or looking for their lost soul. It is my parents' fault. It is my master's fault. It is my husband's fault. It is my elder brother's fault. It is Hachibe who was a rogue. It is Omatsu who was a bad woman. They content themselves with looking at the faults of others, and do not examine their own consciences, nor search their own hearts. Is not this a cruel state of things? They set up a hue and cry for a lost dog or a pet chicken. But for this all important soul of theirs, they make no search. What mistaken people! For this reason, the sages, mourning over such a state of things, have taught us what is the right path of man, and it is the receiving of this teaching that is called learning. The main object of learning is the examination and searching of our own hearts. Therefore, the text says, the true path of learning has no other function than to teach us how to reclaim lost souls. This is an exhaustive exposition of the functions of learning. That learning has no other object, we have this gracious pledge and guarantee from the sage. As for the mere study of the antiquities and annals of China and Japan, and investigation into literature, these cannot be called learning, which is above all things an affair of the soul. All the commentaries and all the books of all the teachers in the world. Are but so many directories by which to find out the whereabouts of our own souls. This search after our own souls 
is that which I alluded to just now as the examination of our consciences. To disregard the examination of our consciences is a terrible thing, of which it is impossible to foresee the end. On the other hand, to practice it is most admirable, for by this means we can on the spot attain filial piety and fidelity to our masters. Virtue and vice are the goals to which the examination and non-examination of our consciences lead. As it has been rightly said, benevolence and malice are the two roads which man follows. Upon this subject, I have a terrible and yet a very admirable story to tell you. Although I dare say you are very drowsy, I must beg you to listen to me. In a certain part of the country, there was a well-to-do farmer, whose marriage had brought him one son, whom he petted beyond all measure, as a cow licks her calf. So by degrees the child became very sly. He used to pull the horse's tails, and blow smoke into the bull's nostrils, and bully the neighbor's children in petty ways and make them cry. From a peevish child he grew to be a man, and unbearably undutiful to his parents. Priding himself on a little superior strength, he became a drunkard and a gambler, and learned to wrestle at fairs. He would fight and quarrel for a trifle, and spent his time in debauchery and riotous living. If his parents remonstrated with him, he would raise his voice and abuse them, using scurrilous language. It's all very well, you're abusing me for being dissolute and disobedient, but pray, who asked you to bring me into the world? You brought me into the world, and I have to thank you for its miseries. So now, if you hate dissolute people, you would better put me back where I came from, and I shall be all right again. This was the sort of insolent answer he would give his parents, who, at their wit's end, began to grow old in years. And as he, by degrees, grew more and more of a bully, unhappy as he made them, still he was their darling, and they could not find it in their hearts to turn him out of the house and disinherit him. So they let him pursue his selfish course, and he went on from worse to worse, knocking people down, breaking their arms, and getting up great disturbances. It is unnecessary to speak of his parents' feelings. Even his relations and friends felt as if nails were being hammered into their breasts. He was a thoroughly wicked man. Now no one is from his mother's womb so wicked as this, but those who persist in selfishness lose their senses and gradually reach this pitch of wickedness. What a terrible thing is this throwing away of our hearts. Well, this man's relations and friends very properly urged his parents to disown him. But he was an only child, and so his parents, although they said, Today we really will disinherit him, or Tomorrow we really will break off all relations with him. Still it was all empty talk, and the years and months passed by, until the scapegrace reached his twenty-sixth year, having heaped wickedness upon wickedness. And who can tell how much trouble he brought upon his family, who were always afraid of hearing of some new enormity? At last they held a family council, and told the parents that matters had come to such a pass that if they did not disown their son, the rest of the family must needs break off all communication with them. If he were allowed to go on in his evil courses, the whole village, not to speak of his relations, would be disgraced. So either the parents, against whom, however, there was no ill will felt, must be cut by the family, or they must disinherit their son. To this appeal they begged to have a distinct answer. The parents, reflecting that to separate themselves from their relations, even for the sake of their own son, would be an act of disrespect to their ancestors, determined to invite their relations to assemble and draw up a petition to the government for leave to disinherit their son, to which petition the family would all affix their seals according to form. So they begged them to come in the evening, and bring their seals with them. This was their answer. There is an old saw which says, The old cow licks her calf, and the tigress carries her cub in her mouth. If the instinct of beasts and birds prompt them to love their young, how much the more must it be a better thing for a man to have to disown his own son? All this trouble was the consequence of this youth casting his heart from him. Had he examined his own conscience, the storm of waves and of wind would not have arisen, and all would have been calm. But as he refused to listen to his conscience, his parents, much against their will, were forced to visit him with the punishment of disinheritance, which he had brought upon himself. A sad thing indeed. In the poems of his reverence Tokuhon, a modern poet, there is the following passage. Since Buddha thus winds himself round our hearts, let the man who dares to disregard him fear for his life. 
the allusion is to the great mercy and love of the gods. The gods wish to make men examine their consciences, and, day and night, help men to discern that which is evil. But, although they point out our desires and pleasures, our lusts and passions, as things to be avoided, men turn their backs upon their own consciences. The love of the gods is like the love of parents for their children, and men treat the gods as undutiful children treat their parents. Men who dare to disregard the gods, let them fear for their lives. I pray you, who hear me, one and all, to examine your own consciences and be saved. To return to the story of the vagabond son. As it happened, that day he was gambling in a neighboring village, when a friend from his own place came up and told him that his relations had met together to disinherit him, and that, fine fellow as he was, he would find it a terrible thing to be disowned. Before he had heard him half out, the other replied in a loud voice, What, do you mean to say that they are holding a family council tonight to disinherit me? What a good joke! I'm sure I don't want to be always seeing my father's and mother's blubbering faces. It makes me quite sick to think of them. It's quite unbearable. I'm able to take care of myself. And if I choose to go over to China, or to live in India, I should like to know who is to prevent me. This is the very thing above all others for me. I'll go off to the room when they are all assembled, and ask them why they want to disinherit me. I'll just swagger like Don Giro. Footnote. A famous actor of Yedo, who lived 195 years ago. He was born at Sakura, in Shimosa. End of footnote. The actor, and frightened them into giving me 50 or 70 ounces of silver to get rid of me, put the money in my purse, and be up to Kyoto or Osaka, where I'll set up a tea house on my own account and enjoy myself to my heart's content. I hope this will be a great night for me, so I'll just drink a cup of wine for luck beforehand. And so, with a lot of young devils of his own sort, he fell to drinking wine in teacups. Footnote. The ordinary wine cup holding only a thimbleful. To drink wine out of teacups is a great piece of debauchery, like drinking brandy in tumblers. End of footnote. So that before nightfall, they were all as drunk as mud, well, then, on the strength of this wine, as he was setting out for his father's house, he said, Now, then, to try my luck, and stuck a long dirk in his girdle. He reached his own village just before nightfall, thinking to burst into the place where he imagined his relations to be gathered together, turning their wisdom pockets inside out, to shake out their small provision of intelligence in consultation, and he fancied that, if he blustered and bullied, he would certainly get a hundred ounces of silver out of them. Just as he was about to enter the house, he reflected, If I show my face in the room where my relations are gathered together, they will all look down at the ground and remain silent, so if I go in shouting and raging, it will be quite out of harmony. But if they abuse me, then I shall be in the right if I jump in on them and frighten them well. The best plan will be for me to step out of the bamboo grove which is behind the house, and to creep round the veranda, and I can listen to these fellows holding their consultation, they will certainly be raking up all sorts of scandal about me. It will all be in harmony, then, if I kick down the shutters and sliding doors with a noise like thunder. And what fun it will be! As he thought thus to himself, he pulled off his iron-heeled sandals and stuck them in his girdle, and, girding up his dress round his waist, left the bamboo grove at the back of the house, and, jumping over the garden wicket, went round the veranda and looked in. Peeping through a chink in the shutters, he could see his relations gathered together in council, speaking in whispers. The family were sitting in a circle, and one and all were affixing their seals to the petition of disinheritance. At last, having passed from hand to hand, the document came round to where the two parents were sitting. Their son, seeing this, said, Come now, it's win or lose. My parents signing the paper shall be the sign for me to kick open the door and jump into the middle of them. So, getting ready for a good kick, he held his breath and looked on. What terrible perversion man can allow his heart to come to! Moshi has said that man by nature is good, but although not a particle of fault can be found with what he has said, when the evil we have learnt becomes a second nature, men reach this fearful degree of wickedness. When men come to this pass, Koshi, footnote, Koshi is the Japanese pronunciation of the name of the Chinese philosopher Kung Tzu, or Kung Fu Tzu, whom we call Confucius. End of footnote. And Moshi themselves might preach to them for a thousand days, 
and they would not have strength to reform. Such hardened sinners deserve to be roasted in iron pots in the nethermost hell. Now I am going to tell you how it came about that the vagabond son turned over a new leaf and became dutiful, and finally entered paradise. The poet says, Although the hearts of parents are not surrounded by dark night, how often they stray from the right road in their affection for their children. When the petition of disinheritance came round to the place where the two parents were sitting, the mother lifted up her voice and wept aloud, and the father, clenching his toothless gums to conceal his emotion, remained with his head bent down. Presently, in a husky voice, he said, Wife, give me the seal. But she returned no answer, and with tears in her eyes took a leather purse containing the seal out of a drawer of the cupboard and placed it before her husband. All this time the vagabond son, holding his breath, was peeping in from outside the shutters. In the meanwhile, the old man slowly untied the strings of the purse, and took out the seal, and smeared on the coloring matter. Just as he was about to seal the document, his wife clutched at his hand and said, Oh, pray, wait a little. The father replied, Now that all our relations are looking on, you must not speak in this weak manner. But she would not listen to what he said, but went on. Pray, listen to what I have to say. It is true that if we were to give over our house to our undutiful son, in less than three years the grass would be growing in its place, for he would be ruined. Still, if we disinherit our child, the only child that we have, either in heaven or upon earth, we shall have to adopt another in his place. Although, if the adopted son turned out honest and dutiful, and inherited our property, all would be well. Still, what certainty is there of his doing so? If, on the other hand, the adopted son turned out to be a prodigal and laid waste our house, what unlucky parents we should be! And who can say that this would not be the case? If we are to be ruined for the sake of an equally wicked adopted son, I had rather lose our home for the sake of our own son, and, leaving our old familiar village as beggars, seek for our lost boy on foot. This is my fervent wish. During fifty years that we have lived together, this has been the only favor that I have ever asked of you. Pray listen to my prayer, and put a stop to this act of disinheritance. Even though I should become a beggar for my son's sake, I could feel no resentment against him. So she spoke, sobbing aloud. The relations, who heard this, looked round at one another, and watched the father to see what he would do. And he, who knows with what thoughts in his head, put back the seal into the leather purse, and quickly drew the strings together, and pushed back the petition to the relations. Certainly, said he, I have lost countenance, and am disgraced before all my family. However, I think that what the good wife has just said is right and proper, and from henceforth I renounce all thoughts of disinheriting my son. Of course you will all see a weakness of purpose in what I say, and laugh at me as the cause of my son's undutiful conduct. But laugh away, it won't hurt me. Certainly if I don't disinherit the son of mine, my house will be ruined before three years are over our heads. To lay waste the house of generations upon generations of my ancestors is a sin against those ancestors. Of this I am well aware. Further, if I don't disinherit my son, you gentlemen will all shun me. I know that I am cutting myself off from my relations. Of course you think that when I leave this place I shall be dunning you to bestow your charity upon me, and that is why you want to break off relations with me. Pray don't make yourselves uneasy. I care no more for my duties to the world, for my impiety to my ancestors or for my separation from my family. Our son is our only darling, and we mean to go after him, following him as beggars on foot. This is our desire. We shall trouble you for no alms, and for no charity. However we may die, we have but one life to lose. For our darling son's sake, we will lay ourselves down and die by the roadside. There our bodies shall be manure for the trees of the avenue. And all this we will endure cheerfully, and not utter a complaint. Make haste and return home, therefore, all of you. From tomorrow we are no longer on speaking terms. As for what you may say to me on my son's account, I do not care. And as his wife had done, he lifted up his voice and wept, shedding manly tears. As for her, when she heard that the act of disinheritance was not to be drawn up, her tears were changed to tears of joy. The rest of the family remained in mute astonishment at so unheard of a thing and could only stare at the faces of the two old people. You see how bewildered parents must be by their love for their children, to be so merciful towards them. 
as a cat carrying her young in her mouth screens it from the sun at one time and brings it under the light at another, so parents act by their children, screening their bad points and bringing out in relief their good qualities. They care neither for the abuse of others, nor for their duties to their ancestors, nor for the wretched future in store for themselves. Carried away by their infatuation for their children, and intoxicated upon intoxication, the hearts of parents are to be pitied for their pitifulness. It is not only the two parents in my story who are in this plight. The hearts of all parents, of children all over the world, are the same. In the poems of the late learned Ichida, it is written, When I look round me and see the hearts of parents bewildered by their love for their children, I reflect that my own father and mother must be like them. This is certainly a true saying. To return to the story, the halo of his parents' great kindness and pity penetrated the very bowels of the prodigal son. What an admirable thing! When he heard it, terrible and sly devil as he had been, he felt as if his whole body had been squeezed in a press, and somehow or other, although the tears rose in his breast, he could not for shame lift up his voice and weep. Biting the sleeve of his dress, he lay down on the ground and shed tears in silence. What says the verse of the reverend priest any? To shed tears of gratitude one knows not why. A very pretty poem indeed. So then the vagabond son, in his gratitude to his parents, could neither stand nor sit. You see, the original heart of man is by nature bright virtue, but by our selfish pursuit of our own inclinations, the brilliancy of our original virtue is hidden. To continue, the prodigal was pierced to the core by the great mercy shown by his parents, and the brilliancy of his own original good heart was enticed back to him. The sunlight came forth, and what became of all the clouds of self-will and selfishness? The clouds were all dispelled, and from the bottom of his soul there sprang the desire to thank his parents for their goodness. We all know the story of the rush-cutter who saw the moon rising between the trees on a moorland hill so brightly that he fancied it must have been scoured with the scouring rush which grew near the spot. When a man, who has been especially wicked, repents and returns to his original heart, he becomes all the more excellent, and his brightness is as that of the rising moon scoured. What an admirable thing this is! So the son thought to enter the room at once and beg his parents' forgiveness, but he thought to himself, Wait a bit. If I burst suddenly into the room like this, the relations will all be frightened and not know what to make of it, and this will be a trouble to my parents. I will put on an innocent face, as if I did not know what has been going on, and I'll go in by the front door and beg the relations to intercede for me with my parents. With stealthy step, he left the back of the house and went round to the front. When he arrived there, he purposely made a great noise with his iron-heeled sandals, and gave a loud cough to clear his throat, and entered the room. The relations were all greatly alarmed, and his parents, when they saw the face of their wicked son, both shed tears. As for the son, he said not a word, but remained weeping, with his head bent down. After a while, he addressed the relations, and said, Although I have frequently been threatened with this inheritance, and although in those days I made light of it, Tonight, when I heard that this family council had assembled, I somehow or other felt my heart beset by anxiety and grief. However I may have heaped wickedness upon wickedness up to the present moment, as I shall certainly now mend my ways, I pray you to delay for a while tonight's act of disinheritance. I do not venture to ask for a long delay. I ask but for thirty days, and if within that time I shall not have given proofs of repentance, disinherit me. I shall not have a word to say. I pray you, gentlemen, to intercede with my parents that they may grant this delay of thirty days, and to present them my humble apologies. With this, he rubbed his head on the mat, as a humble suppliant, in a manner most foreign to his nature. The relations, after hearing the firm and resolute answer of the parents, had shifted about in their places, but, although they were on the point of leaving the house, had remained behind, sadly out of harmony, when the son came in and happily with the word set all in tune again. So the relations addressed the parents, and said, Pray defer tonight's affair, and laid the son's apologies at their feet. As for the parents, who would not have disinherited their son even had he not repented, how much the more, when they heard what he said, did they weep for joy, and the relations, delighted at the happy event, exhorted the son to become really dutiful, and so that night's counsel broke up. 
So this son, in the turn of a hand, became a pious son, and the way in which he served his parents was that of a tender and loving child. His former evil ways he extinguished utterly. The fame of this story rose high in the world, and before half a year had passed, it reached the ears of the lord of the manor, who, when he had put on his noble spectacles and investigated the case, appointed the son to be the head man of his village. You may judge by this what this son's filial piety effected. Three years after these events, his mother, who was on her deathbed very sick, called for him and said, When some time since the consultation was being held about disinheriting you, by some means or other your heart was turned, and since then you have been a dutiful son above all others. If at that time you had not repented, and I had died in the meanwhile, my soul would have gone to hell without fail because of my foolish conduct towards you. But, now that you have repented, there is nothing that weighs upon me, and there can be no mistake about my going to paradise. So the fact of my becoming one of the saints will all be the work of your filial piety. And the story goes that with these words, the mother, lifting up her hands in prayer, died. To be sure, by the deeds of the present life, we may obtain a glimpse into the future. If a man's heart is troubled by his misdeeds in this life, it will again be tortured in the next. The troubled heart is hell. The heart at rest is paradise. The trouble or peace of parents depends upon their children. If their children are virtuous, parents are as the saints. If their children are wicked, parents suffer the tortures of the damned. If once your youthful spirits, in a fit of heedlessness, have led you to bring trouble upon your parents and cause them to weep, just consider the line of argument which I have been following. From this time forth, repent and examine your own hearts. If you will become dutiful, your parents from this day will live happy as the saints. But if you will not repent, but persist in your evil ways, your parents will suffer the pains of hell. Heaven and hell are matters of repentance or non-repentance. Repentance is the finding of the lost heart, and is also the object of learning. I shall speak to you further upon this point tomorrow evening. End of section 39 Section 40 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Section 40. Sermon 3. The Sermons of Kiyu O. Volume 1. Moshi has said, There is the third finger. If a man's third or nameless finger be bent so that he cannot straighten it, although his bent finger may cause him no pain, still if he hears of someone who can cure it, he will think nothing of undertaking a long journey from Xin to So. Footnote. Ancient Divisions of China. End of footnote. To consult him upon this deformed finger, for he knows it is to be hateful to have a finger unlike those of other men, but he cares not a jot if his heart be different to that of other men, and this is how men disregard the true order of things. Now this is the next chapter to the one about benevolence being the true heart of man, which I expounded to you the other night. True learning has no other aim than that of reclaiming lost souls, and, in connection with this, Moshi has thus again declared in a parable the all-importance of the human heart. The nameless finger is that which is next to the little finger. The thumb is called the parent finger. The first finger is called the index. The long is called the middle finger. But the third finger has no name. It is true that it is sometimes called the finger for applying rouge, but that is only a name given it by ladies and is not in general use. So, having no name, it is called the nameless finger. And how comes it to have no name? Why, because it is of all the fingers the least useful. When we clutch at or grasp things, we do so by the strength of the thumb and little finger. If a man scratches his head, he does it with a forefinger. If he wishes to test the heat of the wine, footnote, wine is almost always drunk hot, end of footnote, in the kettle, he uses the little finger. Thus, although each finger has its uses and duties, the nameless finger alone is of no use. It is not in our way if we have it, and we do not miss it if we lose it. Of the whole body, it is the meanest member. If it be crooked so that we cannot straighten it, it neither hurts nor itches. 
As Moshi says in the text, it causes no pain. Even if we were without it, we should be none the worse off. Hence, what though it should be bent, it would be better, since it causes no pain, to leave it as it is. Yet if a person, having such a crooked finger, hears of a clever doctor who can set it straight, no matter at how great a distance he may be, he will be off to consult this doctor. And pray, why? Because he feels ashamed of having a finger a little different from the rest of the world, and so he wants to be cured, and will think nothing of travelling from Sheen to So, a distance of a thousand miles, for the purpose. To be sure, men are very susceptible and keenly alive to a sense of shame, and in this they are quite right. The feeling of shame at what is wrong is the commencement of virtue. The perception of shame is inborn in men, but there are two ways of perceiving shame. There are some men who are sensible of shame for what regards their bodies, but who are ignorant of shame for what concerns their hearts, and a terrible mistake they make. There is nothing which can be compared in importance to the heart. The heart is said to be the lord of the body, which it rules as a master rules his house. Shall the lord, who is the heart, be ailing and his sickness be neglected, while his servants, who are the members only, are cared for? If the knee be lacerated, apply tinder to stop the bleeding. If the moxa should separate, spread a plaster. If a cold be caught, prepare medicine and garlic and gruel and ginger wine. For a trifle you will doctor and care for your bodies, and yet for your hearts you will take no care. Although you are born of mankind, if your hearts resemble those of devils, of foxes, of snakes, or of crows, rather than the hearts of men, you take no heed, caring for your bodies alone. Whence can you have fallen into such a mistake? It is a folly of old standing, too, for it was to that that Moshi pointed when he said that to be cognizant of a deformed finger and ignore the deformities of the soul was to disregard the true order of things. This is what it is not to distinguish between that which is important and that which is unimportant, to pick up a trifle and pass by something of value. The instinct of man prompts him to prefer the great to the small, the important to the unimportant. If a man is invited out to a feast by his relations or acquaintances, when the guests are assembled and the principal part of the feast has disappeared, he looks all round him, with the eyeballs starting out of his head, and glares at his neighbors, and, comparing the little tidbits of roast fowl or fish put before them, sees that they are about half an inch bigger than those set before him. Then, blowing out his belly with rage, he thinks, What on earth can the host be about? Master Tarube is a guest, but so am I. What does the fellow mean by helping me so meanly? There must be some malice or ill will here. And so his mind is prejudiced against the host. Just be so good as to reflect upon this. Does a man show his spite by grudging a bit of roast fowl or meat? And yet even in such trifles as these do men show how they try to obtain what is great, and show their dislike of what is small. How can men be conscious of shame for a deformed finger, and count it as no misfortune that their hearts are crooked? That is how they abandon the substance for the shadow. Moshi severely censures the disregard of the true order of things. What mistaken and bewildered creatures men are! What says the old song? Hidden far among the mountains, the tree which seems to be rotten, if its core be yet alive, may be made to bear flowers. What signifies it if the hand or the foot be deformed? The heart is the important thing. If the heart be awry, what though your skin be fair, your nose aquiline, your hair beautiful? All these strike the eye alone and are utterly useless. It is as if you were to put a horse dung into a gold lacquer luncheon box. This is what is called a fair outside deceptive in appearance. There's the scullery maid been washing out the pots at the kitchen sink, and the scullion Chokichi comes up and says to her, You've got a lot of charcoal smut sticking to your nose, and points out to her the ugly spot. The scullery maid is delighted to be told of this, and answers, Really? Whereabouts is it? Then she twists a towel round her finger, and bending her head till mouth and forehead are almost on a level, she squints at her nose and twiddles away with her fingers as if she were the famous Goto. Footnote. A famous gold and silversmith of the olden time. A Benvenuto Cellini among the Japanese. His mark on a piece of metal work enhances its value tenfold. End of footnote. At work. Carving the ornaments of a sword handle. I say, Master Chokichi, is it off yet? Not a bit of it. You've smeared it all over your cheeks now. Oh dear, oh dear, where can it be? 
and so she uses the water basin as a looking glass and washes her face clean. Then she says to herself, what a dear boy Chokichi is, and thinks it necessary, out of gratitude, to give him relishes with his supper by the ladleful, and thanks him over and over again. But if this same Chokichi were to come up to her and say, now really, how lazy you are, I wish you could manage to be rather less of a shrew, what do you think the scullery maid would answer then? Reflect for a moment. Drat the boy's impudence. If I were of a bad heart or an angular disposition, should I be here helping him? You go and be hung. You see if I take the trouble to wash your dirty bedclothes for you any more. And she gets to be a perfect devil, less only the horns. There are other people, besides the poor scullery maid, who are in the same way. Excuse me, Mr. Goodnebay, but the embroidered crest on your dress of ceremony seems to be a little on one side. Mr. Gundebe proceeds to adjust his dress with great precision. Thank you, sir. I am ten million times obliged to you for your care. If ever there should be any matter in which I can be of service to you, I beg that you will do me the favor of letting me know. And, with a beaming face, he expresses his gratitude. Now for the other side of the picture. Really, Mr. Gundebe, you are very foolish. You don't seem to understand at all. I beg you to be of a frank and honest heart. It really makes me quite sad to see a man's heart warped in this way. What is his answer? He turns his sword in his girdle, ready to draw, and plays the devil's tattoo upon the hilt. It looks as if it must end in a fight soon. In fact, if you help a man in anything which has to do with the fault of the body, he takes it very kindly, and sets about mending matters. If anyone helps another to rectify a fault of the heart, he has to deal with a man in the dark, who flies in a rage and does not care to amend. How out of tune all this is! and yet there are men who are bewildered up to this point. Nor is this a special and extraordinary failing. This mistaken perception of the great and the small, of color and of substance, is common to us all, to you and to me. Please, give me your attention. The form strikes the eye, but the heart strikes not the eye. Therefore, that the heart should be distorted and turned awry causes no pain. This all results from the want of sound judgment, and that is why we cannot afford to be careless. The master of a certain house calls his servant Chokichi, who sits dozing in the kitchen. Here, Chokichi, the guests are all gone. Come and clear away the wine and fish in the back room. Chokichi rubs his eyes, and with a sulky answer goes into the back room, and, looking about him, sees all the nice things paraded on the trays and in the bowls. It's wonderful how his drowsiness passes away. No need for anyone to hurry him now. His eyes glare with greed as he says, Hello, here's a lot of tempting things. There's only just one help of that omelette left in the tray. What a hungry lot of guests. What's this? It looks like fish rissoles. And with this, he picks out one and crams his mouth full. When on one side, a mess of young cuttlefish, in a Chinese... Footnote. Curiosities such as porcelain or enamel or carved jade from China are highly esteemed by the Japanese. A great quantity of the porcelain of Japan is stamped with counterfeit Chinese marks of the Ming dynasty. End of footnote. Porcelain bowl catches his eyes. There the little beauties sit in a circle, like Buddhist priests in religious meditation. Oh, goodness, how nice! And just as he is dipping his finger and thumb in, he hears his master's footstep. And knowing that he is doing wrong, he crams his prides into the pocket of his sleeve, and stoops down to take away the wine kettle and cups and as he does this, out tumble the cuttlefish from his sleeve. The master sees it. What's that? Chokichi, pretending not to know what has happened, beats the mats and keeps on saying, Come again the day before yesterday! Come again the day before yesterday! Footnote. An incantation used to invite spiders, which are considered unlucky by the superstitious, to come again at the Greek kalends. End of footnote. But it's no use his trying to persuade his master that the little cuttlefish are spiders for they are not the least like them. It's no use hiding things. They are sure to come to light. And so it is with the heart. Its purposes will out. If the heart is enraged, the dark veins stand out on the forehead. If the heart is grieved, tears rise to the eyes. If the heart is joyous, dimples appear in the cheeks. If the heart is merry, the face smiles. Thus it is that the face reflects the emotions of the heart. It is not because the eyes are filled with tears that the heart is sad nor because the veins stand out on the forehead that the heart is enraged. It is the heart which leads the way in everything. All the important sensations of the heart are apparent in the outward appearance. In the great learning of Koshi, it is written, 
the truth of what is within appears upon the surface. How then is the heart a thing which can be hidden? To answer when reproved, to hum tunes when scolded, show a diseased heart, and if this disease is not quickly taken in hand, it will become chronic, and the remedy become difficult. Perhaps the disease may be so virulent that even Giba and Henjaku, footnote, two famous Indian and Chinese physicians, end of footnote, in consultation could not effect a cure. So before the disease has gained strength, I invite you to the study of the moral essays entitled Shingaku, The Learning of the Heart. If you once arrive at the possession of your heart as it was originally by nature, what an admirable thing that will be. In that case, your conscience will point out to you even the slightest wrong bias or selfishness. While upon this subject, I may tell you a story which was related to me by a friend of mine. It is a story which the master of a certain money-changer's shop used to be very fond of telling. An important part of a money-changer's business is to distinguish between good and bad gold and silver. In the different establishments, the ways of teaching the apprentices this art vary. However, the plan adopted by the money-changer was as follows. At first he would show them no bad silver, but would daily put before them good money only. When they had become thoroughly familiar with the sight of good money, if he stealthily put a little base coin among the good, he found that they would detect it immediately. They saw it as plainly as you see things when you throw light on a mirror. This faculty of detecting base money at a glance was the result of having learned thoroughly to understand good money. Having once been taught in this way, the apprentices would not make a mistake about a piece of base coin during their whole lives, as I have heard. I can't vouch for the truth of this, but it is very certain that the principle applied to moral instruction is an excellent one. It is a most safe mode of study. However, I was further told that if, after having thus learned to distinguish good money, a man followed some other trade for six months or a year, and gave up handling money, he would become just like any other inexperienced person, unable to distinguish the good from the base. Please reflect upon this attentively. If you once render yourself familiar with the nature of the uncorrupted heart, from that time forth you will be immediately conscious of the slightest inclination towards bias or selfishness. And why? Because the natural heart is illumined. When a man has once learned that which is perfect, he will never consent to accept that which is imperfect. But if, after having acquired this knowledge, he again keeps his natural heart at a distance, and gradually forgets to recognize that which is perfect, he finds himself in the dark again, and that he can no longer distinguish base money from good. I beg you to take care. If a man falls into bad habits, he is no longer able to perceive the difference between the good impulses of his natural heart and the evil impulses of his corrupt heart. With this benighted heart as a starting point, he can carry out none of his intentions, and he has to lift his shoulders sighing and sighing again, a creature much to be pitied indeed. Then he loses all self-reliance, so that, although it would be better for him to hold his tongue and say nothing about it, if he is in the slightest trouble or distress, he goes and confesses the crookedness of his heart to every man he meets. What a wretched state for a man to be in! For this reason, I beg you to learn thoroughly the true silver of the heart, in order that you may make no mistake about the base coin. I pray that you and I, during our whole lives, may never leave the path of true principles. I have an amusing story to tell you in connection with this, if you will be so good as to listen. Once upon a time, when the autumn nights were beginning to grow chilly, five or six tradesmen in easy circumstances had assembled together to have a chat, and having got ready their picnic box and wine flask, went off to a temple on the hills, where a friendly priest lived, that they might listen to the stags roaring. With this intention they went to call upon the priest, and borrowed the guest's apartments. Footnote. All the temples in China and Japan have guest's apartments, which may be secured for a trifle, either for a long or short period. It is false to suppose that there is any desecration of a sacred shrine in the act of using it as a hostelry, it is the custom of the country. End of footnote. Of the monastery. And as they were waiting to hear the deer roar, some of the party began to compose poetry. One would write a verse of Chinese poetry, and another would write a verse of seventeen syllables. And as they were passing the wine cup, the hour of sunset came, but not a deer had uttered a call. Eight o'clock came, and ten o'clock came. Still not a sound from the deer. What can this mean? said one. The deer surely ought to be roaring. 
but in spite of their waiting, the deer would not roar. At last the friends got sleepy, and, bored with writing songs and verses, began to yawn, and gave up twaddling about the woes and troubles of life. And as they were all silent, one of them, a man fifty years of age, stopping the circulation of the wine cup, said, Well, certainly, gentlemen, thanks to you we have spent the evening in very pleasant conversation. However, although I am enjoying myself mightily in this way, my people at home must be getting anxious, and so I begin to think that we ought to leave off drinking. Why so? said the others. Well, I'll tell you. You know that my only son is twenty-two years of age this year, and a troublesome fellow he is, too. When I'm at home, he lends a hand sulkily enough in the shop, but as soon as he no longer sees the shadow of me, he hoists sail and is off to some bad haunt. Although our relations and connections are always preaching to him, not a word has any more effect than wind blowing into a horse's ear. When I think that I shall have to leave my property to such a fellow as that, it makes my heart grow small indeed. Although, thanks to those whom I have succeeded, I want for nothing. Still, when I think of my son, I shed tears of blood night and day. And as he said this with a sigh, a man of some forty-five or forty-six years said, No, no, although you make so much of your misfortunes, your son is but a little extravagant after all. There's no such great cause for grief there. I've got a very different story to tell. Of late years, my shopmen, for one reason or another, have been running me into debt, thinking nothing of a debt of fifty or seventy ounces, and so the ledgers get all wrong. Just think of that. Here have I been keeping these fellows ever since they were little children unable to blow their own noses, and now as soon as they come to be a little useful in the shop, they begin running up debts, and are no good whatever to their master. You see, you only have to spend your money upon your own son. Then another gentleman said, Well, I think that to spend money upon your shop people is no such great hardship after all. Now I've been in something like trouble lately. I can't get a penny out of my customers. One man owes me fifteen ounces. Another owes me twenty-five ounces. Really, that is enough to make a man feel as if his heart was worn away. When he had finished speaking, an old gentleman who was sitting opposite, playing with his fan, said, Certainly, gentlemen, your grievances are not without cause. Still, to be perpetually asked for a little money, or to back a bill by one's relations or friends, and to have a lot of hangers-on dependent on one, as I have, is a worse case still. But before the old gentleman had half finished speaking, his neighbor called out, No, no, all you gentlemen are in luxury compared to me. Please listen to what I have to suffer. My wife and my mother can't hit it off anyhow. All day long they're like a couple of cows butting at one another with their horns. The house is as unendurable as if it were full of smoke. I often think it will be better to send my wife back to her village. But then I've got two little children. If I interfere and take my wife's part, my mother gets low-spirited. If I scold my wife, she says that I treat her so brutally because she's not of the same flesh and blood. And then she hates me. The trouble and anxiety are beyond description. I'm like a post stuck up between them. And so they all twaddled away in chorus, each about his own troubles. At last, one of the gentlemen, recollecting himself, said, Well, gentlemen, certainly the deer ought to be roaring, but we've been so engrossed with our conversation that we don't know whether we have missed hearing them or not. With this, he pulled aside the sliding door of the veranda and looked out, and lo and behold, a great big stag was standing perfectly silent in front of the garden. Hello, said the man to the deer, what's this? Since you've been there all the time, why did you not roar? Then the stag answered, with an innocent face, Oh! I came here to listen to the lamentations of you gentlemen. Isn't that a funny story? Old and young, men and women, rich and poor, never cease grumbling from morning till night. All this is the result of a diseased heart. In short, for the sake of a very trifling inclination or selfish pursuit, they will do any wrong in order to effect that which is impossible. This is want of judgment, and this brings all sorts of trouble upon the world. If once you gain possession of a perfect heart, knowing that which is impossible to be impossible, and recognizing that that which is difficult is difficult, you will not attempt to spare yourself trouble unduly. What says the Qin Yo? Footnote. The second book of Confucius. End of footnote. The wise man, whether his lot be cast amongst rich or poor, amongst barbarians or in sorrow, understands his position by his own instinct. If men do not understand this, they think that the causes of pain and pleasure are in the body. Putting the heart on one side, they earnestly strive after the comforts of the body, 
and launch into extravagance, the end of which is mightily parsimony. Instead of pleasure, they meet with grief of the heart, and pass their lives in weeping and wailing. In one way or another, everything in this world depends upon the heart. I implore every one of you to take heed that tears fall not to your lot. End of section 40 Section 41 of Tales of Old Japan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Avai in April 2011. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Appendix A. Part 1. An Account of the Harakiri from a rare Japanese manuscript. Seppuku harakiri is the mode of suicide adopted amongst samurai when they have no alternative but to die. Some there are who thus commit suicide of their own free will, others there are who, having committed some crime which does not put them outside the pale of the privileges of the samurai class, are ordered by the superiors to put an end to their own lives. It is needless to say that it is absolutely necessary that the principal, the witnesses, and the seconds who take part in the affair should be acquainted with all the ceremonies to be observed. A long time ago, a certain daimyo invited a number of persons, versed in the various ceremonies, to call upon him to explain the different forms to be observed by the official witnesses, who inspect and verify the head, etc., and then to instruct him in the ceremonies to be observed in the act of suicide. Then he showed all these rites to his son and to all his retainers. Another person has said that as the ceremonies to be gone through by principal, witnesses and seconds are all very important matters, men should familiarize themselves with a thing which is so terrible in order that, should the time come for them to take part in it, they may not be taken by surprise. The witnesses go to see and certify the suicide. For seconds, men are wanted who have distinguished themselves in the military arts. In old days, men used to bear these things in mind, but nowadays the fashion is to be ignorant of such ceremonies, and if upon rare occasions a criminal is handed over to a daimyo's charge that he may perform harakiri, it often happens at the time of execution that there is no one among all the prince's retainers who is competent to act as second, in which case a man has to be engaged in a hurry from some other quarter to cut off the head of the criminal, and for that day he changes his name and becomes a retainer of the prince, either of the middle or lowest class, and the affair is entrusted to him, and so the difficulty is got over nor is this considered to be a disgrace. It is a great breach of decorum if the second, who is a most important officer, commits any mistake, such as not striking off the head at a blow, in the presence of the witnesses sent by the government. On this account a skilful person must be employed, and, to hide the unmanliness of his own people, a prince must perform the ceremony in this imperfect manner. Every samurai should be able to cut off a man's head, therefore to have to employ a stranger to act as second is to incur the charge of ignorance of the acts of war and is a bitter mortification. However, young men, trusting to their youthful ardor, are apt to be careless and are certain to make a mistake. Some people there are who, not lacking in skill on ordinary occasions, lose their presence of mind in public, and cannot do themselves justice. It is all the more important, therefore, as the act occurs but rarely, that men who are liable to be called upon to be either principals or seconds or witnesses in the harakiri should constantly be examined in their skill as swordsmen and should be familiar with all the rites, in order that when the time comes they may not lose their presence of mind. According to one authority, capital punishment may be divided into two kinds, beheading and strangulation. 
the ceremony of harakiri was added afterwards in the case of persons belonging to the military class being condemned to death this was first instituted in the days of the ashikaga dynasty footnote ashikaga third dynasty of shoguns flourished from anno domini 1336 to 1568 the practice of suicide by disemboweling is of great antiquity this is the time when the ceremonies attending it were invented End footnote. at that time the country was in a state of utter confusion and there were men who although fighting were neither guilty of high treason nor of infidelity to their feudal lords but who by the chances of war were taken prisoners to drag out such men as these bound as criminals and cut their heads off was intolerably cruel accordingly men hit upon a ceremonious mode of suicide by disemboweling in order to comfort the departed spirit even at present where it becomes necessary to put to death a man who has been guilty of some act not unworthy of a samurai at the time of the execution witnesses are sent to the house and the criminal having bathed and put on new clothes in obedience to the commands of his superiors puts an end to himself but does not on that account forfeit his rank as a samurai this is a law for which in all truth men should be grateful on the preparation of the place of execution in old days the ceremony of harakiri used to be performed in a temple in the third year of the period called kanye anno domini sixteen twenty six a certain person having been guilty of treason was ordered to disembowel himself on the fourteenth day of the first month in the temple of kichi joji at komagome in yedo eighteen years later the retainer of a certain daimyo having had a dispute with a sailor belonging to an osaka coasting ship killed the sailor and an investigation having been made into the matter by the governor of osaka the retainer was ordered to perform harakiri on the twentieth day of the sixth month in the temple called sokuzanji in osaka during the period shoho middle of seventeenth century a certain man having been guilty of heinous misconduct performed harakiri in the temple called shimpukuji in the koji street of yedo on the fourth day of the fifth month of the second year of the period meireki anno domini 1656 a certain man for having avenged the death of his cousin's husband at a place called shimitsudani in the koji street disembowelled himself in the temple called honseiji on the twenty-sixth day of the sixth month of the eighth year of the period yempo anno domini sixteen eighty at the funeral ceremonies in honour of the anniversary of the death of genyuin sama a former shogun naito itsumi no kami having a cause of hatred against nagai shinano no kami killed him at one blow with a short sword in the main hall of the temple called sojoji the burial place of the shoguns in yedo itsumi no kami was arrested by the officers present and on the following day performed harakiri at kiridoshi in the temple called seiryuji in modern times the ceremony has taken place at night either in the palace or in the garden of a daimyo to whom the condemned man has been given in charge whether it takes place in the palace or in the garden depends upon the rank of the individual daimyos and hatamotos as a matter of course and the higher retainers of the shogun disembowel themselves in the palace retainers of lower rank should do so in the garden in the case of vassals of feudatories according to the rank of their families those who being above the grade of captains carry the baton should perform the harakiri in the palace all others in the garden footnote a baton with a tassel of paper strips used for giving directions in wartime End footnote. if when the time comes the person engaged in the ceremony are in any doubt as to the proper rules to be followed 
they should inquire of competent persons and settle the question. At the beginning of the 18th century, during the period Genroku, when Asano Takumi no Kami disemboweled himself in the palace of a daimyo called Tamura, as the whole thing was sudden and unexpected, the garden was covered with matting, and on the top of this thick mats were laid, and a carpet, and the affair was concluded so. But there are people who say that it was wrong to treat the daimyo thus, as if he had been an ordinary samurai. But it is said that in old times it was the custom that the ceremony should take place upon a leather carpet spread in the garden, and further, that the proper place is inside a picket fence tied together in the garden. So it is wrong for persons who are only acquainted with one form of the ceremony to accuse Tamura of having acted improperly. If, however, the object was to save the house from the pollution of blood, then the accusation of ill-will may well be brought, for the preparation of the place is of great importance. Formerly it was the custom that, for personages of importance, the enclosure within the picket fence should be of thirty-six feet square. An entrance was made to the south, and another to the north. The door to the south was called Shugiyomon, the door of the practice of virtue. That to the north was called Umbanmon, the door of the warm basin. Footnote. No Japanese authority that I have been able to consult gives any explanation of this singular name. End footnote. Two mats with white binding were arranged in the shape of a hammer, the one at right angles to the other, six feet of white silk, four feet broad, were stretched on the mat, which was placed lengthwise. At the four corners were erected four posts for curtains. In front of the two mats was erected a portal, eight feet high by six feet broad, in the shape of the portals in front of temples, made of a fine sort of bamboo, wrapped in white silk. Footnote. White, in China and Japan, is the color of mourning. End footnote. White curtains four feet broad were hung at the four corners, and four flags six feet long on which should be inscribed four quotations from the sacred books. These flags, it is said, were immediately after the ceremony carried away to the grave. At night two lights were placed, one upon either side of the two mats. The candles were placed in saucers upon stands of bamboo, four feet high, wrapped in white silk. The person who was to disembowel himself, entering the picket fence by the north entrance, took his place upon the white silk upon the mat facing the north. Some there were, however, who said that he should sit facing the west. In that case, the whole place must be prepared accordingly. The seconds enter the enclosure by the south entrance, at the same time as the principal enters by the north, and take their places on the mat that is placed crosswise. Nowadays, when the harakiri is performed inside the palace, a temporary place is made on purpose, either in the garden or in some unoccupied spot. But if the criminal is to die on the day on which he is given in charge, or on the next day, the ceremony, having to take place so quickly, is performed in the reception room. Still, even if there is a lapse of time between the period of giving the prisoner in charge and the execution, it is better that the ceremony should take place in a decent room in the house than in a place made on purpose. If it is heard that, for fear of dirtying his house, a man has made a place expressly, he will be blamed for it. It surely can be no disgrace to the house of a soldier that he was ordered to perform the last offices towards a samurai who died by harakiri. To slay his enemy against whom he has cause of hatred, and then to kill himself, is the part of a noble samurai, and it is sheer nonsense to look upon the place where he has disemboweled himself as polluted. In the beginning of the 18th century, 17 of the retainers of Asano Takumi no Kami performed harakiri in the garden of a palace at Shirokane in Yedo. 
When it was over, the people of the palace called upon the priests of a sect named Shugenja to come and purify the place. But when the lord of the palace heard this, he ordered the place to be left as it was, for what need was there to purify a place where faithful samurai had died by their own hand? But in other places to which the remainder of the retainers of Takumi no Kami were entrusted, it is said that the places of execution were purified. But the people of that day praised Kumamoto Ko, the prince of Higo, to whom the palace at Shirokane belonged. It is a currish thing to look upon death in battle or by harakiri as a pollution. This is a thing to bear in mind. In modern times, the place of harakiri is 18 feet square in all cases. In the center is a place to sit upon, and the condemned man is made to sit facing the witnesses. At other times, he is placed with his side to the witnesses. This is according to the nature of the spot. In some cases, the seconds turn their backs to the witnesses. It is open to question, however, whether this is not a breach of etiquette. The witnesses should be consulted upon these arrangements. If the witnesses have no objection, the condemned man should be placed directly opposite to them. The place where the witnesses are seated should be removed more than 12 or 18 feet from the condemned man. The place from which the sentence is read should also be close by. The writer has been furnished with a plan of the harakiri as it is performed at present. Although the ceremony is gone through in other ways also, still it is more convenient to follow the manner indicated. If the execution takes place in a room, a kerchief of five breadths of white cotton cloth or a quilt should be laid down, and it is also said that two mats should be prepared. However, as there are already mats in the room, there is no need for special mats. Two red rugs should be spread all over, sewed together, one on the top of the other, for if the white cotton cloth be used alone, the blood will soak through onto the mats. Therefore, it is right the rugs should be spread. On the twenty-third day of the eighth month of the fourth year of the period Yen Ki Yo, Anno Domini 1740, at the harakiri of a certain person, there were laid down a white cloth, eight feet square, and on that a quilt of light green cotton, six feet square, and on that a cloth of white hemp, six feet square, and on that two rugs. On the third day of the ninth month of the ninth year of the period Tempo, Anno Domini 1838, at the harakiri of a certain person, it is said that there was spread a large double cloth of white cotton, and on that two rugs. But of these two occasions, the first must be commended for its careful preparation. If the execution be at night, candlesticks of white wood should be placed at each of the four corners, lest the seconds be hindered in their work. In the place where the witnesses are to sit, ordinary candlesticks should be placed, according to etiquette, but an excessive illumination is not decorous. Two screens covered with white paper should be set up, behind the shadow of which are concealed the dirk upon a tray, a bucket to hold the head after it has been cut off, an incense burner, a pail of water, and a basin. The above rules apply equally to the ceremonies observed when the harakiri takes place in a garden. In the latter case, the place is hung round with a white curtain, which need not be new for the occasion. Two mats, a white cloth, and a rug are spread. If the execution is at night, lanterns of white paper are placed on bamboo poles at the four corners. The sentence having been read inside the house, the persons engaged in the ceremony proceed to the place of execution. But, according to circumstances, the sentence may be read at the place itself. In the case of Asano Takumi no Kami, the sentence was read out in the house, and he afterwards performed harakiri in the garden. On the third day of the fourth month of the fourth year of the period Tenmai, Anno Domini 1784, 
a hatamoto named sano having received his sentence in the supreme courthouse disembowelled himself in the garden in front of the prison when the ceremony takes place in the garden matting must be spread all the way to the place so that sandals need not be worn the reason for this is that some men in that position suffer from a rush of blood to the head from nervousness so their sandals might slip off their feet without their being aware of their loss and as this would have a very bad appearance it is better to spread matting care must be taken lest in spreading the matting a place be left where two mats join against which the foot might trip the white screens and other things are prepared as has been directed above if any curtailment is made it must be done as well as circumstances will permit according to the crime of which a man who is handed over to any daimyo's charge is guilty it is known whether he will have to perform harakiri and the preparations should be made accordingly asano takumi no kami was taken to the palace of tamura sama at the hour of the monkey between three and five in the afternoon took off his dress of ceremony partook of a bowl of soup and five dishes and drank two cups of warm water and at the hour of the cock between five and seven in the evening disembowelled himself a case of this kind requires much attention for great care should be taken that the preparations be carried on without the knowledge of the principal if a temporary room has been built expressly for the occasion to avoid pollution of the house it should be kept a secret it once happened that a criminal was received in charge at the palace of a certain nobleman and when his people were about to erect a temporary building for the ceremony they wrote to consult some of the parties concerned the letter ran as follows the house in which we live is very small and inconvenient in all respects we have ordered the guard to treat our prisoner with all respect but our retainers who are placed on guard are much inconvenienced for want of space besides in the event of fire breaking out or any extraordinary event taking place the place is so small that it would be difficult to get out we are thinking therefore of adding an apartment to the original building so that the guard may be able at all times to go in and out freely and that if in case of fire or otherwise we should have to leave the house we may do so easily we beg to consult you upon this point when a samurai has to perform harakiri by the command of his own feudal lord the ceremony should take place in one of the lesser palaces of the clan once upon a time a certain prince of the inuye clan having a just cause of offence against his steward who was called ishikawa tozayemon and wishing to punish him caused him to be killed in his principal palace at kandabashi in yedo when this matter was reported to the shogun having been convicted of disrespect of the privileges of the city he was ordered to remove to his lesser palace at asakusa now although the harakiri cannot be called properly an execution still as it only differs from an ordinary execution in that by it the honor of the samurai is not affected it is only a question of degree it is a matter of ceremonial if the principal palace is a long distance from the shogun's castle then the harakiri may take place there but there can be no objection whatever to its taking place in a minor palace footnote the principal yashikis palaces of the nobles are for the most part immediately round the shogun's castle in the enclosure known as the official quarter their proximity to the palace forbids their being made the scenes of executions and footnote nowadays when a man is condemned to harakiri by a daimyo the ceremony usually takes place in one of the lesser palaces the place commonly selected is an open space near the horse exercising ground and the preparations which i have described above are often shortened according to circumstances when a retainer is suddenly ordered to perform harakiri during a journey 
a temple or shrine should be hired for the occasion. On these hurried occasions, coarsed mats, faced with finer matting or common mats, may be used. If the criminal is of rank to have an armor-bearer, a carpet of skin should be spread, should one be easily procurable. The straps of the skin, which are at the head, should, according to old custom, be to the front, so that the fur may point backwards. In old days, when the ceremony took place in a garden, a carpet of skin was spread. To hire a temple for the purpose of causing a man to perform harakiri was a frequent occurrence. It is doubtful whether it may be done at the present time. This sort of question should be referred beforehand to some competent person that the course to be adopted may be clearly understood. In the period Kambun, Anno Domini 1661 to 1673, a prince Sakai, travelling through the Bishu territory, hired a temple or shrine for one of his retainers to disembowel himself in, and so the affair was concluded. On the ceremonies observed at the harakiri of a person given in charge to a daimyo. When a man has been ordered by the government to disembowel himself, the public censors, who have been appointed to act as witnesses, write to the prince who has the criminal in charge to inform them that they will go to his palace on public business. This message is written directly to the chief and is sent by an assistant censor, and a suitable answer is returned to it. Before the ceremony, the witnesses send an assistant censor to see the place and look at the plan of the house, and to take a list of the names of the persons who are to be present. He also has an interview with the kaishaku, or seconds, and examines them upon the way of performing the ceremonies. When all the preparations have been made, he goes to fetch the censors, and they all proceed together to the place of execution, dressed in their hempen cloth dress of ceremony. The retainers of the palace are collected to do obeisance in the entrance yard, and the lord to whom the criminal has been entrusted goes as far as the front porch to meet the censors and conducts them to the front reception room. The chief censor then announces to the lord of the palace that he has come to read out the sentence of such and one who has been condemned to perform harakiri, and that the second censor has come to witness the execution of the sentence. The lord of the palace then inquires whether he is expected to attend the execution in person, and, if any of the relations or family of the criminal should beg to receive his remains, whether their request should be complied with. After this he announces that he will order everything to be made ready, and leaves the room. Tea, a firebox for smoking, and sweetmeats are set before the censors but they decline to accept any hospitality until their business shall have been concluded. The minor officials follow the same rule. If the censors express a wish to see the place of execution, the retainers of the palace show the way, and their lord accompanies them. In this, however, he may be replaced by one of his caro or counsellors. They then return and take their seats in the reception room. After this, when all the preparations have been made, the master of the house leads the censors to the place where the sentence is to be read, and it is etiquette that they should wear both sword and dirk. Footnote. A Japanese removes his sword on entering a house, retaining only his dirk. End footnote. The lord of the palace takes his place on one side, the inferior censors sit on either side in a lower place. The councillors and other officers of the palace also take their places. One of the councillors present, addressing the censors without moving from his place, asks whether he shall bring forth the prisoner. Previously to this, the retainers of the palace, going to the room where the prisoner is confined, inform him that, as the censors have arrived, he should change his dress, and the attendants bring out a change of clothes upon a large tray. 
it is when he has finished his toilet that the witnesses go forth and take their places in the appointed order and the principal is then introduced he is preceded by one man who should be of the rank of monogashira retainer of the fourth rank who wears a dirk but no sword six men act as attendants they should be of the fifth or sixth rank they walk on either side of the principal they are followed by one man who should be of the rank of yonin counsellor of the second class when they reach the place the leading man draws on one side and sits down and the six attendants sit down on either side of the principal the officer who follows him sits down behind him and the chief censor reads the sentence when the reading of the sentence is finished the principal leaves the room and again changes his clothes and the chief censor immediately leaves the palace but the lord of the palace does not conduct him to the door the second censor returns to the reception room until the principal has changed his clothes when the principal has taken his seat at the place of execution the councillors of the palace announce to the second censor that all is ready he then proceeds to the place wearing his sword and dirk the lord of the palace also wearing his sword and dirk takes his seat on one side the inferior censors and councillors sit in front of the censor they wear the dirk only the assistant second brings a dirk upon a tray and having placed it in front of the principal withdraws on one side when the principal leans his head forward his chief second strikes off his head which is immediately shown to the censor who identifies it and tells the master of the palace that he is satisfied and thanks him for all his trouble the corpse as it lies is hidden by a white screen which is set up around it and incense is brought out the witnesses leave the place the lord of the palace accompanies them as far as the porch and the retainers prostrate themselves in the yard as before the retainers who should be present at the place of execution are one or two councillors karo two or three second councillors yonin two or three monogashira one chief of the palace Ruzui, six attendants one chief second two assistant seconds one man to carry incense who need not be a person of rank any samurai will do they attend to the setting up of the white screen the duty of burying the corpse and of setting the place in order again devolves upon four men these are selected from samurai of the middle or lower class during the performance of their duties they hitch up their trousers and wear neither sword nor dirk their names are previously sent in to the censor who acts as witness and to the junior censors should they desire it before the arrival of the chief censor the requisite utensils for extinguishing a fire are prepared firemen are engaged and officers constantly go the rounds to watch against fire footnote in japan where fires are of daily occurrence the fire buckets and other utensils form part of the gala dress of the house of a person of rank End footnote. from the time when the chief censor comes into the house until he leaves it no one is allowed to enter the premises the servants on guard at the entrance porch should wear their hempen dresses of ceremony everything in the palace should be conducted with decorum and the strictest attention paid in all things when any one is condemned to harakiri it would be well that people should go to the palace of the prince of higo and learn what transpired at the execution of the ronins of asano takumi no kami a curtain was hung round the garden in front of the reception room three mats were laid down and upon these was placed a white cloth the condemned men were kept in the reception room and summoned one by one two men one on each side accompanied them the second followed behind and they proceeded together to the place of execution when the execution was concluded in each case the corpse was hidden from the sight of the chief witness by a white screen 
folded up in white cloth, placed on a mat, and carried off to the rear by two foot soldiers. It was then placed in a coffin. The blood-stained ground was sprinkled with sand and swept clean. Fresh mats were laid down, and the place prepared anew, after which the next man was summoned to come forth. End of section 41 Section 42 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Awaii in April 2011. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Appendix A, Part 2 on certain things to be borne in mind by the witnesses. When a clansman is ordered by his feudal lord to perform harakiri, the sentence must be read out by the censor of the clan, who also acts as witness. He should take his place in front of the criminal, at a distance of twelve feet, according to some books the distance should be eighteen feet, and he should sit obliquely, not facing the criminal. He should lay his sword down by his side, but, if he pleases, he may wear it in his girdle. He must read out the sentence distinctly. If the sentence be a long document, to begin reading in a very loud voice, and afterwards drop into a whisper, has an appearance of faint-heartedness, but to read it throughout in a low voice is worse still. It should be delivered clearly from beginning to end. It is the duty of the chief witness to set an example of fortitude to the other persons who are to take part in the execution. When the second has finished his work, he carries the head to the chief witness, who, after inspecting it, must declare that he has identified it. He then should take his sword and leave his place. It is sufficient, however, that the head should be struck off without being carried to the chief witness, in that case, the second receives his instructions beforehand. On rising, the chief witness should step out with his left foot and turn to the left. If the ceremony takes place out of doors, the chief witness, wearing his sword and dirk, should sit upon a box. He must wear his hempen dress of ceremony. He may hitch his trousers up slightly. According to his rank, he may wear his full dress, that is, wings over his full dress. It is the part of the chief witness to instruct the seconds and others in the duties which they have to perform, and also to preconcert measures in the event of any mishap occurring. If whilst the various persons to be engaged in the ceremony are rubbing up their military lore and preparing themselves for the event, any other person should come in, they should immediately turn the conversation. Persons of the rank of samurai should be familiar with all the details of the harakiri, and to be seen discussing what should be done in the case anything went wrong, and so forth, would have an appearance of ignorance. If, however, an intimate friend should go to the place, rather than have any painful concealment, he may be consulted upon the whole affair. When the sentence has been read, it is probable that the condemned man will have some last words to say to the chief witness. It must depend on the nature of what he has to say, whether it will be received or not. If he speaks in a confused or bewildered manner, no attention is paid to it. His second should lead him away, of his own accord or at a sign from the chief witness. If the condemned man be a person who has been given in charge to a prince by the government, the prince, after reading of the sentence, should send his retainers to the prisoner with a message to say that the decrees of the government are not to be eluded, but that if he has any last wishes to express, they are ordered by their lord to receive them. If the prisoner is a man of high rank, the lord of the palace should go in person to hear his last wishes. The condemned man should answer in the following way. Sir, I thank you for your careful consideration, but I have nothing that I wish to say. 
I am greatly indebted to you for the great kindness which I have received since I have been under your charge. I beg you to take my respects to your lord and to the gentlemen of your clan who have treated me so well. Or, he may say, Sirs, I have nothing to say. Yet, since you are so kind as to think of me, I should be obliged if you would deliver such and such a message to such and one. This is the proper and becoming sort of speech for the occasion. If the prisoner entrusts them with any message, the retainers should receive it in such a manner as to set his mind at rest. Should he ask for writing materials in order to write a letter, as this is forbidden by the law, they should tell him so, and not grant his request. Still they must feel that it is painful to refuse the request of a dying man, and must do their best to assist him. They must exhaust every available kindness and civility, as was done in the period Genroku in the case of the Ronins of Asano Takumi no Kami. The Prince of Higo, after the sentence had been read, caused paper and writing materials to be taken to their room. If the prisoner is light-headed from excitement, it is no use furnishing him with writing materials. It must depend upon circumstances, but when a man has murdered another, having made up his mind to abide by the consequences, then that man's execution should be carried through with all honour. When a man kills another on the spot, in a fit of ungovernable passion, and then is bewildered and dazed by his own act, the same pains need not be taken to conduct matters punctiliously. If the prisoner be a careful man, he will take an early opportunity, after he has been given in charge, to express his wishes. To carry kindness so far as to supply writing materials and the like is not obligatory. If any doubt exists upon the point, the chief witness may be consulted. After the ronins of Asano Takumi no Kami had heard their sentence in the palace of Matsudaira Okinokami, that daimyo in person went and took leave of them, and, calling Oishi Chikara, the son of their chief, to him, said, Footnote Oishi Chikara was separated from his father, who was one of the seventeen delivered over to the charge of the prince of Higo. End footnote. Quote, I have heard that your mother is at home in your own country. How she will grieve when she hears of your death and that of your father, I can well imagine. If you have any message that you wish to leave for her, tell me, without standing upon ceremony, and I will transmit it without delay. End quote. For a while Chikara kept his head bent down towards the ground. At last he drew back a little and, lifting his head, said, I humbly thank your lordship for what you have been pleased to say. My father warned me from the first that our crime was so great that, even were we to be pardoned by a gracious judgment upon one count, I must not forget that there would be a hundred million counts against us for which we must commit suicide, and that if I disregarded his words, his hatred would pursue me after death. My father impressed this upon me at the temple called Sengakuji, and again when I was separated from him to be taken to the place of Prince Sengoku. Now my father and myself have been condemned to perform harakiri according to the wish of our hearts. Still I cannot forget to think of my mother. When we parted at Kyoto, she told me that our separation would be for long, and she bade me not to play the coward when I thought of her. As I took a long leave of her then, I have no message to send to her now. When he spoke thus, Okinokami and all his retainers, who were drawn up around him, were moved to tears in admiration of his heroism. Although it is right that the condemned man should bathe and partake of wine and food, these details should be curtailed. Even should he desire these favours, it must depend upon his conduct whether they be granted or refused. He should be caused to die as quickly as possible. Should he wish for some water to drink, it should be given to him. If in his talk he should express himself like a noble samurai, all pains should be exhausted in carrying out his execution. 
Yet, however careful a man he may be, as he nears his death, his usual demeanor will undergo a change. If the execution is delayed, in all probability it will cause the prisoner's courage to fail him. Therefore, as soon as the sentence shall have been passed, the execution should be brought to a conclusion. This, again, is a point for the chief witness to remember. Concerning Seconds Kaishaku. When the condemned man is one who has been given in charge for execution, six attendants are employed. When the execution is within the clan, then two or three attendants will suffice. The number, however, must depend upon the rank of the principal. Men of great nerve and strength must be selected for the office. They must wear their hempen dress of ceremony and tuck up their trousers. They must on no account wear either sword or dirk, but have a small poniard hidden in their bosom. These are the officers who attend upon the condemned man when he changes his dress, and who sit by him on the right hand and on the left hand to guard him whilst the sentence is being read. In the event of any mistake occurring, such as the prisoner attempting to escape, they knock him down, and should he be unable to stand or to walk, they help to support him. The attendants accompanying the principal to the place of execution, if they are six in number, four of them take their seats some way off and mount guard, while the other two should sit close behind the principal. They must understand that, should there be any mistake, they must throw the condemned man and, holding him down, cut off his head with their poniard or stab him to death. If the second bungles in cutting off the head and the principal attempts to rise, it is the duty of the attendants to kill him. They must help him to take off his upper garments and bear his body. In recent times, however, there have been cases where the upper garments have not been removed. This depends upon circumstances. The setting up of the white screen and the laying the corpse in the coffin are duties which, although they may be performed by other officers, originally devolved upon the six attendants. When a common man is executed, he is bound with cords, and so made to take his place, but a samurai wears his dress of ceremony, is presented with a dagger, and dies thus. There ought to be no anxiety lest such a man should attempt to escape. Still, as there is no knowing what these six attendants may be called upon to do, men should be selected who thoroughly understand their business. The seconds are three in number, the chief second, the assistant second, and the inferior second. When the execution is carried out with proper solemnity, three men are employed. Still, a second and assistant second are sufficient. If three men serve as seconds, their several duties are as follows. The chief second strikes off the head. That is his duty. He is the most important officer in the execution by Harakiri. The assistant second brings forward the tray on which is placed the dirk. That is his duty. He must perform his part in such a manner that the principal second is not hindered in his work. The assistant second is the officer of second importance in the execution. The third or inferior second carries the head to the chief witness for identification, and in the event of something suddenly occurring to hinder either of the other two seconds, he should bear in mind that he must be ready to act as his substitute. His is an office of great importance, and a proper person must be selected to fill it. Although there can be no such thing as a kaishaku, second, in any case except in one of harakiri, still in old times guardians and persons who assisted others were also called kaishaku. The reason for this is because the kaishaku, or second, comes to the assistance of the principal. If the principal were to make any mistake at the fatal moment, it would be a disgrace to his dead body. It is in order to prevent such mistakes that the kaishaku, or second, is employed. It is the duty of the kaishaku to consider this as his first duty. When a man is appointed to act as second to another, 
what shall be said of him if he accepts the office with a smiling face? Yet he must not put on a face of distress. It is as well to attempt to excuse oneself from performing the duty. There is no heroism in cutting a man's head off well, and it is a disgrace to do it in a bungling manner. Yet must not a man allege lack of skill as a pretext for evading the office, for it is an unworthy thing that a samurai should want the skill required to behead a man. If there are any that advocate employing young men as seconds, it should rather be said that their hands are inexpert. To play the coward and yield up the office to another man is out of the question. When a man is called upon to perform the office, he should express his readiness to use his sword. The dirk may be employed, but the sword is the proper weapon. As regards the sword, the second should borrow that of the principal. If there is any objection to this, he should receive a sword from his lord, he should not use his own sword. When the assistant seconds have been appointed, the three should take counsel together about the details of the place of execution. When they have been carefully instructed by their superiors in all the ceremonies, and having made careful inquiry, should there be anything wrong, they should appeal to their superiors for instruction. The seconds wear their dresses of ceremony when the criminal is a man given in charge by the government. When he is one of their own clan, they need only wear the trousers of the samurai. In old days, it is said that they were dressed in the same way as the principal, and some authorities assert that at the harakiri of a nobleman of high rank, the seconds should wear white clothes, and that the handle of the sword should be wrapped in white silk. If the execution takes place in the house, they should partially tuck up their trousers. If in the garden, they should tuck them up entirely. The seconds should address the principal and say, Sir, we have been appointed to act as your seconds. We pray you to set your mind at rest, and so forth, but this must depend upon the rank of the criminal. At this time, too, if the principal has any last wish to express, the second should receive it, and should treat him with every consideration in order to relieve his anxiety. If the second has been selected by the principal on account of old friendship between them, or if the latter, during the time that he has been in charge, has begged some special retainer of the palace to act as his second in the event of his being condemned to death, the person so selected should thank the principal for choosing so unworthy a person, and promise to beg his lord to allow him to act as second. So he should answer and comfort him, and, having reported the matter to his lord, should act as second. He should take that opportunity to borrow his principal's sword in some such terms as the following. As I am to have the honour of being your second, I would fain borrow your sword for the occasion. It may be a consolation to you to perish by your own sword, with which you are familiar. If, however, the principal declines and prefers to be executed with the second's sword, his wish must be complied with. If the second should make an awkward cut with his own sword, it is a disgrace to him. Therefore, he should borrow someone else's sword, so that the blame may rest with the sword and not with the swordsman. Although this is the rule, and although every samurai should wear a sword fit to cut off a man's head, still, if the principal has begged to be executed with the second's own sword, it must be done as he desires. It is probable that the condemned man will inquire of his second about the arrangements which have been made. He must attend, therefore, to rendering himself capable of answering all such questions. Once upon a time, when the condemned man inquired of his second whether his head would be cut off at the moment when he received the tray with the dirk upon it, No, replied the second, at the moment when you stab yourself with the dirk, your head will be cut off. At the execution of one Sanu, he told his second that, when he had stabbed himself in the belly, he would utter a cry, and begged him to be cool when he cut off his head. The second replied that he would do as he wished, but begged him in the meantime to take the tray with the dirk, according to proper form. 
when Sano reached out his hand to take the tray, the second cut off his head immediately. Now, although this was not exactly right, still, as the second acted so in order to save a samurai from the disgrace of performing the harakiri improperly, by crying out, it can never be wrong for a second to act kindly. If the principal urgently requests to be allowed really to disembowel himself, this wish may, according to circumstances, be granted, but in this case care must be taken that no time be lost in striking off the head. The custom of striking off the head, the prisoner only going through the semblance of disembowelling himself, dates from the period Yempo, about 190 years ago. When the principal has taken his place, the second strips his right shoulder of the dress of ceremony, which he allows to fall behind his sleeve, and, drawing his sword, lays down the scabbard, taking care that his weapon is not seen by the principal. Then he takes his place on the left of the principal and close behind him. The principal should sit facing the west, and the second facing the north, and in that position should he strike the blow. When the second perceives the assistant second bring out the tray on which is laid the dirk, he must brace up his nerves and settle his heart beneath his navel. When the tray is laid down, he must put himself in position to strike the blow. He should step out first with the left foot, and then change so as to bring his right foot forward. This is the position which he should assume to strike. He may, however, reverse the position of his feet. When the principal removes his upper garments, the second must poise his sword. When the principal reaches out his hand to draw the tray towards him, as he leans his head forward a little, is the exact moment for the second to strike. There are all sorts of traditions about this. Some say that the principal should take the tray and raise it respectfully to his head and set it down, and that this is the moment to strike. There are three rules for the time of cutting off the head. The first is when the dark is laid on the tray. The second is when the principal looks at the left side of his belly before inserting the dark. The third is when he inserts the dark. If these three moments are allowed to pass, it becomes a difficult matter to cut off the head, so says tradition. However, four moments for cutting are also recorded. First, when the assistant second retires after having laid down the stand on which is the dirk. Second, when the principal draws the stand towards him. Third, when he takes the dirk in his hand. Fourth, when he makes the incision into the belly. Although all four ways are approved, still the first is too soon, the last three are right and proper. In short, the blow should be struck without delay. If he has struck off the head at a blow without failure, the second, taking care not to raise his sword, but holding it point downwards, should retire backward a little and wipe his weapon, kneeling. He should have plenty of white paper ready in his girdle or in his bosom to wipe away the blood and rub up his sword. Having replaced his sword in its scabbard, he should readjust his upper garments and take his seat to the rear. When the head has fallen, the junior second should enter, and, taking up the head, present it to the witness for inspection. When he has identified it, the ceremony is concluded. If there is no assistant or junior second, the second, as soon as he has cut off the head, carrying his sword reversed in his left hand, should take the head in his right hand, holding it by the top knot of hair, should advance towards the witness, passing on the right side of the corpse, and show the right profile of the head to the witness, resting the chin of the head upon the hilt of his sword, and kneeling on his left knee then returning again round by the left of the corpse, kneeling on his left knee, and carrying the head in his left hand, and resting it on the edge of his sword, he should again show the left profile to the witness. It is also laid down as another rule that the second, laying down his sword, should take out paper from the bosom of his dress, 
and placing the head in the palm of his left hand and taking the top knot of hair in his right hand should lay the head upon the paper and so submit it for inspection either way may be said to be right note to lay down thick paper and place the head on it shows a disposition to pay respect to the head to place it on the edge of the sword is insulting the course pursued must depend upon the rank of the person if the ceremony is to be curtailed it may end with the cutting off of the head that must be settled beforehand in consultation with the witness in the event of the second making a false cut so as not to strike off the head at a blow the second must take the head by the top knot and pressing it down cut it off should he take bad aim and cut the shoulder by mistake and should the principal rise and cry out before he has time to writhe he should hold him down and stab him to death and then cut off his head or the assistant seconds who are sitting behind should come forward and hold him down while the chief second cuts off his head it may be necessary for the second after he has cut off the head to push down the body and then take up the head for inspection if the body does not fall at once which is said to be sometimes the case the second should pull the feet to make it fall there are some who say that the perfect way for the second to cut off the head is not to cut right through the neck at a blow but to leave a little uncut and as the head hangs by the skin to seize the top knot and slice it off and then submit it for inspection the reason of this is lest the head being struck off at a blow the ceremony should be confounded with an ordinary execution according to the old authorities this is the proper and respectful manner after the head is cut off the eyes are apt to blink and the mouth to move and to bite the pebbles and sand this being hateful to see at what amongst samurai is so important an occasion and being a shameful thing it is held to be best not to let the head fall but to hold back a little in delivering the blow perhaps this may be right yet it is a very difficult matter to cut so as to leave the head hanging by a little flesh and there is the danger of missing the cut and as any mistake in the cut is most horrible to see it is better to strike a fair blow at once others say that even when the head is struck off at a blow the semblance of slicing it off should be gone through afterwards yet be it borne in mind that this is unnecessary three methods of carrying the sword are recognized among those skilled in swordsmanship if the rank of the principal be high the sword is raised aloft if the principal and second are of equal rank the sword is carried at the centre of the body if the principal be of inferior rank the sword is allowed to hang downwards the proper position for the second to strike from is kneeling on one knee but there is no harm in his standing up others say that if the execution takes place inside the house the second should kneel if in the garden he should stand these are not points upon which to insist obstinately a man should strike in whatever position is most convenient to him the chief duty for the assistant second to bear in mind is the bringing in of the tray with the dirk which should be produced very quietly when the principal takes his place it should be placed so that the condemned man may have to stretch his hand well out in order to reach it footnote it should be placed about three feet away from him and footnote the assistant second then returns to his own place but if the condemned man shows any signs of agitation the assistant second must lend his assistance so that the head may be properly cut off it once happened that the condemned man having received the tray from the assistant second held it up for a long time without putting it down until those near him had over and over again urged him to set it down it also happens that after the tray has been set down and the assistant second has retired the condemned man does not put out his hand to take it then must the assistant second press him to take it 
also the principal may ask that the tray be placed a little nearer to him, in which case his wish must be granted. The tray may also be placed in such a way that the assistant second, holding it in his left hand, may reach the dirk to the condemned man, who leans forward to take it. Which is the best of all these ways is uncertain. The object to aim at is that the condemned man should lean forward to receive the blow. Whether the assistant second retires or not must depend upon the attitude assumed by the condemned man. If the prisoner be an unruly, violent man, a fan instead of a dirk should be placed upon the tray, and should he object to this, he should be told in answer that the substitution of the fan is an ancient custom. This may occur sometimes. It is said that once upon a time, in one of the places of the daimyos, a certain brave matron murdered a man, and, having been allowed to die with all the honours of the harakiri, a fan was placed upon the tray, and her head was cut off. This may be considered right and proper. If the condemned man appears inclined to be turbulent, the seconds, without showing any sign of alarm, should hurry to his side, and, urging him to get ready, quickly cause him to make all his preparations with speed, and to sit down in his place. The chief second, then drawing his sword, should get ready to strike, and, ordering him to proceed as fast as possible, with the ceremony of receiving the tray, should perform his duty without appearing to be afraid. A certain Prince Katto, having condemned one of his counsellors to death, assisted at the ceremony behind a curtain of slips of bamboo. The counsellor, whose name was Katayama, was bound, and during that time glared fiercely at the curtain, and showed no signs of fear. The chief second was a man named Jihei, who has always been used to treat Katayama with great respect. So Jihei, sword in hand, said to Katayama, Sir, your last moment has arrived. Be so good as to turn your cheek so that your head may be straight. When Katayama heard this, he replied, Fellow, you are insolent. And as he was looking round, Jihei struck the fatal blow. The Lord Kato afterwards inquired of Jihei what was the reason of this, and he replied that, as he saw that the prisoner was meditating treason, he determined to kill him at once and put a stop to his rebellious spirit. This is a pattern for other seconds to bear in mind. When the head has been struck off, it becomes the duty of the junior second to take it up by the top knot and, placing it upon some thick paper laid over the palm of his hand, to carry it for inspection by the witness. This ceremony has been explained above. If the head be bald, he should pierce the left ear with the stiletto carried in the scabbard of his dirk, and so carry it to be identified. He must carry thick paper in the bosom of his dress. Inside the paper he shall place a bag with rice bran and ashes, in order that he may carry the head without being sullied by the blood. When the identification of the head is concluded, the junior second's duty is to place it in a bucket. If anything should occur to hinder the chief second, the assistant second must take his place. It happened on one occasion that before the execution took place, the chief second lost his nerve, yet he cut off the head without any difficulty, but when it came to taking up the head for inspection, his nervousness so far got the better of him as to be extremely inconvenient. This is a thing against which persons acting as seconds have to guard. End of section 42「Section 43 of Tales of Old Japan」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2011. « Tales of Old Japan » by Lord Reedsdale Section 43 Appendix A Part 3 
as a corollary to the above elaborate statement of the ceremonies proper to be observed at the harakiri i may here describe an instance of such an execution which i was sent officially to witness the condemned man was taki sensaburo an officer of the prince of bizen who gave the order to fire upon the foreign settlement at hyogo in the month of february eighteen sixty eight an attack to which i have alluded in the preamble of the story of the eta maiden and the hatamoto up to that time no foreigner had witnessed such an execution which was rather looked upon as a traveller's fable the ceremony which was ordered by the mikado himself took place at ten thirty at night in the temple of seifukuji the headquarters of the satsuma troops at hyogo a witness was sent from each of the foreign legations we were seven foreigners in all we were conducted to the temple by officers of the princess of satsuma in choshu although the ceremony was to be conducted in the most private manner the casual remarks which we overheard in the streets and a crowd lining the principal entrance to the temple showed that it was a matter of no little interest to the public the courtyard of the temple presented a most picturesque sight it was crowded with soldiers standing about in knots round large fires which threw a dim flickering light over the heavy eaves and quaint gable ends of the sacred buildings we were shown into an inner room where we were to wait until the preparation for the ceremony was completed in the next room to us were the high japanese officers after a long interval which seemed doubly long from the silence which prevailed ito shunsuke the provisional governor of hyogo came and took down our names and informed us that seven kenshi sheriffs or witnesses would attend on the part of the japanese he and another officer represented the mikado two captains of satsuma's infantry and two of choshu's with a representative of the prince of bizen the clan of the condemned men completed the number which was probably arranged in order to tally with that of the foreigners ito shunsuke further inquired whether we wished to put any questions to the prisoner we replied in the negative a further delay then ensued after which we were invited to follow the japanese witnesses into the hondo or main hall of the temple where the ceremony was to be performed it was an imposing scene a large hall with a high roof supported by dark pillars of wood from the ceiling hung a profusion of those huge gilt lamps and ornaments peculiar to buddhist temples in front of the high altar where the floor covered with beautiful white mats is raised some three or four inches from the ground was laid a rug of scarlet felt tall candles placed at regular intervals gave out a dim mysterious light just sufficient to let all the proceedings be seen the seven japanese took their places on the left of the raised floor the seven foreigners on the right no other person was present after an interval of a few minutes of anxious suspense taki sensaburo a stalwart man thirty-two years of age with a noble air walked into the hall attired in his dress of ceremony with the peculiar hempen cloth wings which are worn on great occasions he was accompanied by a kaishaku and three officers who wore the jimbaori or war surcoat with gold tissue facings the word kaishaku it should be observed is one to which our word executioner is no equivalent term the office is that of a gentleman in many cases it is performed by a kinsman or friend of the condemned and the relation between them is rather that of principal and second than that of victim and executioner in this instance the kaishaku was a pupil of taki sensaburo and was selected by the friends of the latter from among their own number for his skill in swordsmanship with the kaishaku on his left hand taki sensaburo advanced slowly towards the japanese witnesses and the two bowed before them 
then drawing near to the foreigners they saluted us in the same way perhaps even with more deference in each case the salutation was ceremoniously returned slowly and with great dignity the condemned man mounted on to the raised floor prostrated himself before the high altar twice and seated himself on the felt carpet with his back to the high altar the kaishaku crouching on his left hand side footnote seated himself that is in the japanese fashion his knees and toes touching the ground and his body resting on his heels in this position which is one of respect he remained until his death End footnote. one of the three attendant officers then came forward bearing a stand of the kind used in temples for offerings on which wrapped in paper lay the wakizashi the short sword or dirk of the japanese nine inches and a half in length with a point and an edge as sharp as a razor's this he handed prostrating himself to the condemned man who received it reverently raising it to his head with both hands and placed it in front of himself after another profound obeisance taki sensaburo in a voice which betrayed just so much emotion and hesitation as might be expected from a man who is making a painful confession but with no sign of either in his face or manner spoke as follows i and i alone unwarrantably gave the order to fire on the foreigners at kobe and again as they tried to escape for this crime i disembowel myself and i beg you who are present to do me the honour of witnessing the act bowing once more the speaker allowed his upper garments to slip down to his girdle and remained naked to the waist carefully according to custom he tucked his sleeves under his knees to prevent himself from falling backwards for a noble japanese gentleman should die falling forwards deliberately with a steady hand he took the dirk that lay before him he looked at it wistfully almost affectionately for a moment he seemed to collect his thoughts for the last time and then stabbing himself deeply below the waist on the left hand side he drew the dark slowly across to the right side and turning it in the wound gave a slight cut upwards during this sickeningly painful operation he never moved a muscle of his face when he drew out the dark he leaned forward and stretched out his neck an expression of pain for the first time crossed his face but he uttered no sound at that moment the kaishaku who still crouching by his side had been keenly watching his every movement sprang to his feet poised his sword for a second in the air there was a flash a heavy ugly thud a crashing fall with one blow the head had been severed from the body a dead silence followed broken only by the hideous noise of the blood throbbing out of the inert heap before us which but a moment before had been a brave and chivalrous man. It was horrible. The kaishaku made a low bow, wiped his sword with a piece of paper which he had ready for the purpose, and retired from the raised floor, and the stained dirk was solemnly borne away, a bloody proof of the execution. The two representatives of the Mikado then left their places, and crossing over to where the foreign witnesses sat called us to witness that the sentence of death upon taki sensaburo had been faithfully carried out the ceremony being at an end we left the temple the ceremony to which the place and the hour gave an additional solemnity was characterized throughout by that extreme dignity and punctiliousness which are the distinctive marks of the proceedings of Japanese gentlemen of rank, and it is important to note this fact, because it carries with it the conviction that the dead man was indeed the officer who had committed the crime and no substitute. While profoundly impressed by the terrible scene, it was impossible at the same time not to be filled with admiration of the firm and manly bearing of the sufferer, 
and of the nerve with which the kaishaku performed his last duty to his master nothing could more strongly show the force of education the samurai or gentleman of the military class from his earliest years learns to look upon the harakiri as a ceremony in which some day he may be called upon to play a part as principal or second in old-fashioned families which hold to the traditions of ancient chivalry the child is instructed in the right and familiarized with the idea as an honorable expiration of crime or blotting out of disgrace if the hour comes he is prepared for it and gravely faces an ordeal which early training has robbed of half its horrors in what other country in the world does a man learn that the last tribute of affection which he may have to pay to his best friend may be to act as his executioner since i wrote the above we have heard that before his entry into the fatal hall taki sensaburo called round him all those of his own clan who were present many of whom had carried out his order to fire and addressing them in a short speech acknowledged the heinousness of his crime and the justice of his sentence and warned them solemnly to avoid any repetition of attacks upon foreigners they were also addressed by the officers of the mikado who urged them to bear no ill-will against us on account of the fate of their fellow clansmen they declared that they entertained no such feeling the opinion has been expressed that it would have been politic for the foreign representatives at the last moment to have interceded for the life of taki sensaburo the question is believed to have been debated among the representatives themselves my own belief is that mercy although it might have produced the desired effect among the more civilized clans would have been mistaken for weakness and fear by those wilder people who have not yet a personal knowledge of foreigners the offence an attack upon the flags and subjects of all the treaty powers which lack of skill not of will alone prevented from ending in a universal massacre was the gravest that has been committed upon foreigners since their residence in japan death was undoubtedly deserved and the form chosen was in japanese eyes merciful and yet judicial the crime might have involved the war and cost hundreds of lives it was wiped out by one death i believe that in the interest of japan as well as in our own the course pursued was wise and it was very satisfactory to me to find that one of the ablest japanese ministers with whom i had a discussion upon the subject was quite of my opinion the ceremonies observed at the harakiri appear to vary slightly in detail in different parts of japan but the following memorandum upon the subject of the rite as it used to be practised at yedo during the rule of the tycoon clearly establishes its judicial character i translated it from a paper drawn up for me by a japanese who was able to speak of what he had seen himself three different ceremonies are described first ceremonies observed at the harakiri of a hatamoto petty noble of the tycoon's court in prison this is conducted with great secrecy six mats are spread in a large courtyard of the prison an ometsuke officer whose duties appear to consist in the surveillance of other officers assisted by two other ometskes of the second and third class acts as kenshi sheriff or witness and sits in front of the mats the condemned man attired in his dress of ceremony and wearing his wings of hempen cloth sits in the centre of the mats at each of the four corners of the mats sits a prison official two officers of the governor of the city act as kaishaku executioners or seconds and take their place one on the right and the other on the left hand of the condemned the kaishaku on the left side announcing his name and surname says bowing i have the honor to act as kaishaku to you have you any last wishes to confide to me the condemned man thanks him and accepts the offer or not as the case may be he then bows to the sheriff and a wooden dirk nine and a half inches long is placed before him at a distance of three feet 
wrapped in paper, and lying on a stand such as is used for offerings in temples. As he reaches forward to take the wooden sword and stretches out his neck, the kaishaku on his left-hand side draws his sword and strikes off his head. The kaishaku on the right-hand side takes up the head and shows it to the sheriff. The body is given to the relations of the deceased for burial. His property is confiscated. Second. The ceremonies observed at the harakiri of a daimyo's retainer. When the retainer of a daimyo is condemned to perform the harakiri, four mats are placed in the yard of the yashiki or palace. The condemned man, dressed in his robes of ceremony and wearing his wings of hemp and cloth, sits in the centre. An officer acts as chief witness, with a second witness under him. Two officers, who act as kaishaku, are on the right and left of the condemned man. Four officers are placed at the corners of the mats. The kaishaku, as in the former case, offers to execute the last wishes of the condemned. A dirk nine and a half inches long is placed before him on a stand. In this case, the dirk is a real dirk, which the man takes and stabs himself with on the left side below the navel, drawing it across to the right side. At this moment, when he leans forward in pain, the kaishaku on the left-hand side cuts off the head. The kaishaku on the right-hand side takes up the head and shows it to the sheriff. The body is given to the relations for burial. In most cases, the property of the deceased is confiscated. Third, self-immolation of a daimyo on account of disgrace. When a daimyo had been guilty of treason or offended against a tycoon, inasmuch as the family was disgraced and an apology could neither be offered nor accepted, the offending daimyo was condemned to harakiri. Calling his counsellors around him, he confided to them his last will and testament for transmission to the tycoon. Then, clothing himself in his court dress, he disembowelled himself and cut his own throat. His counsellors then reported the matter to the government, and a coroner was sent to investigate it. To him the retainers handed the last will and testament of their lord, and he took it to the Goroju, first counsel, who transmitted it to the tycoon. If the offence was heinous, such as would involve the ruin of the whole family, by the clemency of the tycoon half the property might be confiscated, and half returned to the heir. If the offence was trivial, the property was inherited intact by the heir, and the family did not suffer. In all cases where the criminal disembowels himself of his own accord, without condemnation and without investigation, inasmuch as he is no longer able to defend himself, the offence is considered as non-proven, and the property is not confiscated. In the year 1869, a motion was brought forward in the Japanese parliament by one Ono Seiguro, clerk of the house, advocating the abolition of the practice of harakiri. Two hundred members out of a house of 209 voted against the motion, which was supported by only three speakers, six members not voting on either side. In this debate, the seppuku, or harakiri, was called the very shrine of the Japanese national spirit and the embodiment in practice of devotion to principle. A great ornament to the empire, a pillar of the constitution, a valuable institution tending to the honor of the nobles and based on a compassionate feeling towards the official caste, a pillar of religion and a spur to virtue. The whole debate, which is well worth reading, and an able translation of which by Mr. Aston has appeared in a recent blue book, shows the affection with which the Japanese cling to the traditions of a chivalrous past. It is worthy of notice that the proposer, Ono Seigoro, who on more than one occasion rendered himself conspicuous by introducing motions based upon an admiration of our Western civilization, was murdered not long after this debate took place. 
there are many stories on record of extraordinary heroism being displaced in the harakiri the case of a young fellow only twenty years old of the choshu clan which was told me the other day by an eyewitness deserves mention as a marvellous instance of determination not content with giving himself the one necessary cut he slashed himself thrice horizontally and twice vertically then he stabbed himself in the throat until the dirk protruded on the other side with its sharp edge to the front setting his teeth in one supreme effort he drove the knife forward with both hands through his throat and fell dead one more story and i have done during the revolution when the tycoon beaten on every side fled ignominiously to yedo he is said to have determined to fight no more but to yield everything a member of his second council went to him and said sir the only way for you now to retrieve the honor of the family of tokugawa is to disembowel yourself and to prove to you that i am sincere and disinterested in what i say i am here ready to disembowel myself with you the tycoon flew into a great rage saying that he would listen to no such nonsense and left the room his faithful retainer to prove his honesty retired to another part of the castle and solemnly performed the harakiri end of section 43「Section 44 of Tales of Old Japan」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times « Tales of Old Japan » by Lord Redsdale Section 44 Appendix B – The Marriage Ceremony From the Shōre Hiki – Record of Ceremonies the ceremonies observed at marriages are various, and it is not right for a man, exceeding the bounds of his condition in life, to transgress against the rules which are laid down. When the middleman has arranged the preliminaries of the marriage between the two parties, he carries the complimentary present, which is made at the time of betrothal, from the future bridegroom to his destined bride. And if this present is accepted, the lady's family can no longer retract their promise. This is the beginning of the contract. The usual betrothal presents are as follows. Persons of the higher classes send a robe of white silk, a piece of gold embroidery for a girdle, a piece of silk stuff, a piece of white silk with a lozenge pattern, and other silk stuffs. These are made up into a pile of three layers fourteen barrels of wine, and seven sorts of condiments. Persons of the middle class send a piece of white silk stuff, a piece of gold embroidery for a girdle, a piece of white silk with a lozenge pattern, and other silk stuffs. These are made up into a pile of two layers, ten barrels of wine, and five sorts of condiments. The lower classes send a robe of white silk, a robe of colored silk, in a pile of one layer, together with six barrels of wine and three sorts of condiments. To the future father-in-law is sent a sword, with a scabbard for slinging, such as is worn in wartime, together with a list of the presents. To the mother-in-law a silk robe, with wine and condiments. Although all these presents are right and proper for the occasion, still they must be regulated according to the means of the persons concerned. The future father-in-law sends a present of equal value in return to his son-in-law, but the bride-elect sends no return present to her future husband. The present from the father-in-law must by no means be omitted, but, according to his position, if he be poor, he need only send wine and condiments. In sending the presents, care must be taken not to fold the silk robe the two silk robes that are sent on the marriage night must be placed with the collars stitched together in a peculiar fashion the ceremonies of sending the litter to fetch the bride on the wedding night are as follows in families of good position one of the principal retainers on either side 
is deputed to accompany the bride and to receive her matting is spread before the entrance door upon which the bride's litter is placed while the two principal retainers congratulate one another and the officers of the bridegroom receive the litter if a bucket containing clams to make the wedding broth has been sent with the bride it is carried and received by a person of distinction close by the entrance door a fire is lighted on the right hand and on the left these fires are called garden torches in front of the corridor along which the litter passes on the right hand and on the left two men and two women in pairs place two mortars right and left in which they pound rice as litter passes the pounded rice from the left hand side is moved across to the right and the two are mixed together into one this is called the blending of the rice meal two candles are lighted the one on the right hand and the other on the left of the corridor and after the litter has passed the candle on the left is passed over to the right and the two wicks being brought together the candles are extinguished these last three ceremonies are only performed at the weddings of persons of high rank they are not observed at the weddings of ordinary persons the bride takes with her to her husband's house as presents two silken robes sewed together in a peculiar manner a dress of ceremony with wings of hempen cloth an upper girdle and an under girdle a fan either five or seven pocket-books and a sword these seven presents are placed on a long tray and their value must depend upon the means of the family the dress of the bride is a white silk robe with a lozenge pattern over an under robe also of white silk over her head she wears a veil of white silk which when she sits down she allows to fall about her as a mantle the bride's furniture and effects are all arranged for her by female attendants from her own house on a day previous to the wedding and the bridegroom's effects are in like manner arranged by the women of his own house when the bride meets her husband in the room where the relations are assembled she takes her seat for this once in the place of honor her husband sitting in a lower place not directly opposite to her but diagonally and discreetly avoiding her glance on the raised part of the floor are laid out beforehand two trays the preparations for a feast a table on which are two wagtails a second table with a representation of elysium fowls fish two wine bottles three wine cups and two sorts of kettles for warming wine the ladies go out to meet the bride and invite her into a dressing room and when she has smoothed her dress bring her into the room and she and the bridegroom take their seats in the places appointed for them the two trays are then brought out and the ladies in waiting with complimentary speeches hand dried fish and seaweed such as accompany presents and dried chestnuts to the couple two married ladies then each take one of the wine bottles which have been prepared and place them in the lower part of the room then two handmaids who act as wine pourers bring the kettles and place them in the lower part of the room the two wine bottles have respectively a male and female butterfly made of paper attached to them the female butterfly is laid on its back and the wine is poured from the bottle into the kettle the male butterfly is then taken and laid on the female butterfly and the wine from the bottle is poured into the same kettle and the whole is transferred with due ceremony to another kettle of different shape which the wine pourers place in front of themselves little low dining tables are laid one for each person before the bride and bridegroom and before the bride's ladies in waiting the woman deputed to pour the wine takes the three wine cups and places them one on the top of the other before the bridegroom who drinks two cups from the upper cup and pours a little wine from the full kettle into the empty kettle the pouring together of the wine on the wedding night is symbolical of the union that is being contracted the bridegroom next pours out a third cup of wine and drinks it and the cup is carried by the ladies to the bride who drinks three cups and pours a little wine from one kettle into the other as the bridegroom did 
a cup is then set down and put on the other two and they are carried back to the raised floor and arranged as before after this condiments are set out on the right hand side of a little table and the wine pourers place the three cups before the bride who drinks three cups from the second cup which is passed to the bridegroom he also drinks three cups as before and the cups are piled up and arranged in their original place by the wine pourers a different sort of condiment is next served on the left hand side and the three cups are again placed before the bridegroom who drinks three cups from the third cup and the bride does the same when the cups and tables have been put back in their places the bridegroom rising from his seat rests himself for a while during this time soup of fishes fins and wine are served to the bride's ladies in waiting and to the serving women they are served with a single wine cup of earthenware placed upon a small square tray and this again is set upon a long tray and a wine kettle with all sorts of condiments is brought from the kitchen when this part of the feast is over the room is put in order and the bride and bridegroom take their seats again soups and a preparation of rice are now served and two earthenware cups gilt and silvered are placed on a tray on which there is a representation of the island of takasago this time butterflies of gold and silver paper are attached to the wine kettles the bridegroom drinks a cup or two and the ladies in waiting offer more condiments to the couple rice with hot water poured over it according to custom and carp soup are brought in and the wine having been heated cups of lacquerware are produced and it is at this time that the feast commences up to now the eating and drinking has been merely a form twelve plates of sweetmeats and tea are served and the dinner consists of three courses one course of seven dishes one of five dishes and one of three dishes or else two courses of five dishes and one of three dishes according to the means of the family the above ceremonies are those which are proper only in families of the highest rank and are by no means fitting for the lower classes who must not step out of the proper bounds of their position there is a popular tradition that in the ceremony of drinking wine on the wedding night the bride should drink first and then hand the cup to the bridegroom but although there are some authorities upon ceremonies who are in favor of this course it is undoubtedly a very great mistake in the record of rites by confucius it is written the man stands in importance before the woman it is the right of the strong over the weak heaven ranks before earth the prince ranks before his minister this law of honor is one again in the book of history by confucius it is written the hen that crows in the morning brings misfortune in our own literature in the jusho book of the gods when the goddesses saw the gods for the first time they were the first to cry out oh what beautiful males but the gods were greatly displeased and said we who are so strong and powerful should by rights have been the first to speak how is that on the contrary these females speak first this is indeed vulgar again it is written when the gods brought forth the cripple Hiruko, the lord of heaven answering said that his misfortune was a punishment upon the goddesses who had presumed to speak first the same rule therefore exists in china and in japan and is held to be unlucky that the wife should take precedence with this warning people should be careful how they commit a breach of etiquette although it may be sanctioned by the vulgar at the wedding of the lower classes the bride and her ladies and friends have a feast but the bridegroom has no feast and when the bride's feast is over the bridegroom is called in and is presented with the bride's wine cup but as the forms observed are very vulgar it is not worth while to point out the rules which guide them as this night is essentially of importance to the married couple only there are some writers on ceremonies who have laid down that no feast need be prepared for the bride's ladies and in my opinion they are right for the husband and wife at the beginning of their intercourse to be separated and for the bride alone to be feasted like an ordinary guest appears to be an inauspicious opening 
I have thus pointed out two ill-omened customs which are to be avoided. The ceremonies observed at the weddings of persons of ordinary rank are as follows. The feast which is prepared is in proportion to the means of the individuals. There must be three wine cups set out upon a tray. The ceremony of drinking wine three times is gone through, as described above, after which the bride changes her dress, and a feast of three courses is produced. Two courses of five dishes, and one of three dishes, or one course of five dishes, one of three, and one of two, according to the means of the family. A tray, with a representation of the island of Takasago, is brought out, and the wine is heated. Sweetmeats of five or seven sorts are also served in boxes or trays, and when the tea comes in, the bridegroom gets up and goes to rest himself. If the wine kettles are of ten, they must not be set out in the room. They must be brought in from the kitchen, and in that case the paper butterflies are not attached to them. In old times, the bride and bridegroom used to change their dress three or five times during the ceremony. But at the present time, after the nine cups of wine have been drunk, in the manner recorded above, the change of dress takes place once. The bride puts on the silk robe which she has received from the bridegroom, while he dons the dress of ceremony which has been brought by the bride. When these ceremonies have been observed, the bride's ladies conduct her to the apartments of her parents-in-law. The bride carries with her silk robes as presents for her parents and brothers and sister-in-law. A tray is brought out with three wine cups, which are set before the parents-in-law and the bride. The father-in-law drinks three cups and hands the cup to the bride, who, after she has drunk two cups, receives a present from her father-in-law. She then drinks a third cup, and returns the cup to her father-in-law, who again drinks three cups. Fish is then brought in, and in the houses of ordinary persons a preparation of rice. Upon this, the mother-in-law, taking the second cup, drinks three cups and passes the cup to the bride, who drinks two cups and receives a present from her mother-in-law. She then drinks a third cup, and gives back the cup to the mother-in-law, who drinks three cups again. Condiments are served, and in ordinary houses, soup, after which the bride drinks once from the third cup, and hands it to her father-in-law, who drinks thrice from it. The bride again drinks twice from it, and after her the mother-in-law drinks twice. The parents-in-law and the bride thus have drunk, in all, nine times. If there are any brothers or sisters-in-law, soup and condiments are served, and a single porcelain wine cup is placed before them on a tray, and they drink at the word of command of the father-in-law. It is not indispensable that soup should be served upon this occasion. If the parents of the bridegroom are dead, instead of the above ceremony, he leads his bride to make her obeisances before the tablets on which their names are inscribed. In old days, after the ceremonies recorded above had been gone through, the bridegroom used to pay a visit of ceremony to the bride's parents. But at the present time, the visit is paid before the wedding, and although the forms observed on the occasion resemble those of ancient times, still they are different, and it would be well that we should resume the old fashion. The two trays which had been used at the wedding feast loaded with fowl and fish and condiments, neatly arranged, used to be put into a long box and sent to the father-in-law's house. Five hundred and eighty cakes of rice in lacquer boxes were also sent. The modern practice of sending the rice cakes in a bucket is quite contrary to etiquette. No matter how many lacquer boxes may be required for the purpose, they are the proper utensils for sending the cakes in three, five, seven, or ten men's loads of presents, according to the means of the family, are also offered. The son-in-law gives a sword and a silk robe to his father-in-law, and a silk robe to his mother-in-law, and also gives presents to his brothers and sisters-in-law. The ceremony of drinking wine is the same as that which takes place between the bride and her parents-in-law, with a very slight deviation. The bridegroom receives no presents from his mother-in-law, and when the third cup is drunk, the son-in-law drinks before the father-in-law. 
A return visit is paid by the bride's parents to the bridegroom, at which similar forms are observed. At the weddings of the great, the bridal chamber is composed of three rooms thrown into one and newly decorated. If there are only two rooms available, a third room is built for the occasion. The presents, which have been mentioned above, are set out on two trays. Besides these, the bridegroom's clothes are hung up upon clothes racks. The mattress and bedclothes are placed in a closet. The bride's effects must all be arranged by the women who are sent on a previous day for the purpose, or it may be done whilst the bride is changing her clothes. The shrine for the image of the family god is placed on a shelf adjoining the sleeping place. There is a proper place for the various articles of furniture. The K.O.K. is placed on the raised floor, but if there be no raised floor, it is placed in a closet with the door open, so that it may be conspicuously seen. The books are arranged on a bookshelf or on a cabinet. If there be neither shelf nor cabinet, they are placed on the raised floor. The bride's clothes are set out on a clothes rack. In families of high rank, seven robes are hung up on the rack. Five of these are taken away and replaced by others, and again three are taken away and replaced by others, and there are either two or three clothes racks. The towel rack is set up in a place of more honor than the clothes racks. If there is no dressing room, the bride's bedclothes and dressing furniture are placed in the sleeping room. No screens are put up on the bridal night, but a fitting place is chosen for them on the following day. All these ceremonies must be in proportion to the means of the family. Note. The author of the Shore Ike makes no allusion to the custom of shaving the eyebrows and blackening the teeth of married women, in token of fidelity to their lords. In the upper classes, young ladies usually blacken their teeth before leaving their father's house to enter that of their husbands, and complete the ceremony by shaving their eyebrows immediately after the wedding, or, at any rate, not later than upon the occasion of their first pregnancy. The origin of the fashion is lost in antiquity. As a proof that it existed before the 11th century A.D., a curious book called Tejo Zaki, or the Miscellaneous Writings of Tejo, cites the diary of Mirasaki Shikibu, the daughter of one Tamisoki, a retainer of the house of Echizen, a lady of the court and famous poetess, the authoress of a book called Genji, Monogatari, and other works. In her diary it is written that on the last day of the fifth year of the period Kenko, A.D. 1008, in order that she might appear to advantage on New Year's Day, she retired to the privacy of her own apartment, and, repairing the deficiencies of her personal appearance by re-blackening her teeth and otherwise adorning herself. Allusion is also made to the custom of the Yege Monogatari, an ancient book by the same authoress. The emperor and nobles of his court are also in the habit of blackening their teeth, but the custom is gradually dying out in their case. It is said to have originated with one Hanazono Arashito, who held the high rank of Sadajen, or minister of the left, at the commencement of the twelfth century in the reign of the Emperor Toba. Being a man of refined and sensual tastes, this minister plucked out his eyebrows, shaved his beard, blackened his teeth, powdered his face white, and rouged his lips in order to render himself as like a woman as possible. In the middle of the twelfth century, the nobles of the court, who went to the wars, all blackened their teeth, and from this time forth the practice became a fashion of the court. The followers of the chiefs of the Hojo dynasty also blackened their teeth as an emblem of their fidelity, and this was called the Odawara fashion, after the castle town of the family. Thus a custom, which had its origin in a love of sensuality and pleasure, became mistaken for the sign of a good and faithful spirit. The fashion of blackening the teeth entails no little trouble upon its followers, for the color must be renewed every day, or at least every other day. Strange and repelling as the custom appears at first, the eye soon 
learns to look without aversion upon a well-blacked and polished set of teeth but when the color begins to wear away and turns to a dullish gray streaked with black the mouth certainly becomes most hideous although no one who reads this is likely to put a recipe for blackening the teeth to a practical test i append one furnished to me by a fashionable chemist and druggist in yedo take three pints of water and having warmed it add half a teacupful of wine put into this mixture a quantity of red-hot iron allow it to stand for five or six days when there will be a scum on the top of the mixture which should then be poured into a small teacup and placed near a fire when it is warm powdered gall nuts and iron filings should be added to it and the whole should be warmed again the liquid is then painted on to the teeth by means of a soft feather brush with more powdered gall nuts and iron and after several applications the desired color will be obtained the process is said to be a preservative of the teeth and i have known men who were habitual sufferers from toothache to prefer the martyrdom of ugliness to that of pain and apply the black coloring when the paroxysms were severe one man told me that he experienced immediate relief by the application and that so long as he blackened his teeth he was quite free from pain End of section 44. Section 45 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joyce Couch. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Riesdell. Section 45, Appendix B, On the Birth and Bearing of Children, from the show Reiki. In the fifth month of a woman's pregnancy, a very lucky day is selected for the ceremony of putting on a girdle, which is of white and red silk, folded, and eight feet in length. The husband produces it from the left sleeve of his dress, and the wife receives it in the right sleeve of her dress, and girds it on for the first time. This ceremony is only performed once. When the child is born, a white part of the girdle is dyed sky blue, with a peculiar mark on it, and it is made into clothes for the child. These, however, are not the first clothes which it wears. The dyer is presented with wine and condiments when the girdle is entrusted to him. It is also customary to beg some matron, who has herself had an easy confinement, for the girdle which she wore during her pregnancy, and this lady is called the girdle mother. The borrowed girdle is tied on with that given by the husband, and the girdle mother at this time gives and receives a present. The furniture of the lying in chamber is as follows. Two tubs for placing under petticoats in. Two tubs to hold the placenta. A piece of furniture like an armchair without legs for the mother to lean against. A stool, which is used by the lady who embraces the loins of the woman in labor to support her, and which is afterwards used by the midwife in washing the child several pillows of various sizes that the woman in childbed may ease her head at her pleasure new buckets basins and ladles of various sizes twenty-four baby robes twelve of silk and twelve of cotton must be prepared the hems must be dyed saffron color there must be an apron for the midwife if the infant is of high rank in order that when she washes it she may not place it immediately on her own knees this apron should be made of a kerchief of cotton. When the child is taken out of the warm water, its body must be dried with a kerchief of fine cotton unhemmed. On the seventy-fifth or hundredth and twentieth day after its birth, the baby leaves off its baby linen, and this day is kept as a holiday. Although it is the practice generally to dress children in various kinds of silk, this is very wrong, as the two principles of life being thereby injured the child contracts disease, and on this account the ancients strictly pervade the practice. In modern times the child is dressed up in beautiful clothes, but to put a cap on its head, thinking to make much of it, when, on the contrary, it is hurtful to the child, should be avoided. It would be an excellent thing if rich people, out of the care of the health of their children, would put a stop to a practice to which fashion clings. On the hundredth and twentieth day after their birth, 
children, whether male or female, are waned. This day is fixed, and there is no need to choose a lucky day. If the child be a boy, it is fed by a gentleman of the family, if a girl, by a lady. This ceremony is as follows. The child is brought out and given to the weaning father or sponsor. He takes it on his left knee. A small table is prepared. The sponsor, who is to feed the child, taking some rice which has been offered to the gods, places it on the corner of the little table which is by him. He dips his chopsticks thrice in this rice, and very quietly places them in the mouth of the child, pretending to give it some of the juice of the rice. Five cakes of rice meal are also placed on the left side of the little table, and with these he again pretends to feed the child three times. When the ceremony is over, the child is handed back to its guardian, and three wine cups are produced on a tray. The sponsor drinks three cups and presents the cup to the child. When the child has been made to pretend to drink two cups, it receives a present from its sponsor, after which the child is supposed to drink a third time. Dried fish is then brought in, and the baby, having drunk thrice, passes the cup to its sponsors, who drinks thrice. More fish of a different kind is brought in. The drinking is repeated, and the weaning father receives a present from the child. The guardian, according to the rules of propriety, should be near the child. A feast should be prepared, according to the means of the family. If the child be a girl, a weaning mother performs this ceremony and suitable presents must be offered on either side. The wine drinking is gone through as above. On the fifteenth day of the eleventh month of the child's third year, be the child boy or girl, its hair is allowed to grow. Up to this time the whole head has been shaven. Now three patches are allowed to grow, one on each side and one at the back of the head. On this occasion also a sponsor is selected, a large tray on which are a comb, scissors, paper string, and a piece of string for tying the hair in a knot, cotton wool, and a bit of dried fish or seaweed which accompanies presents, one of each, and seven rice straws. These seven articles must be prepared. The child is placed, facing the point of the compass, which is auspicious for that year, and the sponsor, if the child be a boy, takes the scissors and gives three snips of the hair on the left temple, three on the right, and three in the center. He then takes the piece of cotton wool and spreads it over the child's head, from the forehead, so as to make it hang down behind his neck, and he places the bit of dried fish or seaweed and the seven straws at the bottom of the piece of cotton wool, attaching him to the wool, and ties them in two loops, like a man's hair, with a piece of paper string. He then makes a woman's knot with two pieces of string. The ceremony of drinking wine is the same as that gone through at the weaning. If the child is a girl, a lady acts as the sponsor. The hair cutting is begun from the right temple instead of from the left. There is no difference in the rest of the ceremony. On the fifth day of the eleventh month of the child's fourth year, he is invested in the hakama, or loose trousers worn by the samurai. On this occasion, again, a sponsor is called in. The child receives from the sponsor a dress of the ceremony on which are embroidered storks and tortoises, emblems of longevity. The stork is said to live a thousand years, the tortoise ten thousand. Fir trees, which being evergreen and not changing their color, are emblematic of an unchangingly virtuous heart, and bamboos, emblematic of an upright and straight mind. The child is placed upright on a checkerboard, facing the auspicious point of the compass, and is invested with a dress of ceremony. It also receives a sham sword and a dirk. The usual ceremony of drinking wine is observed. Note, in order to understand the following ceremony, it is necessary to recollect that the child at three years of age is allowed to grow its hair in three patches. By degrees, the hair is allowed to grow, the crown alone being shaved, and a forelock left. At ten or eleven years of age, the boy's head is dressed like the man's, with the exception of this forelock. The ceremony of cutting out the forelock used in old days to include the ceremony of putting on the noble's cap, but as this has gone out of fashion, there is no need to treat of it. Any time after the youth has reached the age of fifteen, according to the cleverness and ability which he shows, a lucky day is chosen for this most important ceremony. 
after which the boy takes his place among full-grown men. A person of virtuous character is chosen as sponsor or capfather. Although the man's real name, that name which is known only to his intimate relations and friends, not the one by which he usually goes in society, is determined before this date. If it not be so, he receives his real name from his sponsor on this day. In old days there used to be a previous ceremony of cutting the hair off the forehead in a straight line, so as to make two angles. Up to this time the youth wore long sleeves like a woman, and from that day he wore short sleeves. This was called the half-cutting. The poorer classes have a habit of shortening the sleeves before this period, but that is contrary to all rule and is an evil custom. A common tray is produced, on which is placed an earthenware wine cup. The sponsor drinks thrice, and hands the cup to the young man, who, having also drank thrice, gives the cup back to the sponsor, who again drinks thrice, and then proceeds to tie up the young man's hair. There are three ways of tying the hair, and there is also a particular fashion of letting the forelock grow long, and when this is the case, the forelock is only clipped. This is especially the fashion among the nobles of the Mikado's court. This applies only to persons who wear the court cap, and not to gentlemen of lower grade. Still, these latter persons, if they wish to go through the ceremony in its entirety, may do so without impropriety. Gentlemen of the samurai, or military class, cut off the whole of the forelock. The sponsor either ties up the hair of the young man, or else, placing the forelock on a willow board, cuts it off with a knife, or else, amongst persons of very high rank, he only pretends to do so and then goes into the other room whilst the real cutting is going on, and then returns to the same room. The sponsor then, without letting the young man see what he is doing, places the lock which has been cut into the pocket of his left sleeve, and leaving the room, gives it to the young man's guardians, who wrap it in paper and offer it up at the shrine of the family gods. But this is wrong. The lock should be well wrapped up in paper, and kept in the house until a man's death, to serve as a reminder of the favors which a man receives from his father and mother in his childhood. When he dies, it should be placed in his coffin and buried with him. The wine-drinking and presents are as before. In the Sho Raihiki, the book from which the above is translated, there is no notice of the ceremony of naming the child. The following is a translation from a Japanese MS. On the seventh day after its birth, the child receives its name. The ceremony is called the Congratulations of the Seventh Night. On this day some one of the relations of the family, who holds an exalted position, either from his rank or virtues, selects a name for the child, which name he keeps until the time of the cutting of the forelock, when he takes the name which he is to bear as a man. This second name is called Yeboshina, the cap name, which is compounded of syllables taken from an old name of the family and from the name of the sponsor. If the sponsor afterwards changes his name, his name child must also change his name. For instance, Minamoto no Yoshitsuni, the famous warrior, as a child was called Ushi Wakamaru. When he grew up to be a man, he was called Kuro, and his real name was Yoshitsuni. End of section 45, appendix B. On the birth and bearing of children. Section 46 of Tales of Old Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Gradwell. Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale. Section 46. From the Shorei Hiki. On the death of a parent, the mourning clothes worn are made of coarse hempen cloth, and during the whole period of mourning, these must be worn night and day. As the burial of his parents is the most important ceremony which a man has to go through during his whole life, when the occasion comes, in order that there be no confusion, he must employ some person to teach him the usual and proper rites. 
Above all things to be reprehended is the burning of the dead. They should be interred without burning. The ceremonies to be observed at a funeral should by rights have been learned before there is occasion to put them in practice. If a man have no father or mother, he is sure to have to bury other relations, and so he should not disregard this study. There are some authorities who select lucky days and hours and lucky places for burying the dead, but this is wrong. And when they talk about curses being brought upon posterity by not observing these auspicious seasons and places, they make a great mistake. It is a matter of course that an auspicious day must be chosen so far as avoiding wind and rain is concerned, that men may bury their dead without their minds being distracted. And it is important to choose a fitting cemetery, lest in after days the tomb should be damaged by rain, or by men walking over it, or by the place being turned into a field or built upon. When invited to a friend's or neighbour's funeral, a man should avoid putting on smart clothes and dresses of ceremony, and when he follows the coffin, he should not speak in a loud voice to the person next him, for that is very rude, and even should he have occasion to do so, he should avoid entering wine shops or tea houses on his return from the funeral. The list of persons present at a funeral should be written on slips of paper and firmly bound together. It may be written as any other list, only it must not be written beginning at the right hand, as is usually the case, but from the left hand, as is the case in European books. On the day of burial, during the funeral service, incense is burned in the temple before the tablet on which is inscribed the name under which the dead person enters salvation. The incense burners, having washed their hands one by one, enter the room where the tablet is exposed, and advance halfway up to the tablet facing it. Producing incense wrapped in paper from their bosoms, they hold it in their left hands, and, taking a pinch with the right hand, they place the packet in their left sleeve. If the table on which the tablet is placed be high, the person offering incense half raises himself from his crouching position. If the table be low, he remains crouching to burn the incense, after which he takes three steps backwards, with bows and reverences, and retires six feet, when he again crouches down to watch the incense burning, and bows to the priests, who are sitting in a row with their chief at their head, after which he rises and leaves the room. Up to the time of burning the incense, no notice is taken of the priest. At the ceremony of burning incense before the grave, the priests are not saluted. A packet of incense is made of fine paper folded in three, both ways. Note. The reason why the author of the Shorei Hiki has treated so briefly of the funeral ceremonies is probably that these rites, being invariably entrusted to the Buddhist priesthood, vary according to the sect of the latter. And as there are no less than fifteen sects of Buddhism in Japan, it would be a long matter to enter into the ceremonies practised by each. Should Buddhism be swept out of Japan, as seems likely to be the case, men will probably return to the old rites, which obtained before its introduction in the 6th century of our era. What those rites were, I have been unable to learn. End of section 46. Recording by Martin Gradwell. End of Tales of Old Japan by Lord Reedsdale.